Order a lot. The Public Order Emergency Commission is now in session. La Commission sur l'état d'urgence est maintenant ouverte. Good morning. Bonjour. I see we have a different cast uh, this morning. We're moving geographically or figuratively, I guess, in, uh, to the different area of Ontario. Okay, and who is uh, Commission Council uh, this morning? Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Uh, the Commission would like to call Mayor Drew Dilkins. <coughs> and if you could identify yourself for the... Natalia Rodriguez, Commission Council. Okay. Will you swear on a religious document or do you wish to affirm? A Bible, please. For the record, please state your full name and spell it out. Drew Dilkins, D-R-E-W-D-I-L-K-E-N-S. Do you swear that the evidence to be given by you to this commission shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, go ahead. Good morning, Mayor Dilkins. How are you? Good morning. I'm well, thank you. Good. Nice to see you again. Good as well. Uh, you had an interview with Commission Council on September 2nd of this year. You recall that? Yes. And uh, we had a, an interview summary that was made as a result of that interview. Do you recall that? Yes. Yes. And you've had a chance to review that summary? Correct. And do you have any corrections to make to that summary at this time? Just a, a slight correction as it relates to uh, the statement regarding the CBSA and the offer for tow trucks. Okay, so let's pull that up. It's WTS 6019. And I believe you're referring to uh, evidence that was on page five. So we'll go to page five of that. Okay, and it's uh, the paragraph that says towing resources right there? Correct. Okay, so um, what is it that you would like to change with respect to that paragraph? So the, the, the correction should be that CBSA did not offer tow trucks to the Windsor Police Service or the city. The CBSA offered to help clear the drivers and tow trucks that may be available from the United States. So it wasn't that the CBSA had tow trucks themselves that was offered. Okay, so they were facilitating the movement of tow trucks and drivers over the border, is that Correct. right? Correct. Okay, perfect, we'll make that correction, thank you. Um, and we'll have that witness summary entered into evidence. You also swore an affidavit uh, attaching two institutional reports from the city of Windsor. Yes. And um, we're gonna bring, well, first of all, we'll bring the affidavit up. It's AFF uh, 6013. Apologies, Council. Is there a prefix to that number? AFF 6013. <clears throat> Okay, and if we can scroll down a little bit. Do you recognize this as your affidavit? Yes. Okay, great. And we'll go to the two institutional reports then. Uh, WIN.IR701. And WIN.IR701. Uh, WIN.IR701.
Okay, and if we can uh, go down a little bit. Okay, and you recognize this as the institutional report for the City of Windsor? Correct. Do you have any corrections to make to this institutional report? I would just make uh, one correction as it relates to, this is probably not material, but for the interest of being correct, uh, there's, a dis there's a mention in there that the city was uh, formed in 1935 and it mentions an amalgamation act. Windsor actually received city status in 1892. Okay, so Windsor has been a city since 1892, but it was amalgamated in 1935. That's correct. Okay, thank you. We'll make that correction, uh, and it will be entered into evidence. And then if we can just have the second institutional report, WIN.IR702. And this, I believe, is a timeline of key events. And you recognize that, correct? Yes, I do. Okay, do you have any changes to make to that institutional report? I do not. Okay, thank you. We'll have those entered into evidence along with your affidavit. So I understand you've been a mayor, uh, the mayor of Windsor since uh, 2014, is that right? That's correct. And my understanding is you've also been the chair of the Windsor Police Services Board since that time as well. That's correct. And um, as mayor, you are also part of the community control group, is that right? That's right. And can you explain what the community control group is? Uh, the community control, control group uh, is effectively the members of our corporate leadership team, so the commissioners uh, and the appropriate people needed to deal with certain events. And basically the idea is if we have a, a significant event, we give information once to the whole group uh, and then provide a, a response where everyone is on the same page and understands what needs to be done before we adjourn a meeting. And when you say commissioners, those are the, the kind of leads of the di different departments in the city? Yes, it's, it's you know, it would be analogous in a corporate setting to the vice president. Right. So it's the senior city leadership team, the city manager, uh, and all of the, the different department heads for each department. Okay, great. And that includes EMS and um, the uh, heads of, well, I assume also members of the WPS, or at least one member of the WPS would be there as well? If required, yes. Yes, okay, thank you. And um, my understanding is the CCG was activated during the uh, blockade in Windsor of this year, is that right? That's correct. And what kind of decisions would be made at the CCG level? Uh, any sort of operational decision that is required from a city perspective, um, and, and it could be traffic control measures, it could be the acquisition of public works items, perhaps jersey barriers, um, it could be procuring any sort of legal resource that is needed. It really runs the gamut depending on what's required in each situation. And what's, what's an example of the kind of a decision that was made uh, for this particular event, which was the blockade? Uh, well, with respect to the blockade, everyone got together. Uh, it was very quickly determined that the right incident command for this event was a police response. Uh, and so on the back end, we were providing operational support to police. And that was procurement of Jersey barriers, traffic signal control, uh, signage, uh, you know, a whole host of different inputs that would be required to manage what police needed to deal with the event. And was there also an aspect that dealt with us uh, maintaining city services and ensuring the impacts to the residents and businesses was as little as possible? Uh, that's true. So for, from a, a transit perspective, we want to make sure that the transit routes that would have crossed uh, the area in question, uh, that they can continue to be maintained in some order, that people could continue to move throughout the city. And so all of those people were around the table making sure that we were deploying the right response to support police in this endeavor. Okay, thank you. And um, so you kind of, you wore three hats in a sense uh, during the event. You were the mayor of the city, you were the chair of the Windsor Police Services Board, and you were a member of the CCG, correct? Correct. And so uh, in your role as CCG, who was the, uh, who would have been briefing you? Would that have been um, Chief Laforet? Yeah, Chief uh, Steve Laforet is our fire chief, and so he took uh, control of the CCG and was sort of the, uh, I would say like the emergency coordinator, making sure that all of the people were around the table and that, that uh, the facilities were available and he acted as the person in charge uh, for that group. And as mayor, um, would it have been the CAO who briefed you? Um, well, I, I mean, I received briefings from the chief of police at the time, uh, from the deputy chief, uh, Belair, uh, from the CAO, from city legal. I mean, there were a number of inputs uh, coming into me uh, throughout the day and certainly at CCG, it was 
during the CCG meetings, it was a chance for us to, to share information broadly so that everyone was on the same page and that we knew it was required and we were, you know, for, for lack of a better term, locked and loaded uh, moving forward. So in many ways, your three hats were kind of together at the same time. You, you, there wasn't really a distinction between the three roles that you were playing. Almost none. Okay. Um, so I want to familiarize the commissioner and, and others with Windsor and the geography of Windsor and the Ambassador Bridge, which is the bridge in question, um, because I think it provides some context to uh, what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of hours. So I wanted to bring up um, the, the map that was uh, circulated earlier. And so this is a map of uh, Windsor, correct? A portion of it, yep. A portion of it, okay, thank you. And um, we can see at the bottom there, the, uh, yeah, that where the cursor is, that yellow uh, line that goes east to west, uh, is that the 401? Uh, yes, the part that's marked 401 will be the, the portion that goes to the new uh, Gordie Howe Bridge, uh, and then the portion south of where it says EC Row Expressway is basically, it's, it's called the Herb Gray Parkway, but it's a direct connection. It, it effectively is the 401. It links the 401 to, uh, through the city of Windsor to the, uh, to the future uh, Gordie Howe Bridge. And then of course traffic, uh, that bridge is not open yet, but traffic that is trying to access the Ambassador Bridge has to get off the 401 north of EC Row Expressway where they're getting on a municipal road. So okay. they move from a provincial highway to a municipal road. So maybe we can zoom in a little bit on the municipal road. So that would be the yellow road uh, running northwest. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And what's the name of that road? Uh, here on Church Road. Here on Church Road. Okay. And, uh, and so that's a municipal road now within the boundaries of the city, correct? That's correct. Okay, and so to get to the, uh, the bridge, we're going to zoom in. It's about five kilometers, is my understanding, from the 401 to the bridge on Huron Church Road. Is that right? It might be somewhat less than that, you know, okay. say between just around a little over three kilometers. Okay, fair enough. And uh, so let's zoom in a little bit there. Okay, and so where would the entrance then to the bridge be? So uh, just to, the, to the, the left of where your cursor, your pointer is, mm -hmm. uh, right there where that green dot is, Yes. Uh, traffic would proceed north yeah. uh, and continue to follow the, follow the yellow line. Now you're on to the, basically the entrance, you know, the approach to the bridge. Okay. And, um, and so that's still within the city. And is that now, um, is there any uh, federal agencies that are in that area that are in charge of securing that area? Well, the, the, the response is a municipal response. So if there was an accident, if there was some uh, form of criminality or something that required police attention, uh, Windsor police would respond. Okay. Uh, but you were actually now getting on privately owned property. The Ambassador Bridge is owned by a private corporation. Uh, and so, that private corporation is re required to follow the provisions of the International Bridges and Tunnels Act, which is federal legislation in Canada, and that the person, the minister responsible for uh, administering that legislation is the Minister of Transportation. Okay, and does CBSA have a presence on uh, this portion uh, on the entrance of the bridge? Yes, so CBSA, you see the, the, the red, looks like a customs officer, a police officer, that's where CBSA uh, has their staff. Okay, great. Um, and so I wanted to um, to make the map 3D if we if we can, just to show the elevation because uh, the bridge actually starts not at the um, at the river there, but actually further down uh, in the in the actual city. So I just wanted to to show that if we can zoom in a little bit. So it looks like the bridge really starts. Well, we can see there now it's going underneath uh, Wyandette uh, Street. Is that right? Uh, it goes it goes over it Wyandette goes over, Street. Yes. Right. And um, and so it looks like part of the bridge is actually going through the city itself, not over water. Is that right? Correct. And so the, the bridge itself, I mean, people would refer to the bridge as the, the portion of the structure between the, the two largest pillars. Everything else is the approach. 
Uh, and so the approach to, you can see the, the large pillar coming out of the water there. Mm -hmm. uh, everything leading up to that pillar is the approach and you can see the, the rise in elevation as, as vehicles get on the bridge. Uh, and just north of where the pointer is now, that's the University of Windsor campus. It's directly adjacent to, uh, to the Ambassador Bridge and they have about 17,500 students that attend that campus. And the other side looks to be quite residential, is that right? That's correct. Okay, so if we can zoom back a little bit, yeah, and just move, the, move back. So in order to then uh, enter the bridge, drivers would come north on here on Church Road, and they would enter what we call, do, is this called a plaza, this area where um, vehicles would enter to go through customs and go through the, uh, the border? So where the pointer is now, you can see, if you stayed to the left on that roadway, that would be into the plaza area, past the duty free, and then onto the bridge. Uh, and where that pointer was, where the number three is, uh, again, if you stayed to the left, you're going to the bridge. To stay to the right, that's how people, a majority of people, I would submit, get to the University of Windsor each and every day. So that is one way to get on the Ambassador Bridge. There is a second entrance uh, to the Ambassador Bridge. Uh, and that is sort of in the middle of the screen where the yellow uh, dot is right there. There is an entrance point just down, you know, 20 meters or 30 meters you can turn in and, and access the bridge that way as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, and my understanding is that the blockade uh, occurred at the intersection of Huron Church Road and College Street. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so let's go to that area. I believe that's where the green cursor is. Is that right? The yes. green dot. Okay, thank you. So, um, so now with that in mind, we can talk a little bit about the blockade and, and how it occurred, having a better understanding of the layout of the city and where the bridge is in relation to the rest of the city. So thank you for that. So you had mentioned that the Ambassador Bridge is privately owned and that's on both sides of the border, correct? Correct. Um, and the southern end, um, the Canadian port of entry is as we saw within the city of Windsor. That's right. Um, and my understanding is that there are a few other points of entry or there are other um, areas to be able to get to the, the U.S. side, including a tunnel. Is that right? Yes, yeah, so the City of Windsor and the City of Detroit, we respectively own our own halves of the Windsor-Detroit Tunnel. Uh, we manage them together, uh, but ownership rests with, with each municipality. And what kind of vehicles pass through the tunnel as opposed to through the bridge? Why would one go over into the tunnel versus the bridge? The tunnel has, uh, the tunnel is predominantly just vehicular traffic, passenger cars. Uh, Haulers, auto haulers can go in the, the tunnel, but there are weight and height restrictions. The tunnel's 90 plus years old, so there are height and weight restrictions in the tunnel. So the vast majority of truck traffic uses the Ambassador Bridge. Uh, passenger traffic uses uh, the tunnel. Okay. And my understanding is there's also a ferry between uh, Windsor and Detroit. Is that right? That's correct. And the ferry is used for hazardous goods. They cannot cross, through, they cannot cross over the Ambassador Bridge they're carrying hazardous goods. And um, does any kind of just regular traffic go also on the, um, the ferry or is that exclusively limited to hazardous goods? It's exclusive to vehicles carrying hazardous goods. Okay, and I understand there's also a rail tunnel that connects Windsor to Detroit, is that right? There is. Yes. And what kind of traffic goes through the rail tunnel? I'm not sure uh, in terms of the volume of traffic, but it's not, it is not a double stack tunnel, so it limits the, the type of traffic that can go through, train traffic that can go through. And is it generally commercial traffic? Yes. Okay. Now, according to the institutional report that we saw earlier, uh, my understanding is that there are over 2.6 million truck crossings over the bridge, uh, or there were in 2020. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right. And this is about 28% of all of Canada's truck crossings. Correct. Uh, and my understanding also is that the bridge handles over $390 million of trade each day. 
Does that sound right? Yeah, so the numbers vary, and, and it really, you know, the, the estimate is between 300 and 450 million, depending on the day, depending on the season. Um, but that, you know, any way you cut it, it's hundreds of millions of dollars a day. So th between three and 450 is sort of the rule of thumb. And the bridge also serves as an important corridor for travel uh, for Windsor residents, is that right? It does. And generally, what kind of day-to-day -day traffic uh, in terms of residents uh, is going over the bridge? Well, I, I, I would say it's, there really are, are two kinds. Uh, and so living in Windsor, we have the benefit of being a, a, a sort of that safe, small uh, city, community in Canada. Uh, and then people who live in Windsor in our area often cross for all of the amenities, amenities that you would find in a big city, whether that's sports or dining or, or entertainment, you know, all of that exists in Detroit just 10 minutes away. Uh, but we also have about 6,000 people who cross to go to work. So people who live in our community and cross to work in the, in the greater Detroit area uh, each and every day. And those are, you know, everything from engineers uh, and a whole host of healthcare professionals that continue to cross uh, even during the pandemic. And now, um, you had mentioned that if there was an accident on the bridge, it would be the Windsor Police Service who would respond to that accident, correct? If it's on the Canadian side, yes. Yes. Um, now, what happens if, for example, someone's trying to cross unlawfully or there's any, a, another type of situation that's not, say, an accident? Uh, the Windsor Police, uh, from my understanding, would be the ones that would receive uh, the first call and provide the first response if there's other criminal type of activity. Does the OPP have any jurisdiction anywhere in Windsor or the bridge, to your knowledge? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, I would say that the OPP is responsible. When we looked at the map uh, just a few minutes ago where the, the 401 meets the EC Row Expressway, the OPP is responsible to patrol effectively the 401, which is, which is in our area as well. Right. But is, the 401 is outside of the city limits, is my understanding. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And uh, does the RCMP have any jurisdiction anywhere in Windsor or on the bridge? Uh, not to my knowledge. They have a presence in Windsor. There's a detachment, uh, but I, I'm not aware that they have any sort of operational uh, dealings with the Ambassador Bridge per se. Okay. Now, just uh, going back to the arrival of the uh, of the convoy that that caused the blockade and to even go further before that time. My understanding is that there were slow roll protests that happened at the end of January. Is that correct? Correct. And were you aware of those at the time? Uh, I, I really wasn't aware of them at the time. Um, it, they really had no impact and, and the chief of the day hadn't mentioned that to me. Uh, and so I wasn't aware at the time. And these were uh, convoys of trucks going up and down here on Church Road kind of slowly in a slow manner. Is that your understanding of what that was? Correct. Uh, okay. and, and as I, I came to find out, they weren't blocking traffic, so traffic to and from the Ambassador Bridge was still able to move. Okay, thank you. Now, at the end of January, uh, were you aware of the convoy protest that was happening in Ottawa? Yes. And did you have at that time any information to suggest that those protests might impact Windsor? I had no information myself and nothing was passed to me at the end of January. Okay. So when were you first advised that there was uh, potentially a risk of a blockade to the bridge um, and, or that there was maybe a plan to, to blockade the bridge? February the 4th. Okay. So I'm going to take you to WIN. 6010. And this is an email dated February 4th. And if we go to the bottom of the first page, yeah, we can see the email is from somebody at CBSA to Carolyn Brown and some other uh, individuals. Uh, who's Carolyn Brown? Carolyn Brown is a, a city employee who's responsible for managing the Windsor Detroit Tunnel, our half. Your half of the tunnel, okay, not the bridge, the tunnel. Correct. Right, and um, so she's saying, uh, sorry, he, uh, Mr. Uh, Boismier is saying to her, we have heard of additional slow roll protests in and around Huron Church and the Ambassador Bridge over the next few days. Information on social media also suggests that, quote, if we don't see any change by Monday, we will 
be shutting down the Windsor border crossing completely, end quote. While there is no information that I have been made aware of regarding protests at the tunnel, if any such blockade occurs at the Ambassador Bridge, we may see an increase in passenger traffic and those commercial vehicles that are able to utilize the tunnel. Okay, so um, were you made aware of this information at the time? Uh, not, not from the folks uh, it, on this email, but uh, I did receive a call from the Chief of Police uh, shortly thereafter who told me about the slow roll and, and the police monitoring this slow roll through the City of Windsor. And at that time, um, was there any discussion about um, potentially trying to prevent a blockade from occurring? No, what the Chief told me, uh, Chief Mizuno had said that that's when I found out that it was already happening in, in, in the days prior to February the 4th, uh, and that everyone had been peaceful, uh, that there had been no blockage of traffic to and from the Ambassador Bridge. And so what the Chief told me is that they were monitoring the situation, uh, and she just wanted to let me know. Okay. And uh, did the city do anything in response to this information? Uh, on, on this particular time, uh, I wouldn't say on February the 4th, not, not right away. I mean, what I did when I found out, uh, I sent a text to Minister Mendicino just to let him know that I had received this information so that he was aware because we were watching, of course, what was happening in Ottawa and, and elsewhere around the country. And I just pass that up to uh, to the minister for his attention. Okay, so we'll go to those text messages since um, you've mentioned it. WIN402295. So these are your text messages uh, to Minister Mendicino, is that right? Yes. And so the blue is you, and if we go down, there's some white. The white text is, is him? That's correct. Okay, and if we just go back up a little bit. Hi, I know things are crazy for you. Wanted you to know that police here are prepping for the potential return of truckers and other, other malcontents next week. It sounds like they may be attempting to block traffic to the Ambassador Bridge. So that's on February 4th. As you mentioned, uh, it's, it, when it came to your attention that there was a risk of a blockade, correct? That's, that's correct. And if we go down, he says, thanks, man. Let's try to connect this. Let's go down a little bit more. This weekend, stay safe. Okay, so it sounds like you knew him from before. Is that right? Correct. Okay. It's not the first time you're texting him. Uh, no. Okay. And he... He mentions to connect that weekend. Did you speak to him prior to the blockade taking hold? So this would be Friday the 4th, so either on the 5th or the 6th? I, uh, I, I don't recall if we spoke on the weekend. Okay. Um, now, moving forward to February 6th, my understanding is that there was um, a risk of a blockade at another location in Sarnia. Is that right? Yes. And were you aware of that at the time? Yes, I was. And can you tell us a little bit about what that was about, where it was and, and what was the issue? Well, we, we were watching, uh, and the chief had called me as well, but we were also watching social media and, and, and traditional media as well, uh, and saw that there was a, a threat and then a, a blockage at or around the Blue Water Bridge. And that's in Sarnia? Yes. And um, did do you know... Um, how long that lasted or when it got resolved? Uh, I, I don't recall how long it lasted, but my, my recollection is it was ended pretty quick. And did that raise any concerns with respect to the uh, Ambassador Bridge and possible blockades there? Yes, it did. Um, so let's move now to February 7th, the day the blockade actually happened. Um, can you just walk us through that day, what it was like for you, when you found out, and, uh, and, and what you did that day? Well, I'll say leading up to the 7th, there was lots of activity over the weekend uh, because you could feel uh, the temperature rising in terms of comments on social media, what was happening in, around, in and around Sarnia. Uh, we were watching what was happening in Ottawa, uh, and we know... Anyone who lives in Windsor knows and appreciates uh, how important the Ambassador Bridge is, not just for our local and regional economies, but also uh, provincially. And so over the weekend, we started making preparations uh, to acquire Jersey barriers at the request of police. 
Uh, I had made uh, an effort to secure one of our Transit Windsor buses to, to put on the, I would say, the, uh, the, the, the other side of customs, uh, on the duty-free side of the tunnel, just in case there was a blockage at the bridge and the tunnel, because there, were, there was the thought that you could have the closure of both pieces of infrastructure. And we knew that we had to provide a mechanism to move help move healthcare workers who lived in Windsor and worked in Detroit. We had to be able to get them through the tunnel, even if their cars could not get through the tunnel. Uh, and so we moved a transit bus uh, to the to the uh, the other side to the duty free plaza uh, in the tunnel. And then there was there was work being done to figure out how to how to move that bus through because we were still in this COVID restriction period and there were there arrived can and all sorts of restrictions crossing back and forth uh, through the international border. So work was going on uh, on that front as well. And so uh, everyone was working very well together, uh, dealing with whatever information we had and, and trying to provide and, and prepare for uh, the eventual, you know, the eventuality in the worst case scenario, which would be the closure of Huron Church Road leading to the Ambassador Bridge. And ultimately, the tunnel was not blocked. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So the 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 bus was not did not need to be used. It wasn't used, but we made all preparations just in case because it was imperative that we had access for healthcare workers to get through to the United States. Okay. So there was a sense that um, the temperature was increasing, as you say, um, and then on the seventh, what what happened on that day? Well, on the 7th, we opened our emergency operations center. So uh, that is at one of our fire halls. Uh, the chief opened the EOC. Uh, there was a, a meeting, say, 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning uh, that day uh, at the EOC, or of the CCG, I should say. And everything was sort of laid out. Here's what we have. Police were on that call. Uh, everyone was briefed on the information that was available at the time. Uh, and, you know, everyone was on the same page. So preparations were being made if, if, it, if it got worse. And was there any discussion about um, doing any kind of actions to prevent a blockade from taking hold? Because it sounds like there was an anticipation that this could happen. It hadn't yet happened. Um, was there any discussion about trying to prevent it from happening? There were some efforts uh, by OPP, as I was made aware, uh, up the 401, you know, outside of the boundaries of the city of Windsor to try and divert uh, truck traffic that may be on the way. But I think it's fair to say that if you know the city of Windsor and anyone who lives in our city, because of the distance from, say, EC Row Expressway, the end of the 401 to the Ambassador Bridge, uh, and we're talking three kilometers each way, the number of businesses, the number of homes, the hotels that are built up that require direct access to Huron Church Road, it would be, for all intents and purposes, practically impossible uh, to, to guarantee with any certainty that you could provide a route for trucks and, and without having huge disruption to the community, uh, not just the business community, but also the people who live uh, on the west side of the city. Right, because Huron Church Road does serve as an access point between the east side of the city and the west side. It seems to cut right through the city, is that right? It bisects right through, and so yeah. you can imagine the Ambassador Bridge when it was built you know, 90 years ago, uh, that the road, Huron Church Road, was effectively a road with farms on yeah. either side back then. And over time, there are still homes uh, whose driveways require access to Huron Church Road. But over time, that's changed. And so, again, you have hotels, many, many hotels and motels. You have lots of businesses, uh, and you have a whole community. In fact, the, the, the western side of Huron Church Road is the oldest, one of the oldest communities in Ontario. Uh, going back to the, the mid-1700s. It was called Sandwich Town at the time. Uh, and so it, it, there is a, uh, it's a lot of history in that area, and a lot of people live there, uh, not just students that go to the University of Windsor, but a whole host of folks. I mean, there's probably 25,000 people who live on the other side of Huron Church Road, the west side. Right. And so there was a CCG meeting in the morning, and then uh, what happened after that? Uh, everyone was just making plans, doing the best they could do to support police as they tried to mobilize everything that they required to, to provide a support. It was, it was very obvious that if something happened here, it was a police response that would be, that would be required. And do you know at what point uh, the blockade, the slow roll became a blockade and the blockade took hold? I don't remember the exact time. Okay. Um, I'll take you to um, an email. It may help. 
WIN 402223. Uh, so this is another email, um, if we go down, from CBSA to uh, Ms. Brown, uh, and this is in the morning. Open source information states that a convoy will meet up in Comber, Ontario between 9 and 10 this morning and start heading for the Ambassador Bridge at 10. Info also states that they will only be going to the bridge and the tunnel will be left open for emergencies and emergency vehicles. Um, so this would have been uh, at 10 a.m. Um, or at 9.44 in any event, the bridge was still not blocked. D did you receive this information? Was this passed on to you? Uh, I don't recall if that was passed on to me or not. Okay. And I'll I mean, I, I, you know, I, I say that and I'll tell you, I was talking to the chief of police or the deputy chief probably five times a day. Yeah. Uh, and direct connection with our city manager and the department heads. So there was there was no lack of sharing of information in Windsor. We were we were all pretty much on the same page and aware of of what was going on and, and trying to develop and devise a response and especially try to help police as they needed. And so I'll take you to WIN six zero nine eight. <clears throat> And this is uh, another update from CBSA to Ms. Brown. And if we go down, uh, let's go down. So um, actually, let's go down all the way. Let's keep going. There it is. Uh, so Mr. Boismir says, I have been advised that all lanes at the bridge are closed and negotiations have halted. Protesters have advised that they are staying put and not moving. They appear to be setting up a camp of sorts. Both lanes to and from the bridge are at a standstill. So this is now at 7.18 p.m. Um, so do you recall hearing it sometime in the evening that the, uh, that the blockade had taken hold? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and if I can take you to WIN 402204.00. Now this is the, um, the CCG meeting that you had mentioned that had happened on February 7th in the morning. Looks like this was the first kind of blockade specific or convoy specific CCG meeting that took place. Is that right? That's correct. And um, if we go down, let's keep going to the next page. Uh, yeah, we'll keep going. Uh, see no let's go up a little bit more yeah okay good yeah so i'm looking at um the part that says we do have a comprehensive plan okay yeah so at the bottom there deputy belair can you tell us who deputy belair is uh he is a deputy police chief in the city of windsor responsible for operations okay and uh, you already mentioned chief mizuno who's the chief of police right at the time yes at the time and so Deputy Belair says, okay, we do have a more comprehensive plan and some fallback and negotiation strategies. There is freedom of movement and we do live in a democracy. If it is an aggressive, I'll keep going down, uh, public demonstration, we have incremental steps to take place as we have done our legal homework. Um, do you recall what the discussion was around this point, what Chief Belair was trying to express here? Uh, I, you know, my sentiment at the time was that they were doing everything they could to to speak with the protesters, to try and find some way to allow a slow roll to continue, if that's what folks wanted to do, but to prevent a permanent shutdown if you're on Church Road. Um, and my understanding is that in this meeting, the police service explained it had a plan in, in place if the protests worsened, um, and that in the meeting uh, preparations were discussed such as Jersey barriers and um, mobilizing uh, towing resources. Is that right? That's correct. And um, can you explain a little bit the city's uh, role in securing Jersey barriers? 
Uh, I'm not sure exactly who did it, but there was a request made, and so likely it would have been our public works department sourcing whatever we had internally as a city, uh, and then where we were deficient in the numbers required, reaching out to adjacent municipalities uh, and trying to procure the Jersey barriers that police had asked for. And my understanding is that the Ministry of Transportation of Ontario ultimately did provide a significant number of Jersey barriers. Uh, is that, does that accord with your recollection? Certainly at the end uh, of this incident, it, we, we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. We needed their help to secure three kilometers of Jersey barriers in each direction. So a total of six kilometers of Jersey barriers. And my understanding is the city was not, uh, did not secure towing capacity or was not um, able to secure towing capacity. Is that right? We have a, p police have a contract with a, a company, uh, which is quite standard, and they provide towing services. And so uh, they have, they had capacity, but there was, you know, also there were threats being made against the company and the owners of the company that if they participated in towed cars, uh, there was all sorts of things going on to sort of attack the company and their reputation online, giving them negative reviews and, and, and doing a number of things that happened ultimately. So yes, they were, they are our contractor, they were cooperative, uh, but if the expectation is that they could have helped move all of the vehicles that were there, including some of the heavy trucks, I don't think they would have had, it would have taken a long time uh, or they wouldn't have had all of the resources required. We would have needed additional support if any attempt was made to go in and, and, and move everyone in any timely manner. So they didn't refuse to provide services, it's just they were one company and couldn't do all of it, essentially. Yeah, I, I'm not aware that they refused to provide services. Okay. But you are aware that they received some kind of negative, um, uh, I guess, uh, repercussions as a result of assisting. That's correct. And my understanding is that originally both the, lane, the north and the southbound lane of the, um, of the bridge was blockaded and then at some point one of the lanes opened up. Do you have a sense for, uh, for the kind of the movement of the, of the blockade and the, uh, the different points of entry? I, I think police would be better positioned to answer that, but the briefings that I received from the chief at the time is that the ongoing negotiations, they were trying to get uh, a lane open for emergency purposes. Uh, and so they were at one time successful in doing that, and then that ended very, very quickly. And part of the, the issue that we experienced collectively in Windsor is that this was a, a leaderless movement. You know, there was no one speaking for the group uh, who could guarantee the behavior of the other members. Uh, and so police will know better the timing in terms of, you know, the, the ebb and flow of what they were able to achieve. But the briefings I received from Chief Mizuno is that at one time they did have a lane open, but that 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 agreement uh, dissolved very quickly. And my understanding too is that the access from Wyandotte uh, Road was open at one time and then that also became blockaded over time. Correct. And when you say a leaderless movement, is this information you receive from the police or how did you come to that conclusion? Yes, that's information I received from police. Okay. Now, on the 7th, which is the day of the blockade, uh, I understand you had a discussion with uh, Solicitor General Jones, is that correct? In or around the 7th, it was the 7th or the 8th. Okay, and, um, and she asked what Windsor needed to respond to the blockade? She did, and, and so um, obviously the Solicitor General had responsibility for the OPP at the time, uh, and I wanted to make sure that she was informed of what was going on on the ground, but my question to the chief of police uh, was, chief, what do you need? How many officers do you need? Because she told me she does not have enough human resources to end the situation that had developed in Windsor. So my, response, my question to her was, what do you need? Tell me what you need, and I'll help amplify whatever you need you know, up, the, up the, the chain with the folks that I speak to. Uh, and so she said, I need 100 officers. And so I amplified that with the Solicitor General, uh, I, I amplified that with the Premier, I amplified that with Minister Mendicino, uh, and then there were conversations later in the evening on the 8th with my Chief of Staff uh, and other Chiefs of Staff at the, for sure, the federal level, uh, and they asked for that request in writing. And so 
the chief in her own right was already working through her channels. Uh, and so I asked her, I told her that we're getting the request to put this in writing. Can you please do that? Uh, and she did that the next day. And so we received the letter on the 9th uh, and we sent that, she sent that letter to uh, asking for 100, 100 officers to uh, the commissioner of the OPP and the commissioner of the RCMP. And then we forwarded those letters as well to, to the folks that we were talking to. Okay, so if I understand correctly, you, you, it started with a discussion between you and the chief. You asked her what she needed. She told you 100. You then went to Solicitor uh, General Jones and to uh, Minister Mendicino and said, we need 100 officers. And they came back and said, please put that in writing. And then you went back to the chief and told her, put it in writing. And on the 9th, these letters went out. Is that a su fair summary? Correct. Okay. So when you spoke to the Solicitor General on the 7th, that would have been to tell her the request for 100. And is that when she told you I needed in writing? No, uh, she never told me she needed in writing. And so I, I, I spoke with the Solicitor General just because I wanted her to be aware of what was happening on the ground uh, and make sure that she was informed of what was going on down here. And uh, the same with Minister Mendicino, just here's the temperature and the tenor on the ground, here's what we're seeing, just so they had a you know, sort of situational awareness, I would call it. Uh, and so they didn't ask for it in writing. It was through their staff, really at the federal level, through staff at the federal level who said, can you please put the request in writing? And that was on the evening of the 8th. Uh, and then I sent a message to the chief saying, they're asking for this in writing. And she had one of her, her deputies or, or superintendents put that in writing and she sent it off in letter form to the commissioner of the RCMP and the commissioner of the OPP. And on February 8th, that was uh, your chief of staff that participated in that staff meeting, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and do you, do you recall anything else noteworthy from that discussion with the Solicitor General at that time on the 7th? Uh, no, she was just, she was obviously very concerned, very interested, uh, very much wanting to help. And, you know, I, we agreed just to stay in touch and make sure that we were informing one another of important things related to the matter. And in terms of your discussion with Minister Mendicino that same day, was it similar kind of tenor? Is that essentially the same type of discussion? Exactly. Okay. Now on February 8th, there was also a meeting of the uh, Windsor Police Services Board, correct? That's correct. And um, that was an in-camera meeting is my understanding. Um, do you recall that meeting? Yes. So I'll take you to the minutes of that meeting, WIN 401999. Okay, and if we uh, go down. Oh, sorry, I think this was actually your request to call the meeting. Yes. So you called this meeting as chair, correct? I, I, Sarah Sabi Houdin is our, our board uh, uh, assistant and so I had asked her to call a meeting of the board I think I did it if you went down even further I think I asked around noon on the 8th so and the the minutes of that meeting are actually at WIN 402174 Okay, yeah, there we go. So it was on February 8 at 7 p.m. Uh, and we can see the chief was there, uh, two deputy chiefs, you were there as well. Uh, some councillors were there and others. And um, if we go down to, I believe it's, oh, there we go. Uh, chief Mizuno provided an update to the WPS board on the recent situation regarding the Ambassador Bridge blockade. Uh, WPS was notified last week of the potential for this protest to take place in Windsor. Um, and then if we go to the end of that page, WPS has requested assistance should we need it from Chatham Police and LaSalle Police. Our top concerns are public safety and, and de-escalation. Um, what was the board's role with respect to securing resources from other local police forces? Uh, the board took no role in that directly. Uh, the board, and I think you see in the minutes, was do you, you know, chief, 
Do you have the resources required to deal with the situation? What do you need from us? If you don't have the resources, what do you need us to authorize in terms of budget or you know, whatever was in our purview uh, to assist with the chief uh, providing the response that was required? And did the, uh, did the WPS request any assistance from the board at this meeting? No. Okay. Um, and if we go down, keep going. Uh, Chief Mizuno there in the middle says, WPS officers are doing a fantastic job. Lessons have been learned from Ottawa and from our own past experiences and external assistance has been requested. Um, do you know what uh, the chief meant uh, from uh, when she says lessons have been learned from Ottawa? Do you know what those lessons are? In my conversations with the chief, the largest lesson learned was not to let this grow. Don't let bouncy castles and hot tubs and sort of those types of amenities come to the streets on Huron Church Road and allow this to grow. So make sure that we're dealing with this, um, you know, as quickly and swiftly and professionally uh, in a way that, as she said, provides for public safety and de-escalates. Uh, but don't, you know, lessons from Ottawa don't allow this uh, to grow. There may have been others that were on her mind, but that's one that she mentioned to me. And are you aware whether there were actions taken to contain it so that it wouldn't grow? Uh, police did take action with respect to Jersey barriers, and so they, they cordoned off uh, certain streets, uh, and they had uh, control of certain areas that I, I think, you know, made, made, think, made their life a little easier and, and was able to prevent of the situation from getting larger. And um, in terms of the request for 100 officers, uh, do you have a sense or did the board have a sense for how those, uh, that number was, was conceived? No idea. Uh, it was simply a request of the chief, what do you need? Uh, recognizing that they had already on the weekend, let's say of the, the fourth, fifth, sixth, leading up to this, uh, already put a request in for some public liaison officers from the OPP. Uh, and so they were, she was already doing what was required to ask for resources that we may not have had that would have helped provide for what she's saying here, de-escalation, public safety. Uh, it was only when it, when it was finally cemented, the situation finally cemented itself and it became a permanent blockade, she had told me, I don't have everything I need. We won't be able to resolve this with the human resources that we have inside the Windsor Police Service. We're going to need additional help, uh, to which my question was, what do you need? How many officers do you need? Uh, you tell me, and I will help amplify that, you know, at the political level, level so that they are aware of what our request is. And of course, the expectation is that she was going to do what she needed to do through the OPP and, and the proper channels operationally on her side. Right. And, uh, and in terms of an operational plan, did the board ever see uh, how those officers were going to be used? No. Okay. Did the board ever request to see an operational plan? No, and I think that would be somewhat unusual for, for at least for our board. We wouldn't get into that level of detail. Uh, and it was, none was presented and none was asked for. Okay. And uh, are you aware whether those resources requested were ultimately provided? Uh, I, I think it's fair to say more uh, than what was requested was actually provided. And so my understanding, you know, at the uh, sort of in the final analysis is that uh, we asked for 100. One may look at the fact that the chief wrote one letter to the RCMP and one letter to the OPP and may say, well, in fact, you asked for 200. Uh, even if you look at 200 as, you know, if you look at it from that perspective and you say we asked for 200, it's my understanding that we had at least 500 officers uh, attend to deal with the situation. And when you say you were amplifying the request politically, what was the response that you were getting uh, from the federal government and from the provincial government? A, a, a desire and willingness to help. There were great lines of communication with Sylvia Jones, great lines of communication with the Premier. Minister Mendicino was excellent, uh, and a great phone call with the Prime Minister uh, that I had that, you know, he was very understanding and, of course, living through the situation here in the Ottawa, had a, had a perspective on what we were dealing with and, and wanted to help. So all lines of communication were open and, uh, and it, was, it was back and forth, so it was very good. And um, did the board take any specific actions to support the WPS during this time? No, the, the board asked the chief, what do you need from us? And her, her comment effectively was we, we have 
everything we need or it's being worked on at this point. There was no direction required from the board uh, that wasn't already being worked on. So it was the board's understanding on February 8th that the only thing preventing uh, the blockade from being dismantled was the, uh, the influx of resources. There was a plan in place and it was just, they were just waiting for the resources? Correct. Okay. Um, did the board adopt any policies uh, pursuant to Section 31 of the Police Services Act with respect to either the slow roll or the blockade? No. Uh, did the board ever direct the police chief uh, in any way as contemplated in the Police Services Act? No. And who was advising the board on, uh, on these issues, on legal issues and interpretations of the act, etc.? Uh, we, we didn't have legal counsel in these meetings, uh, and so you'll see we had the entire, in this particular meeting, we had the entire board, we had the chief, uh, Deputy Chief Belair at the time uh, was there. We had our provincial police liaison person from the Solicitor General's office uh, there as well, Dave Tilley. Uh, and so it, 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 it never got to a point where the board felt like or asked a question that couldn't be answered or, or was unsatisfied in some way. So the board felt satisfied at the end of this meeting that they had asked the appropriate questions of our chief uh, and were supporting her in every way that she asked. Now, are you aware of whether the WPS had any communications with uh, protesters or blockade organizers? Uh, the chief did tell me that they continued, that police continued to, uh, to talk to protesters. Uh, again, I go back to you know opening one lane for a period of time that that was through a negotiation, uh, and every day uh, the chief told me that they continue to talk, they continue to have discussion and dialogue. Um, it just you know ultimately didn't didn't change much. Did you have any discussions with protesters or organizers? No. Okay. Um, do you have a sense for whether the protesters were local to Windsor, whether they were coming from the outside, whether they were coming from Ottawa? Do you have a sense for who, who these people were? You know, I, I asked the question uh, because clearly police were gathering intelligence on license plates and, you know, uh, scanning social media and, and doing the work that they needed to do. Uh, and I asked the question on whether or not these were, you know, were they generally local folks or were they folks coming you know, from elsewhere? Uh, and there were a fair number of local folks, as I was told, that were part of the, the demonstrating group. Uh, but I was also told by the chief that there were a fair number of folks who weren't even from Essex County that had come in from elsewhere to participate in this. Um, now, on February 9th, you said to reporters that arresting the demonstrators opposed to pandemic health measures and towing their vehicles could lead to violence and because you said some of them were willing to die for it. Do you recall saying that? I do. And how did you reach that assessment that they were willing to die for it? Well, there was a, there was a TV uh, report that was also reported on the front page of the Windsor Star, uh, where, and this was very early on uh, in the protest, that uh, one of the protesters had said outright that they were, this is a cause that they were willing to die for. Uh, and there was a... You know, the reports to me was that it was, there was a very high temperature on the ground amongst the protesters. Uh, they were very aggressive in their language uh, and in their posture, and it was that type of comment, willing to die for the cause, that caused police to take a more measured uh, approach in, in, into the way that they dealt with the situation. Uh, no, one need to, no one need to die on the streets of Windsor or elsewhere uh, protesting vaccine mandates or whatever the protest ultimately was about. Uh, and so everyone took a pause. No one wanted to see a repeat. You know, and that was one thing the chief had told me that there was a concern about what had happened in Toronto at the G20. Uh, and so, you know, members of the public in Windsor were saying, why don't you just go in there and end this? Like, it didn't seem like it wasn't something that it was an issue that the police couldn't resolve quickly. Uh, to the average person. Uh, and so the public uh, was feeling, you know, the energy that they wanted to see something happen. Uh, and at the same time, you know, police are saying this is not, you know, a typical protest that you would see on a Sunday afternoon on the, on the, on the front lawn at City Hall. And so they were being very measured, they were being very cautious, they did not want to see a recreation of the events that happened uh, in Toronto. And, uh, and so they were taking a lot of precaution. And do you have a sense for how many vehicles or number of protesters were involved? 
It, it, it seemed to ebb and flow. Uh, and so sometimes at night, more would come out as, as I'm told the party atmosphere sort of ramped up. Uh, and it could be 200 at one point, uh, you know, down to 75. Sorry, are you referring to protesters, protesters. or vehicles? Okay. Protesters. protesters. Sorry, was that your question? Uh, yes, okay. protesters and vehicles. Yeah, and yeah. vehicles, I, I, I'll leave it to uh, Deputy Chief uh, Crowley to answer that. I'm not exactly sure how many vehicles ultimately were there. Okay. And so, um, so then, is it fair to say that bylaw was not uh, ticketing and towing? Uh, they were not enforcing because of the reasons you mentioned in terms of escalating. Yeah, we we would never, with the temperature on the ground and the and the statements folks were making, we would never send our bylaw officers in uh, to enforce enforce municipal bylaws. In fact, you know, there was a report to me that we had a our, our parking enforcement is outsourced to the commissioners. Uh, and a commissioner did respond February 8th or 9th, went in to issue some tickets and, and was swarmed and put in a, a situation that was, uh, she felt was very dangerous uh, or that they felt was very dangerous and actually had to be escorted to their car uh, by police and, and leave, you know, and folks were spitting on the car uh, as the commissioner left. And so the, the, the temperature was too hot to think that you were gonna send municipal bylaw officers in there without police without police accompanying them. Uh, and so at the end of the day, uh, the thought was that negotiation would be the, the best way forward. And again, no one need to die or get hurt uh, in this type of protest. Let's find a sensible way through uh, and get everyone to move on so we can get the, the bridge open and the economy moving again. Right. And are you aware of any other incidences of threats or, or violence uh, with respect to the blockade? Aside from the one you just mentioned. Uh, well, related to the blockade, besides yes. the one at my house. <laughs> well, maybe tell us about that one. <laughs> well, one of the one of the folks uh, in, involved threatened to, I think it was to, to bomb my house or to do something like that. And so, you know, we woke up and all of a sudden there are two or three police cars around our house for several weeks uh, because of the, the temperature on the ground and what people were posting on social media and the comments that were being made it became a very direct threat to me and my family. And so uh, that in itself was concerning, uh, but it was just, it was, it was the, the nature and sort of the spirit of the protest. It was unlike anything I've ever seen. You know, I've lived my whole life in the city of Windsor. It's unlike anything I've ever seen during that time. Uh, and the, the posture and the language was, you know, it was, it was almost as if folks wanted some sort of brawl on the streets. You know, they were hoping police would engage in that way so they could have some sort of, you know, br brawl on the streets, if I can describe it that way. And I know police weren't interested in that. As the mayor, I wasn't interested in that. As chair of the police board, I wasn't interested in that. Uh, we were interested in finding a way through this that was sensible, that was practical, but ultimately that, that you know, opened the road leading to the Ambassador Bridge because it is cital, such a vital uh, economic piece of economic infrastructure not just for Windsor, Essex County, but for the entire province and, and respectfully for the nation. Uh, we had to get that roadway open. And um, are you aware of any other individuals who received threats? Anyone within city council, anyone within um, in any other kind of prominent position? I know Councillor Fabio Costante, who represents the west side of the city uh, on both sides, frankly, of, 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 of Huron Church Road. And there was a comment made that they would protest at his law office. He's a lawyer and he has a law office in Sandwich Town. Uh, and so th there was a, a comment made that they would be going there to protest at the law office. Did that materialize? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, so I, I wanna go back to the um, request for resources if I can for a minute. Uh, can I take you to WIN4016 and these are the letters that Chief Mizuno sent. I believe this one is to the uh, Minister of Emergency Preparedness. There we go, to Minister Blair. And that's on uh, February 9. And I just want to go down. Yeah, there we go. So it says, Windsor Police Service is requesting a minimum of 100 police officers be dispatched to the city of Windsor to bolster current and potentially future requirements. Okay, and if we go down, 
just want to see the signature. Yep, Pamela Mizuno, Chief of Police. Thank you. So that's the letter that she sent uh, to Minister Blair. Yes. And if we go to WIN 401648. So this is now uh, also dated February 9, addressed to the Honorable Sylvia Jones, Solicitor General. And if we go down, uh, I believe, so this one uh, is also requesting 100 police officers. I believe it's the same letter. Um, the letters were also asking in the second paragraph, marked police vehicles and tow trucks, including heavy tows for large transport vehicles. And if we go down, it's also from Chief Mizuno. Now you had mentioned that your understanding was that the requests were made to the RCMP and the OPP. Are you aware of other letters that were sent uh, to the com to the uh, commissioners of the OPP and RCMP? No. Okay, so these would be the, the requests, the letters that were sent. The, the, those are the letters that I'm aware of. Okay. The chief I know was having conversations with her colleagues that I wasn't, you know, that I wasn't party to, mm -hmm. uh, but this is this is what we were asked for to put it in writing uh, and that's what she did and she sent it off from her office to to uh, minister blair's office and to minister jones's office okay and on february 9 that same day um your chief of staff scheduled a meeting between you and the office of the solicitor general do you recall that i know we had a discussion on the 7th or the 8th and now it looks like there's another one on the 9th um what was the purpose of that discussion it was just an update uh, and so you know I was just trying to keep everyone updated um, was anything requested at that time or offered in terms of assistance nothing nothing more than the hundred officers that we had asked for okay and um, if we can go to WIN four zeros one five eight three So this is now text messages uh, between you and Premier Doug Ford, is that right? Correct. Uh, and so the dark uh, is, is you speaking and then the, the light colored text is uh, Premier Ford, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And uh, it looks like he is asking you to call him on February 9. Did you have a call with him on February 9? I did. And what was the discussion on that call? Uh, obviously he was receiving, I shouldn't say obviously, but he was receiving phone calls uh, from businesses as well who were concerned about the blockade at the Ambassador Bridge. I give him a, sort of a situational briefing on what we had going on down here uh, and, you know, that we had asked for 100 officers. So it was, a, I think, a fairly quick phone call, just a couple of minutes. And, you know, he was stressing to me the importance of the Ambassador Bridge. Uh, and that we have to find a way to get this open. And I certainly agreed with him and understood that as well. Did he um, make any offers of uh, assistance or anything of that nature? No, I, I had told the Premier that we asked for 100 officers and that, that OPP already had some resources on the ground, PLT, liaison teams, uh, that were already here. Yeah. Uh, so I told him that and told him about the 100 officer request. And then he asked for Minister Mendicino's phone number. Uh, which I, I texted to him. And now this is two days before um, the province declared a provincial state of emergency. Did that come up in your discussions with him? Never, no. So he didn't ask you whether you wanted that or whether you needed that or anything to that effect? No. Okay. Um, what about the Emergencies Act, the Federal Emergencies Act? Was that ever discussed with the Premier? Never. Now, the next day on February 10, uh, you spoke to the media and said that additional resources were being deployed by the OPP and that the Premier and Solicitor General were responding rapidly to your call for support. Uh, was that accurate at the time? Uh, I'm sorry, can you, can it you ask? On, it was on February 10. You yeah. told reporters that this request was being uh, actioned very quickly and that uh, the OPP was being deployed and that the Premier and Solicitor General were responding rapidly to your request for resources. I, I believe that to be true, yes. Okay. 
And do you have a sense for when uh, it says there OPP resources started to arrive? So by the 10th, you were receiving or the city was receiving OPP resources? Yes, we had we had some resources, cars that you could see, OPP cars along the, the Huron Church Road. Um, and the chief told me that there were PLT units that were already here negotiating. Uh, and then she did tell me that public order units were also starting to arrive. Because my understanding is that uh, the Windsor Police Service did not have at the time a PLT unit or a POU unit. Is that correct? That's correct. So they were coming in from other, uh, the OPP was providing those. Is that right? Yes, OPP, RCMP. Okay. Do you have a sense for when our RCMP officers arrived in Windsor? I don't exactly know. Did the board have any role in swearing RCMP officers in? No. Do you know how that was done or who, who did that? I, I just was aware that that was an issue, uh, and I'm not sure the mechanics behind the scenes on, on you know, how that was resolved. Okay. Now, my understanding is that uh, there was injunction, an injunction that was sought and granted with respect to the blockade, correct? Correct. And um, how did this idea come about? Who, who was uh, the initiator of this? Well, I, I was, uh, and on February the 9th, you know, in the in sort of the mid to late afternoon, I had had a conversation with our Commissioner of Legal Services, Shelby Askin Hager, you know, about the prospect of an injunction. And uh, she wanted to think through it and, and make sure she understood the best way to, to move forward with that idea. Uh, and then on the 10th in the morning, we had to move quickly if we were going to make that happen. And so I... I I said, we need to do this. Uh, and, and the reason for doing this was, there were multiple reasons. What people need to appreciate is that not just the temperature on the ground of the protesters, but the temperature of the general public to this protest was amplifying as well. And I could not as mayor, I could not as chair of the Windsor Police Services Board, direct police operations and tell the chief or the police administration how to move forward and when to move forward. I had no clear line of sight on how many resources were coming here. Uh, I knew there, you know, I'm getting dribs and uh, dribs and drabs of, of, you know, yes, some folks are on route. Well, are they on route from Alberta? Are they on route from Newfoundland? Are they coming from Aurelia? I have no sense of the timing. And so the public temperature to this protest was also growing rapidly uh, to the point where you had Facebook groups being set up where people wanted to go out and undertake sort of vigilante type justice on the streets to remove these protesters themselves. And it was, as it relates to, you know, the pandemic that we'd all lived through, uh, in Windsor we had lived through the same thing that many others have lived through, the stops and the starts of businesses, people not getting paid for a period of time, uh, and going through that, that frustration and friction as we've all dealt with the, the pandemic collectively. And so just when we were at a point where there seemed to be, uh, you know, light on the horizon, this was seen to be very, how do I say it, assaultive to many people in Windsor, that this was a small group of people, a relatively small group of people who were now going to jeopardize their employment. And so you had, like I said, Facebook groups that were starting where people were suggesting and, and, and union leadership. Uh, and take action themselves. And so part of the reason for applying for the injunction was to send a signal to the public that I'm doing everything, that the city is doing everything, that council is doing everything we can from our side of the table to try and resolve this issue. It was, easy, it was really the only positive step I could think of taking uh, that, would, that would be helpful in terms of a signal to the public. Before I did this, I did talk to the chief and said, would this be helpful to you? And she said, listen, it won't hurt. Uh, and so on the morning of the 10th, very early, we activated legal teams to start putting uh, the, the materials together, trying to see if we could get a scheduled uh, appointment in court uh, to present the, the application. And I worked with our commissioner of legal services and our city manager and all of the right people on the city side to, to see that move forward very quickly. And so, you know, the conversation really was first thing in the morning, seven or eight o'clock in the morning, and by two o'clock we were, 
we were appearing in front of Justice Morowitz uh, to have this uh, have this discussion. Right. So I'll. I'll um, and, and I would just say. Yes, so the, the one part was the public, letting the public know we're doing everything we can. The other thing was putting, you know, another arrow in the quiver for police. It was another tool uh, that they could use with respect to saying you are now in violation. If we were successful in getting the injunction, that you were in violation uh, of this injunction, and, and it was another arrow in their quiver. And. Um, so, so City Council uh, adopted a resolution that an injunction be sought, right? Correct. And this was on February 10. That's right. Um, so you were able to call a meeting that quickly to get everybody together from the 9th when you kind of conceived this uh, to the 10th. Is That's that right. right. Um, and it seems like the police was on board with the injunction. They thought it would be, a, it wouldn't hurt in any event. Wouldn't hurt. Um, and so, ultimately, as you say, the injunction became effective at 7 p.m. on February 11, is my understanding. Is that right? That's correct. And um, why was the city an intervener in that application and not the main applicant? Do you know? I, I, I think through our discussions uh, before we proceeded, we talked about who was most impacted. You know, and how could we tell the story here uh, about who was impacted? And it was clear uh, in the first 60 minutes of Huron Church Road being blocked, uh, our phone rang at the mayor's office from our largest employer, Chrysler, now Stellantis, to say, what's going on at the Ambassador Bridge? You know, there are 5,000 people directly who work in that facility making Chrysler Pacificas and minivans uh, that rely on smooth and efficient border crossings because the whole industry, the whole auto industry works on a just-in-time basis. There's no parts being stored on site. They are brought in and that bridge is moving and the material is moving across that bridge uh, every hour of every day. And so it's, it's you know, for perspective, the, the, the average part that goes into a car that rolls off the assembly line at the end of the, the, the manufacturing process, those, those parts have crossed the border on average six to seven times, back and forth, Detroit, back to Windsor, you know, as they continue to be you know, upgraded and built. Uh, and so within the first 60 minutes, they called and said, what's going on at the Ambassador Bridge? And so we knew that the APMA, the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association, the CVMA, the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association, uh, were impacted dramatically by the activity at the bridge. And so they were certainly, you know, good parties to put forward the, the request. And then we were, we took the role, we played the role that we played, I think, appropriately. And so my understanding is the Attorney General of Ontario was also an intervener in that application. That's correct. And um, how did they become involved and what was the coordination uh, with them like? I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, who took the lead on the injunction from the city's side? Uh, Shelby Askenhager, who's our Commissioner of Legal Services. Okay, so she would have, known, she would have had the, the coordination with the Attorney General, is that right? She would be the one in the best position to answer your question. Okay, fair enough. Um, so, as we said, on February 11 at 7 p.m., the injunction uh, came into effect. It was extended then on February 18. Is that right? That's correct. And what, if anything, did it change on the ground? What impact did it have, if any? Well, I, I, I think that once the injunction became effective, that it sent a signal to the public that this has now, from, from the public watching from the outside, that we have done all that we can do. Uh, and again, it gave another tool to police to go in, and, and they did. When the police went in and, and actually had to arrest people, those folks were, were charged with violating uh, the terms of the injunction. Uh, and so it sent a signal, but I think, you know, I, I would like to think that from a, a protester's perspective, it also meant that the protesters had their day in court, had the opportunity to present their position uh, to Justice Morowitz, Chief Justice Morowitz, and have a conversation in court through the established legal structures that we have in place. All parties had a chance to do that. And, and Chief Justice Morowitz ultimately made his decision that was favorable uh, to grant the injunction. Uh, but everybody had an opportunity. In fact, our application on February 10th was delayed and heard on February 11th to ensure that all parties, including the protesters, were given notice so that they could participate. 
police went out and plastered every telephone pole, the jersey barriers with copies of the order. We had to set up a website. We promoted it on social media. Certainly it was amplified in every uh, major media source and on, uh, for every social media channel that I saw. If, uh, if you could just slow down a bit sure. for the interpreters. Thank you. Uh, that there were great efforts made to make sure that all parties who had an interest in this application had an opportunity to have their day in court. And the city, uh, in fact, assisted to distribute these pamphlets once the injunction was granted to give notice of the injunction. Is that right? Correct. Uh, so would you say there was adequate uh, not notice given about the injunction to those in the, uh, in the blockade and to, in the protest area? Absolutely. Did it have the effect of um, having people leave? Did anybody leave as a result of the injunction? Or was it simply that then they were charged with violating the injunction once the arrest took place? You know, the reports, I wasn't on the ground, but the reports that came back to me is that uh, many of the protesters were looking at this as, uh, you know, another another court order, another law, another thing that just, you know, was dispensable. They could violate it. It, it was no big deal. It was just words on a paper. Uh, and so I'm not sure that it had, on the face of it, I'm not sure that it had the effect of having people say, oh, there's a court order, I'm going to leave now. Uh, I think it just, you know, gave them, uh, the protesters, another thing to, to, to rally behind saying nothing's going to make us leave. Now, was there any discussion with um, the Windsor Police Service about whether they had the resources at that time to enforce the injunction and whether that was a concern at all? Well, uh, I think it's fair to say as we got to, that was a Friday, uh, the 11th, as we got to the Friday, all of the communication from the chief to myself was that we had major resources that were here on the ground and the plans were uh, devised and being, you know, sorted out with the help of the OPP commander uh, and our own incident commanders. Everyone was working through how to uh, how to affect a resolution to this blockade. So fair to say that the injunction and the resources were coming at the same time. Exactly. Um, So uh, at, there was a, also a board meeting, a special in-camera board meeting on February 11th. Do you recall that? Yes. So that was the second uh, board meeting with respect to this blockade. Uh, and I'm going to take you to the minutes, WIN 402173. Yeah, and if we go down. Uh, if we keep going down. Okay, and uh, yeah, keep going down a little bit. There's a part where you ask a question. I'm just trying to find that. Keep going down. Okay, let's go back to the first page. Oh, there it is. Uh, Chair, Mayor Dilkins, is there anything required from WPS from the board. Chief Mizuno, no other resources required at this time. We initiated OPP resources Wednesday. Additional resources are flowing in. Our CMP have come to town as well and are helping. So this lines up with what you're telling me. By the 11th of February, it sounds like resources have been mobilized. They're starting to come in and uh, th there's no real concern over resources anymore. Is that Correct. right? Correct. And um, if we go down a little bit more. So Chief Mizuno there says, um, if and when we take action, we will be well positioned with resources to support that. State of emergency does help and gives us additional tools in terms of future protests. Now, this is on February 11. I assume she's referring to the provincial state of emergency, correct? That's correct. And do you have a sense for uh, what those tools were that the provincial state of emergency could assist with? I don't recall 
the entire list, but I knew that there were significant financial penalties. Uh, and the province, through their emergency action, also sent a very strong signal that if you continue to participate uh, in these protests, that at these locations or border crossings that you could lose if you were a, a, a truck driver, uh, your commercial vehicle operating license. Uh, and you could also lose your driving license if you were, you know, just not a truck driver. And so those are, those are pretty significant penalties that I think uh, sent a signal to any reasonable or sensible person to say we better think long and hard about wanting to continue the protest at this location because the 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 you know the the disincentive is huge right and and um do you have any sense for whether th that provincial state of emergency um encouraged protesters to leave the site i think that that provincial emergency you know when protest when the police were ready to move uh, and they did the next day and ultimately cleared it up two days uh, after this meeting that you had compliance when the Jersey barriers were, were you know, moved, when the police put their line in place and they started you know, moving forward with their line uh, and they got to the point where their vehicles there, the vast majority of people ultimately left. Um, now, I want to go back to uh, your discussions with the Minister of Public Safety, um, sorry, Minister Mendicino, uh, at WIN 402295, and these are the text messages that we had seen before. And if we can go to page three. So you say, I told Premier I spoke to you and he asked for your number. I get the sense he is going to follow Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, what did you mean by that? I, you know, the Premier, I think, appropriately was feeling the temperature across the province, was seeing these protests probably in Ottawa, but certainly in Windsor as, as um, uh, you know, an outlet for some who wanted some of the restrictions uh, to be lifted. And, you know, Alberta and Saskatchewan had moved to start lifting some of the restrictions. And my sense from the Premier is that he wanted to find a pathway to get back to normal, you know, as soon as it made sense as well. And did you have a sense that that was because of the protests across Ontario? No, not necessarily. I, I think, I think my, my, my sense from the conversation is that, again, he was he had his finger on the pulse of the people in Ontario and was watching, of course, what was happening across the country as well and was was feeling, you know, some of the uh, frustration that we were all feeling with respect to the lockdowns, recognizing that, you know, it was January of 2022 where we were in a lockdown as well, right. uh, provincial lockdown. So th the premier sensibly was was echoing some of the sentiments and looking at this as you know, a percentage of the population who was protesting because they felt most aggrieved by this. Um, and if we go to page nine, go down, uh, you say, I'm told our police support is going to be good. I think protesters are looking to make show of things. So in terms of the police support going to be good, um, was that from your discussions with uh, Chief Mizuno? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I should say Chief Mizuno and Deputy Chief at the time, Belair. Belair, okay, thank you. Um, and my, my understanding is you um, texted, once the injunction was granted, you texted the minister as well as um, Deputy Premier Jones and the Premier to let them know that the injunction had been granted. Correct. Right. Okay. Uh, and if we go to page 12 of this document. Okay. And he says, do you think it will end today? And you're saying, I'm thinking it will. So what was your sense on February 12th of where things were at in terms of resources and a plan to, uh, to move forward to, to, to uh, clear the blockade? That, that everything was in place, that the resources were in Windsor, that the plan had been devised. And in fact, on the 12th, the police started their operation. They, they put out the line uh, with public order units and all of the equipment behind them, and they started to, uh, to move forward on the 12th to, to deal with the situation on the ground. 
And in, in the text above, you mention um, the congregation from Harvest Bible Church. My understanding is they had something to do with um, continuing the blockade at some point on the 12th. Can you explain that situation? So uh, the, the picture above my words, I, I think, is a, a link or a screenshot from the, the pastor at the time. I'm not sure if he still is, but um, as the police started to move forward and you know make advances on on the 12th uh, there was a a call put out by the pastor at this church to ask for folks to come down and support the protesters and very quickly which would might have been you know 100 to 200 people turned into 600 people including parents with kids and strollers uh, like it was it was almost unbelievable uh, how fast that situation grew in terms of the number of people. But seeing the police action, I mean, it was, it was disheartening to see the police action and them making advances and then to see parents bringing their kids down to that situation. And that's exactly what happened, uh, which is largely why it wasn't resolved that particular day on Saturday. It took until Sunday uh, for the situation to be resolved. I see. So the police started moving in on the 12th and weren't able to because now the, the, the number of protesters grew in size. Well, and, and I think someone in the police structure, probably several people said this would be, you know, the most sensible thing here is to wait because at some point these kids are going to get cold. It's February. They're going to get cold. They're going to get tired. They're going to get hungry and they're going to, you know, they're going to leave. So we're not going to move forward with uh, the policing posture they had in place when you had a lot of young kids there. They were they were being very wise in their approach and saying, let's let's do this at a different time when it makes more sense. And um, if we go to uh, page 12 of this, oh, we are on page 12. Okay, keep going down, please. Um, keep going down. Okay, so you say, it will end today, fingers crossed, police have full control of the area now, and this is now on the 13th, correct? Yes. Uh, good, bridge reopened today. If so, it will be later once Jersey barriers, et cetera, are removed. There is still some activity in the plaza at, I can't really read that. To come see and hear To come see church. and hear on church. Police just got permission from owner to trespass these people. Stay tuned. Okay, keep me posted. Headed into meetings with the PM. Um, and if we go to page 18. So this is now 3.40 p.m. on the 13th, and he says, about to head into meeting with PM. Any critical updates? And you say, small flare-up, a block from Huron Church, a few arrests made, simultaneously working to get Huron Church open. 25 to 30 malcontents on scene. Keep going down. Update about 25 arrests now. Police hoping to reopen bridge tonight, trying to secure 1,100 Jersey barriers, failing which one side of Huron Church will reopen and operate for two-way traffic like a construction zone. And if we go down, and then um, it looks like then on the 13th, that's when um, the the bridge um, reopened is my understanding, or, or the blockade was cleared on the 13th, right? Correct. And then on the following day, um, he asks, how's it going this AM on the 14th in the morning, smooth so far? And then you say, are you guys taking some legislative action re-emergencies act? And then he says, we'll call you this afternoon. To the extent you can be supportive of any additional authorities that gets Windsor the resources you need to keep the bridge open, people safe, that would be great. So I want to ask you about that exchange. Um, what, what gave you the sense that there was some uh, consideration of the Emergencies Act being considered at that time? I had seen a report and I don't know which media source, CTV or CBC had, had or Globe and Mail had made some uh, post that I saw that that proposed that that may be in the works and so I it just caused me to send him the question and he said he would call you about that and he didn't respond over text but he said he would call you and did you have a discussion I don't know we did not oh you didn't no okay 
Uh, and then what did you understand him to mean when he says to the extent you can be supportive of any additional authorities? Well, I, I, I think, you know, we all know that that act has never been used before. And we all know that it's a, it's a serious act uh, and requires this type of thing to happen afterwards, which is extraordinary. Uh, and so if they were going to move forward with that, I think he's saying, you know, if you could express the way I took that is if you could express what was happening on the ground that would help justify this, that would be helpful to us. And I think it's really, really important, you know, to, to reflect on that statement, but also use that statement based on what we were seeing on the ground in Windsor. And so there may have been some great relief. There, there was great relief to a lot of people in Windsor uh, on the 13th. Once the, 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 the folks were moved, all of a sudden, you know, in lightning speed, 1,100 Jersey barriers were replaced, six kilometers of Jersey barriers, creating a direct pipeline uh, from the 401 to the Ambassador Bridge. But the, the piece that needs to be uh, explained here is the heightened state of alert that was in place by police in the community and the city with respect to sort of some sort of recidivism that may happen as a result of this blockade being moved. And it's the type of behavior that's happened throughout the pandemic, uh, where you have members of the public in Windsor saying, you know, there's a protest, we're all supposed to be masked and meters apart from one another. Uh, and there's a protest and 100 people down, you know, by our great Canadian flag at the waterfront. Why aren't police doing anything? Why is that behavior being allowed to continue? And it's hard to explain to people that if you move 100 people out and take action against these 100 sort of lawbreakers or rule breakers, uh, that you could have 3,000 the next weekend. You know, you become the rallying cry for this. And so that was the thought in place here from a police perspective. It's conversations that we certainly had uh, amongst many of the senior staff and myself at the city is, you know, this action needs to be resolved. This action needs to be taken to resolve the situation on the ground. Uh, but what happens after they're gone? And so the number of police that were sent to the city of Windsor to move the protesters out was one thing but a significant number of police resources remained in order to make sure that this didn't flare up again. Uh, and so from an Emergencies Act perspective, you know, anything that would send a signal to people contemplating coming to Windsor to, to start this over again, I thought, from my chair, was extremely helpful uh, to send a signal. You had the city declared an emergency, the province declared an emergency, and then the federal government declared an emergency. And I think that sent, ought to have sent a signal to a lot of people that this is a serious matter and will not be allowed to happen again. Now on that point, the city of Windsor actually declared a municipal state of emergency after the province did, is that right? Correct. And, um, and it was on, I believe on the 14th, is that right? That's correct. So. Uh, maybe just explain uh, why the uh, municipal state of emergency was called after the blockade had already been cleared and not, not prior to that. Yes, thank you for asking that question. And so uh, what happened is we had had a council meeting prior to me signing off on the declaration of emergency on the 14th. One of the uh, concerns that council had generally was there was a, a, a portion of the resolution in front of council that provided wide latitude to the city manager to do a number of things that council didn't feel comfortable giving sort of carte blanche uh, to the city manager at that particular time. And we're talking about acquiring resources, uh, moving transit routes, like the city operational type stuff uh, that I said, well, don't worry, if you have a concern with that, let's not get held up with that. I'll declare the emergency, which then would wrap that authority up in me, to me, uh, and anything that's required with respect to dealing with this, this uh, direct pipeline that's been created, I'll have the ability to deal with. Uh, and so we, we, I, I signed it on the 14th and I, I uh, you know, ended it 10 days later. Right. And so that allowed us just, and I don't even think there was much that came out of that in terms of you know, needing to be dealt with operationally. Everyone just sort of figured it out and, and we did what we had to do. I think, we, I think I may have given free transit to people who started on the west side of Huron Church to be able to get to the, the other side because the, the, the disruption was big. There were a few things like that, but nothing material, I would say, uh, was, was used, was done by me with respect to that emergency power. 
Right. And as you had mentioned, the injunction was really a signal to the public that the city was doing everything it could. Why couldn't uh, the state of emergency also be a signal, even if measures wouldn't necessarily be used or there wasn't much additional powers that could be gained from it? Wouldn't it be a signal to the public that the city was doing everything it could? Uh, do you mean, why didn't I sign the, a declaration of emergency prior to the 14th? Yes. Well, I, you know, I, I felt like there, that wasn't going to provide anything new that I needed at the time. Uh, so we didn't have, like police were telling me what they needed. I was trying to amplify their requests from a city perspective with respect to public works and Jersey barriers and all the things that we had to mobilize. No one came to me saying, we can't do this or they're charging us 10 times the amount. Nothing, nothing would have benefited. I, I can't see the situation becoming better because I signed it at that particular time. What happened on the 14th though, when everyone woke up and they saw this, this tunnel from the 401 to the Ambassador Bridge in both directions, if you live in Windsor, you know that that was like a major, major thing. All cross traffic was blocked, uh, bus routes were rerouted, there were going to be impacts on business. Uh, many businesses, over 200 businesses that were you know, impacted uh, as a result of that particular action. And again, that wasn't something that was my decision. That was a police decision to put these Jersey barriers in place and create a safe pipeline to and from the bridge. And so I anticipated that there would be uh, some requirement to deal very, very quickly on the municipal side with the stuff that we deal with operationally, that that tool would have given me uh, the benefit of acting quickly. And so that's why I did it on the 14th as opposed to doing it earlier because I, I didn't see the need to do it earlier. And so the purpose then was to, um, uh, to get some sort of financial compensation for the businesses that were, that were prevented from getting um, business because of the, the, the Jersey barriers that were blocking east-west traffic? I just knew, not necessarily. I okay. knew that, that what had been done was a was going to have some form of material impact on a variety of different operations and businesses, a, a material impact on the way people live their lives on either side of Huron Church Road. And what I wanted, it wasn't so much at that time sending a signal to the public, it was just saying, okay, council, if you feel uncomfortable giving the city manager that authority, I'll take that authority under the Emergencies Act and be able to deal with anything very, very quickly. Uh, and again, in 10 days, once the, once the situation stabilized and normalized, I, I signed off and said there's no longer a municipal emergency. And how long were those Jersey barriers in place along here on Church Road? Weeks, several weeks. I can't remember the exact date when they were finally removed. There was a, uh, an incremental, for, for a couple of weeks they were there and it was, a, it was a direct pipeline and you had hundreds of police on duty making sure that if trucks stopped, uh, that they were acting very quickly to, to have folks move on. Um, but incrementally and over time, you saw certain Jersey barriers removed at certain intersections so people could cross here on Church Road. Uh, and then police maintained a, uh, you know, I would say a, a heightened state of readiness at those locations uh, just in case there was a flare up. And um, what was your understanding of uh, the potential of uh, another blockade taking hold after the original one was cleared? Uh, th this, this, this is the important point, again, that there was the thought, and the chief expressed this to me, and Deputy Chief Belair at the time expressed to me, uh, that they were quite concerned that something would happen, you know, that there would be behavior where folks would come back, uh, and they didn't know when, they didn't know how many, uh, and there were resources, police resources deployed along the 401 outside of the city of Windsor to sort of monitor this type of activity. There were resources uh, allocated to, to scan social media and some of the, the likely sites to sort of gather intelligence on that front as well. Uh, but the thought was that they were coming back and there were some attempts. There were some attempts that police intercepted as I'm, as I'm aware of. Um. And my understanding is that there was also the concern that once Ottawa was cleared, that those protesters would come to Windsor. Correct. And what can you tell us about that? Again, just monitoring what was happening up in Ottawa, knowing that there was a high level of frustration amongst that, that protester group, uh, that you know, if they were looking to continue that type of protesting activity, it's it's 
it's one thing to do it at, in Ottawa at the seat of the federal government. It's another thing to do it at the busiest border crossing between our two countries that has a significant impact on the lives of tens of thousands of Canadians, not just people in my community, people all across this province uh, that rely on smooth and efficient border crossings for their livelihoods, who've been impacted you know, over a couple of years with the pandemic. Uh, and so, you know, there was, I think we all knew that if you wanted to have the, the biggest impact, uh, the biggest impact economically would be in Windsor, leading up to the Ambassador Bridge. Um, and if I can take you to WIN 50972. Now this is um, February 16, so a few days after the blockade has uh, been cleared. And um, this is a, a, a briefing. I believe uh, this, these were some remarks that you gave. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, if you go down, keep going. So there, the bolded section there, you say, let me be clear, this remains a national security situation that prevents us from simply reopening Huron Church Road to regular traffic at this time. What did you mean by national security situation? Well, I, I, I would add even national, you know, economic security situation. You know, the amount of trade that crosses at the Ambassador Bridge is material. It's material for our province, material for our nation. Uh, and so every day that that bridge is, is closed, it has a huge impact on the lives of tens of thousands of Canadians who rely on smooth and efficient border crossings for their livelihoods. And so national security situation, we, we had the deployment of three kilometers of Jersey barriers in each direction. I didn't make that decision. That was a police decision using the intelligence that they had uh, and all the tools and information they had at their disposal in order to find a way, the best way forward, to get access to the Ambassador Bridge from the 401 so that this bridge was open, that the economy was moving once again, and that they could maintain control of what I would argue is a piece of infrastructure that is in our national economic interest. It is, it is a very material, critical piece of national infrastructure that just doesn't happen to be, that happens to be owned by a private interest. Um, did you have any discussions with Minister Mendicino or anybody else at the federal government about the risk of um, another another blockade after uh, the the one on the 14th was cleared? Uh, I probably did. You know, I, there were check-ins. Minister Mendicino was very good at checking in, saying, "How are things going today?" He did that many days in a row. Uh, and to the extent I had information from police where there was something worth reporting, I sent that back to him so that he had situational awareness of, of what we were dealing with on the ground. Uh, Minister Mendicino is someone who went, he lived in Windsor, he went to law school at the University of Windsor, so he also knows the area. Uh, and once you have a perspective of what it's like on the ground, it's easier to have a conversation. He knows the impact of, of what happened on here on Church Road without me even having to to discuss it with him. He just intuitively knows that because he's from, he had experience in the area. Uh, and so, yeah, we went back and forth and he was very good at checking in, just asking for an update and trying to gather information for, 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 his, uh, for his perspective. So in terms of continuing threats uh, to, to the Ambassador Bridge, you're getting that information from the Chief of Police or the Deputy Chief of Police. You're not getting any information uh, from any federal entities giving you kind of intelligence or information. That's correct. Okay. Um, and to your knowledge, were any of the federal emergency powers ever used to prevent further blockades? Uh, I'm not aware. Okay. Um, now, on March 17, uh, you wrote to Ministers Mendicino and Blair and to the Solicitor General um, explaining some issues that you believed had been brought to light by these blockades. Do you recall that? Was this the letter asking to have a, uh, you know, a, a sit down and try and figure out the path forward? Yes. Yes. And so what were some of those concerns that, that you had at the time? Well, it, it, this is a, the Ambassador Bridge in the city of Windsor is a unique circumstance. So you have, as I said, the Ambassador Bridge, the busiest commercial border crossing between the United States and Canada which is privately owned, uh, that sits at one end of a municipal roadway. 
and three kilometers on the other end is a provincial highway. Uh, and so, you know, the 401 is a, is, a, is a roadway where there are no traffic lights. It's, it's sort of barrier free. Uh, but as soon as you get off onto Huron Church Road, you're on that municipal road, which falls under the responsibility and authority of the city of Windsor and the Windsor Police Service. You have six or seven traffic lights. So trucks, as they make their way from the 401 to the Ambassador Bridge, have to go through those series of municipal traffic lights. Uh, and it is a unique situation that you have, you know, a provincial highway at one end, a municipal roadway linking what I would suggest is sort of important federal infrastructure. Uh, and so my request to them, to the other levels of government was, we need to sit down and figure this out. We need to figure out in the event that something like this were to happen again, how do we respond and, and you know, sort of pull the template off the shelf that the response is seamless, that it's not, um, you know, a day or two here trying to figure out how many folks we need and who's going to do what and who should take the lead and then ultimately who's paying for it. You know, so the city of Windsor has, has, has carried all of the water. We're paying all of the bills, $5.3 million for the, for the you know, execution of this, this particular police action, which was absolutely necessary, uh, but I would submit is completely unfair that the city of Windsor is, is shouldering those costs. It was not a typical municipal policing matter. Uh, in fact, it, it was a national econo economic emergency. Uh, and we responded appropriately. The Windsor Police did a great job. Uh, the OPP did a great job. The RCMP, they all worked very well together. But we need to figure this out moving forward because the Ambassador Bridge is not going away. Our municipal road's not going away. And uh, the 401 is not going away. So what does this look like in the future? And that was my, my request to them is to sit down and try and figure out how we do this together in the future to eliminate any uh, sort of delays that might be uh, inherent in the way we, we moved uh, in February. And have you had any response back? No. Um, so can you give us a sense for the impact of the blockade, uh, specifically on the auto sector uh, in Windsor? Well, it was, you know, almost immediate. Again, within the first hour, our largest employer called saying, what's going on? Uh, the very next day on February the 8th, they suspended some of their manufacturing operations and, and it was intermittent during the week of the blockade. We also had parts suppliers that basically stopped producing parts because they had nowhere to send them and, and they don't stockpile large quantity of parts. Uh, and, you know, there was a there was a huge, huge impact in the auto sector. Uh, but don't forget, even on in Essex County, you know, city of Windsor is, is plus or minus 230,000 people. If we take the neighboring county, and we're, we're part of that county, just not part of their government. Uh, it's about 450,000 people uh, total in that area. Uh, we have the largest greenhouse operation in North America, second in the world next to Holland. And so a full 80% of all greenhouses in Canada are in Essex County. And so the produce that is, that is produced in those facilities that operate 24-7, 365, the vast majority of it is exported to the United States through the Ambassador Bridge. And so the regional impact, which we cannot discount, was material. It was major. Uh, and, you know, having folks idled, having plants idled is not good just for our economy. It also had an impact on the U.S. side because of the integration of our supply chains. And so that's why we had folks from the United States, you know, senior leaders in the United States calling for an end to this as well and trying to push for a resolution because it was impacting their economy too. And what discussions did you have then um, with counterparts or uh, others in the U.S.? I, you know, I spoke with folks at, at Homeland Security, but more from an, a, a, an operational perspective at the bridge, so the, the port director uh, at the bridge. Uh, and I spoke with the mayor of Detroit, you know, once during the blockade, uh, just to sort of, you know, touch base because I was getting a lot of media questions about whether I'd spoken to the mayor of Detroit. And, and I, I knew there really wasn't a whole lot that he could do, but I wanted to, to touch base with him. So, um, you know, we were trying to resolve this situation. There wasn't a lot that I think could be provided from the U.S. At one point, we, we did have an overture from the governor of Michigan's office uh, to provide tow trucks. I think she made a comment to the media and then folks brought that to our attention. Uh, and when we reached out and had a conversation with her chief of staff, it really wasn't that the state of Michigan had tow trucks. They just offered to facilitate uh, an introduction to tow truck companies that may be able to provide the support. 
I see. A any other discussions with, um, with, with U.S. folks? No. Okay. Um, so I want to take you to WIN 401628. And these are remarks that you gave. Uh, now we're going back in time in, um, on February 9. Um, but you said at the bottom of, uh, sorry, the top of page two, you said, if Canada becomes known as a difficult jurisdiction to do business with, to move goods in and out, for example, then supply chains will evolve and reconfigure to remove this element of risk and avoid Windsor-Essex. Um, what were you basing that information on? Well, <laughs> I think everyone is aware now, so I can contextualize this a, a little differently than I could at the time. Uh, everyone is aware now that the City of Windsor was successful in landing a $5 billion investment uh, from LG, a, a joint venture from LG and Stellantis. And so they're building the first Canadian electric vehicle battery manufacturing facility in the City of Windsor. All of that discussion, all of that work, uh, and the pre-planning was well underway during uh, the, the protest in February. It just hadn't been announced publicly. Uh, and so, in fact, the, the uh, CEO of Stellantis uh, Global went to Canada during this time to have a meeting with uh, senior officials. And so this was me sending a signal to the extent that any of those folks were watching that we understand that this has to end that we understand that you have a choice in terms of where you locate these facilities uh, and that we're doing all we can to try and move folks on and, and that sort of plays into the whole injunction piece as well that it, it, it it's the public facing part of it that was important as was it important to make sure police had another tool that they could use but i wanted to make sure that with respect to the folks you know, early on here, we're in the very early part of sort of rolling out all of the pieces back in February for this major, major investment. I wanted to make sure that they knew very clearly that we were very taking the situation very seriously and applying all resources that we could from a municipal perspective uh, to get this situation resolved, reflecting on the fact that, you know, did I think that the first Ford factory in, in, in Canada, 1904, uh, I didn't think a 100-year, 120-year relationship was going to be eviscerated because of a seven-day event. Uh, but at this particular time, it was critical that I sent that signal and had them uh, have me acknowledge that this is an important issue that needs to be resolved because it, 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 they were asking. Right. And so were you concerned uh, to some extent that um, the, the image or the... Um the viability of Windsor as a city to invest in might, might be compromised by this. 100%, because this investment that I'm talking about, uh, we, are, we are fortunate and we worked very hard to get this investment, uh, but there were options up the 401 in, in Ontario, and there were lots of options across the border uh, in the state of Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Uh, and so I was determined on behalf of the city to make sure that that landed here, and we were at a very fragile point uh, in, in the process that this could have been derailed. This, you know, if they had looked at this and taken a perspective that we don't want this hassle, it's just easier to do business in the United States, this is the type of event that could have derailed this major investment for, for Canada, for Ontario, and certainly for the city of Windsor. Um, and in terms of impacts on uh, residents, um, what impacts did the blockade have on, uh, on, the city, on city services, social services, medical services, transportation? What can you give us a sense? Well, ma major. And so I, I, let me mention several. Uh, when this all started, EMS had to move an ambulance to the other side of Huron Church. They had to make sure that they could cover that part of the city. Uh, our fire chief moved and deployed fire resources. There's a fire station literally 100 meters from where the protesters were protesting, but it's on the east side of Huron Church. They moved a truck to the west side to make sure that they could provide, that they could get there and provide service to the west side of the city. Uh, the transit routes uh, were disrupted. The, the natural flow of people back and forth and having Huron Church Road uh, closed was significant because there are no grocery stores on one side, of, on the west side of Huron Church, they're all on the east side. Uh, and a lot of folks have to take the bus, they, they, they don't have their own car on the other side of, the west side of Huron Church. And so they require the city system to be able to move around 
and live their daily lives. Uh, the University of Windsor. The University of Windsor is directly adjacent to Huron Church, directly adjacent to the Ambassador Bridge. The primary road that people in the city of Windsor would use to get to the University of Windsor is Huron Church Road. Uh, so 17,500 students uh, that attend the University of Windsor. You have a high school that was actually in the protest zone, Assumption High School. It's been there for probably 100 years. Uh, and so that, that school was directly impacted uh, by the, the protest activity. Uh, and I mean, just those are just, a, those are several, uh, but the impact was, was material during the protest and then even after the protest because of the deployment of the Jersey barriers uh, along here on Church Road had a direct impact to the hotels, the motels, the businesses, uh, the small businesses, large businesses, grocery stores, you name it, uh, they were impacted, including the high school, including the University of Windsor, because everyone had to find another way around. Um, and you had mentioned that the cost to the city was over $5 million, correct? Correct. And most of that, I understand, was for the Windsor Police Service. Is that right? It, it really is a mix, and we certainly have welcomed any audit of those expenses. Some police services sent us a bill. Uh, some police services didn't. Uh, but we had to pay for the jersey barriers. We had to pay for overtime. There, there was a whole list of expenses uh, that made up the $5.3 million that, you know, we are, we are carrying that cost at this particular time. Right, because in addition to OPP and RCMP, there were several local police forces that came to assist, correct? Correct. And so public order units, I know some were deployed from other parts of Ontario, but we contracted directly with the City of London. Uh, they have trained resources. They have a standard contract that they sent to us. I signed immediately. Uh, but that the provision of that service was $200,000, plus or minus. Uh, we had to feed people. You know, but the chief asked for 100 officers. Uh, I'm told that 500 showed up. Well, they may not have charged us. Some of the services may not have charged us for, uh, for the, the, the salary and benefit costs, but we still had to put some of those folks up in hotels. We still had to feed them. We had to move them around. There were direct costs, which we would welcome any other level of government to audit. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the residents in the city of Windsor who have, who have carried the full share of those costs to date. Um, and just to be clear, the uh, the blockade on was cleared and the bridge reopened before the Emergencies Act was invoked. Is that right? Uh, on the 14th, so the 13th around midnight into the 14th, I think the bridge opened around midnight on the 14th. So the Emergencies Act came was invoked sometime on the 14th. So yes, the answer to your question is yes. Okay, great. So none of the measures in the Emergencies Act were used to clear the blockade since it came after, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions for you. Thanks. Okay, so uh, I think this is probably a good time for the morning break. So we'll take uh, 15 minutes and then uh, come back to continue. Thank you. The Commission is in recess for 15 minutes. La Commission est levée pour 15 minutes.
Order à l'ordre. The Commission has reconvened. The Commission reprend. Ready to go? Yes, sir. Okay, so now uh, if I could uh, call on the uh, Democracy Fund to go first. Morning, Mr. Commissioner. Good morning, Mayor. Uh, my name is Antoine Dai. I'm Council of Citizens for Freedom, a group representing the peaceful protesters in Windsor, Ontario. First of all, Mayor, congratulations on your recent re-election. Um, I understand we heard earlier that you've been the mayor and the chair of the Police Services Board since 2014, but you also served prior to that in the capacity as a city councillor. Is that correct? Correct. And when did that start? Uh, December 2006. And so, since your tenure of December 2006, would you agree that you have got some significant influence and connections within the City of Windsor and, and are a central point of contact for uh, organizations such as the University of Windsor, the, the businesses in the area, and, and that you wield quite a bit of political influence? Uh, I, I would say that as mayor, certainly you're in touch with a lot of different people in the community, businesses, residents, and, and institutions as well. And so, in just in terms of the division of the powers, because I understand you do wear several hats, one being, again, the chair of the Police Services Board. Um, in, in your capacity as chair, you said that it is not the board's responsibility to direct the activities of the police. Is that correct? Correct. We don't direct police operations. Would you say that you, you influence what tactics and methods they may use? No. And when it comes to requests for resources, is that usually something that comes from the police to, and that request is made to the police services board, or, or is the police services board itself making requests for resources and things like that from the city? Uh, we go through an annual budgeting exercise, so the chief presents a budget to the board. We go back and forth until we land on something that ultimately gets approved by the board, which is then sent to city council. I will, sorry, <laughs> I'll speak slower. Uh, a, a budget approved by the Windsor Police Services Board is then sent to Windsor City Council for approval uh, and the chief would lay out in the budget document what is needed for each department. If something extraordinary happens, if there's a, an expenditure or a request outside of the normal budgeting process, the chief would then make a request to the Windsor Police Services Board and the board would make whatever decision they felt appropriate. Understood. And in your capacity as mayor as well, uh, I presume that you also had regular communication over the last couple of years leading up to the panda, uh, to, to the protests with the Windsor Essex County Health Unit and the Chief Medical Office of Health of the region. Is that correct? Frequent, yes, not daily, but there have been more. There has been more contact during the pandemic between my office and the health unit than any other time that I can recall. And would you say that over the last two years that there was in that increase? communication. Is it typically the city seeking guidance from the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit or is it that you know th these decisions are being made together in a collaborative fashion? What's that relationship between you and the Chief Medical Officer of Health of the, the area? Uh, they have very distinct uh, roles as spelled out in legislation and so there are often times because none of us have lived, ever lived through a pandemic uh, before, or at least most of us haven't, um, there are times where during the pandemic we've tried to sort out a, a course of action with the health unit to have a better understanding of where the medical officer of health may land on a certain topic. Uh, but ultimately, uh, my experience with the medical officer of health is they may give you uh, an impression or some guidance or some, you know, uh, opinion, but ultimately they le left it to the city to make every decision. And so would it be fair then to say that Typically, the recommendations, because we saw a number of Section 22 orders issued by the health unit um, that, that were the subject of some of the protests that led up to the demonstration at the bridge, would it be fair to say that the, the recommendations of the medical officers is, is the medical advice 
and that the actions of the city council in terms of the bylaws and the orders that are being passed are more of the, the political aspect of that. Uh, well, the, the medical officer of health independently makes any orders that, that he makes. It's, it's not dependent on us in any way. Uh, and then, of course, city council passes bylaws, resolution and policy, which is our normal governance role. Understood. And just in terms of that community control group, so am I correct that this community is a community control or a corporate control group? Community control. And, and the community control group, they met during uh, the week of, of February 11th on a daily basis, 9.30 every morning, is that correct? Uh, I don't know if it was every day, but we met very frequently. And, and did you attend all of those meetings personally, whether remotely or in person, or, or did you rely on others to communicate and relay to you the information that, that was discussed during those meetings? I'd have to look at the, the minutes themselves for each day. I attended several, but there may have been a time where I didn't attend, and if I didn't tend, attend, my chief of staff, Andrew Telezuski, would have attended. And so I presume then that the days that you did not attend those, those briefings about the bridge, you had other priorities to attend to at the time? Correct. And I guess you, you, you had an understanding that, you know, whether it's your chief of staff or the police services or whoever else attending those meetings was in control of that situation and, and that your immediate attention on that was not required. Is that correct? Well, the, the, the CCG does a good job at providing one source of information to multiple people so we're on the same page, but it's not exclusive. And so I may have had on any given day, not may have, probably more than five conversations every day with the chief of police about the activity that was happening in Windsor related to the Freedom Convoy. Uh, and so it, it didn't mean if I didn't, wasn't in that particular meeting that there was an absence of information because there was great communication throughout the city, great communication intergovernmentally uh, at the time and for the duration of the, of the, uh, the protest. Okay, and, and when you speak of the the duration of the protests. Is it fair to say that as mayor of Windsor, part of your role and responsibility is not only to represent the majority of, of citizens that elect you, but also the minority opinion? I, I represent the city of Windsor. And so certainly I absolutely represent the people in the city of Windsor. And so would it be fair to say that part of your role and responsibility then is to attend to those minority uh, those minority opinions and views, or at least to take them under consideration, particularly when there's active protests in the city? Of course. You would, you would consider what's being said on social media. You would try to understand the perspective. And, and as we did here, trying to find a resolution, trying to get, get this thing over with so we could open the, the route to the border crossing. Right. And, and I understand that you testified earlier that you at no point in time actually went down and spoke with the protesters at the Ambassador Bridge protest. Is that correct? Correct. Um, in, in terms of the leadership, were you aware that many of those attendees had also been protesting on almost a weekly basis since 2020 down at the Great Canadian Flag? No. You were not. As mayor, are you typically informed by somebody within the, the city's apparatus of the protests that are happening? Uh, only if it was exceptional. So, for example, if there was a protest on the lawn of City Hall today between 4 and 5, uh, I may never be given notice of that. I may walk out and see the protest, uh, but it, it's not normal that for sort of a general protest, which probably happens every week in some form, uh, that, that the mayor's office would get notice of that. Okay, so you say that you didn't receive notice of, you know, the anywhere between 25 to 50 people that gathered almost on a regular basis every weekend down at the flag. You say you, you were not aware of those. Oh, oh, I was notified of frequent protests at the flag, but I think your question was, was I aware that people who were at the protests at the flag were also part of the protests of the Freedom Convoy? I can't create that connection. Okay, and... And in the information that you received about those weekly protests leading up to the Ambassador Bridge, were you able to identify any of the organizers or the leaders of, of those protests? Yes. And did you at any point communicate the names or identities of those leaders to the Windsor Police Service or anybody else within the city? I, I didn't have to because the, the police were attending those functions independently. And so you saw the, the interaction with the protesters or at least the leaders of those protests is more of a policing matter than a, than a political matter. 
Well, the, the, and I don't know if it was weekly, I don't think it was weekly protests at the flag, uh, but, you know, going back to when they started the protests uh, at the flag with respect to COVID restrictions, uh, there were points where the, the, the gatherings were illegal. They were contrary to provincial legislation at a minimum. Uh, and so police were there because you again had uh, illegal activity, but you also had members of the public who were saying, why aren't you guys doing anything about that? Why are you letting this illegal activity happen when we have to follow the rules? We are following the rules and clearly this behavior is not following the rules. It's illegal. Why are you not taking action? Right. Would you agree with me that over the course of the two years those protests were building, there were many changes to the legislation and there was different times where perhaps the number of people allowed at one of those protests was within the bounds of law and other times, uh, you know, that there could be further restrictions in terms of the number of people that could gather um, and, and that that was a fluid situation and that not all of those protests were legal? I, I don't know because I wasn't receiving a debrief after every time folks gathered at the flag to protest COVID restrictions. So I, I can't help you with an answer there because I just don't know. Okay. Is it fair to say that in the protests leading up to the Ambassador Bridge, there were multiple occasions where there, were, there was a far bigger turnout of protesters and demonstrators than ever appeared at the bridge? Um, I'm aware of, uh, I forget the fellow's name, but he, he had some notoriety online and came to Windsor a couple of times. Uh, and that seemed to generate more activity at the flag when he came. Uh, Chris, somebody, or I think, but I, I can't remember his full name. But anyway, this, this person, when he came to Windsor, and there was at least two occasions that I'm aware of, more people seemed to gather on those two occasions over two years. And did I hear you correctly earlier that your understanding of the composition of the protesters is that many of those at the bridge were locals? and it was not all from out-of-towners, and, and to the extent there were people from out-of-town, out of a lot of them were coming from Toronto and other places in southwestern Ontario rather than Ottawa. Yeah, so my, my understanding was, a, it was about 50-50 from the chief. Okay. And so then, as your role as part of the CCG, would you say that part of your responsibility was communicating with the other branches of government, whether it was, I think we saw some text messages earlier with Minister Mendicino, uh, with the Solicitor General in the province. So one of your key responsibilities was being that spoke on the wheel to these other government agencies, is that correct? And our local members as well, members of provincial parliament and parliament. And so can you just explain who, who is Brian Massey? He's the, the NDP member of parliament for Windsor West, which is the area where Huron Church Road and the Ambassador Bridge is located. And did you have much correspondence or communications with him during the, the ambassador, well, during the time leading up to the ambassador uh, protest? Uh, leading up? I mean, I, I'm in frequent contact with him uh, about that particular issue. I don't recall any conversations specifically about the protests that were going on. Um, but when it happened, I did have communication with him once it, it, it set hold in Windsor. Okay. Um, can we just pull up a document here, WIN 401659? So, Mr. Mayor, we heard earlier that you said, you know, the, the traffic at the Ambassador Bridge is of particular economic importance, that every hour of every day there's goods and services crossing that border, and that, in, in your opinion, um, a, a significant interruption to those products and services flowing across the border is, is of economic importance. Did I, did I hear you correctly on That's that? That's correct. And... I believe, Mr. Massey, if we can scroll down here on this letter, it appears to be dated February 9th to many of the other federal ministers. And if we scroll down, and if we look at the top of the second paragraph there, it says that traffic disruptions along the road corridor to the Ambassador Bridge are not uncommon. So, do, do you have any idea of what Mr. Massey is referring to here? Uh, I, I don't. I mean, I, unless he's talking about just sort of general construction that happens on Huron Church Road, which is, you know, a requirement on any road, uh, I'm not aware of any major disruptions. Okay. Okay. 
So I understand that in your capacity as mayor, you may not hear about every protest that's going on in Windsor, but do you recall a protest in March 20th of 2019, I think this was during your tenure, where a gentleman named Eddie Haddad, is that name familiar to you? Yes. And, and who is Eddie? Eddie is a, a Windsor resident, recently ran for city council and has run several times in the past. And do you share my understanding that he's also currently the chair of the Liberal Party of Canada in the Southwest Division? I, I don't know if he holds that position. And did you ever receive any indication that he was also the chair of the Essex Federal Liberal Riding Association? I have no idea if he is or not. Do you recall hearing a statement from him on March 20th of 2019 in relation to a protest dealing with uh, funding for the university that apparently led to a temporary blockage of the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor? And Mr. Haddad's quote saying that we're going to continue to shut down the bridge at every protest we do until they reverse the cuts. Do you recall that? No. So in addition to construction, do you recall any other interruptions to the flow of goods and services across the border at the Ambassador Bridge? Over what period of time? Uh, well, let's say most recently. Is it true that on October 3rd of 2022, both the Ambassador Bridge and the Windsor Tunnel were shut down for, the, for a marathon? Yep, that happens every year. That happens every year. Yep. And is it your understanding that as part of that planning, both the bridge and the tunnel were completely shut down to, to commercial and pedestrian traffic for a period of time? Correct. It's the free Detroit Free Press Marathon that happens every year. So it's very well defined, very well prescribed, and, and the entire community on both sides of the border knows it's going to happen. Right. And were you also aware of a CBSA strike and protest in support of that over some wages or the fact that they had been working without a contract that, that caused some major slowdowns and disruptions at the bridge in August of 2021, as I understand it. I, I wasn't aware of any major disruptions at the bridge, but... So would it be fair to say then that, that this particular protest that happened in February of 2022 was not the first protest that impacted the free flow of goods across the border at the bridge? Well, I, I would say it was the most unique and caused a complete shutdown of traffic to the Ambassador Bridge. The others that you're trying to compare to are, are very distinct and different. And, and different, but also insignificant to the point that you, you don't recall that as a major event. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Now, you, you'd indicated that, for example, the Detroit Marathon that happens every year, it's well planned, it's well thought out, so all parties kind of have noticed that this is happening. Um, would, would you agree with me that the, the primary concern, perhaps from the city's perspective, as to this particular protest in February of 2022, was the uncertainty in terms of how long it might last and you know, whether or not the city or the province or even the federal government had the resources to, to handle that type of demonstration. Yeah, we, we, we didn't know whether the slow roll was ever going to become permanent. That wasn't, we weren't certain on that. Uh, and how long was it gonna last? It was a complete closure. The other ones were very time limited for very discreet events. Uh, and this was something that, you know, there was no known end date. And, and when you say it was a complete closure, are you aware of, of briefings through that CCG group where at various times there was certainly at least one lane open or, or two lane open um, to, to allow traffic and at least emergency vehicle access? Well, again, I, I think I mentioned that this morning that, that there were times when the chief told me that they've regained control of one lane and they thought they were talking to someone who had authority as a group leader to make sure that they could have emergency access through one lane. Uh, but then that quickly did not uh, last because one, par one party was never empowered to speak for the other parties and they decided to, to sort of block that lane. And that was part of the problem here, that this was uh, in many ways a leaderless movement where you know, there, there was no one specific to talk to and no one responsible for the outcome of the entire group. I understand. And, and you spoke earlier too about um, you know, constructions and other delays. And, and the importance of the just-in-time delivery system for many of the auto parts manufacturers locally. Would you agree with me that 
a, a slowdown or a significant slowdown, whether to construction or otherwise, would also have an impact, albeit not, not as severe, but it certainly has an economic impact on the auto parts manufacturers? Not necessarily. Uh, and so as long as one lane is open in each direction and vehicles can move, uh, that that works. I mean, we could we could work with that over a short period of time to continue commerce back and forth and let healthcare workers get to work. Uh, that can continue as long as one lane was open. And that, that is what police were trying to do from the very beginning was find a way to keep one lane open, allowing the protests to continue, the slow roll protests to continue, but allowing one lane in each direction to be open so commerce could continue. Right. And so the, the traffic disruptions, but the border's still open. May, may we pull up uh, POE? Dot CFF will be the seven zeros one. Just scroll down here, I just noticed the date that it's May 13th, 2019. And is this an accurate representation of, of Huron Church Line here? What, what are we looking at in terms of the nearest cross street where those, where those traffic lights are? Uh, I would have to have you tell me that answer, I'm not sure. Okay, would it be fair to say that this is close to the Ambassador Plaza and that we're looking at roughly two to 300 meters, maybe a kilometer away from the mouth of the bridge? Yep, that's correct. Okay. And would you agree that this type of traffic and slowdown is not unusual along that main corridor in your experience since 2006? Uh, I would say that there is, because of the number of trucks that use here on Church Road, there is always the need for some form of repair, rehabilitation, or construction along that road. Mm -hmm. uh, we receive money from the provincial government under a program called Connecting Links, which is designed to fund repair and renewal of roads that are municipally owned, but really serve a greater purpose, like here on Church Road. Uh, and so this is an example of construction where traffic is continuing to move uh, in both directions. And there's construction happening today uh, on that road that would look much the same, where it's, it's disruptive, but it does not stop international trade. And so you would agree with me then that this picture here in terms of the, the delays in the traffic is also emblematic and similar to the current state of the bridge since, let's say, the beginning of this summer. Yeah, there, there is ongoing construction on another portion of Huron Church Road, which would look similar to this as well. I understood. I'd like to briefly touch on sort of who knew what when within the CCG. You had indicated earlier that, that you were made aware of, of some, some demonstrations in Sarnia and, and that there were the slow rolls happening in Windsor. But am I correct in saying that Chief Mizuno was not terribly worried about the slow rolls that were happening at the end of January. That was no particular cause for concern. Yeah, she expressed to me that those were peaceful, that the vehicles continued to move and international trade continued to move as well. All right, and, and we also made aware that the OPP had shut down the highway junction at Highway 4, 402 in an attempt to block either the west or eastbound traffic and, and to control that situation on or about February 6th. Uh, I, I don't recall. Can we put up document when six zeros four one? And if we can scroll down. And so this email, I understand, came from Joe De Deckard. Do you know who he is? Nope. Um, but would you agree with me that if we scroll up here that this was sent to a City of Windsor employee, Carolyn Brown? Looks that way, yes. And so you were never advised as to the contents of this email or this particular update that the OPP had shut down Highway 402? Yeah, I don't recall seeing that email. All right, if we could scroll down a little bit further there, that the OPP in fact shut down the highway and that no traffic was able to go westbound to the US through Sarnia due to police action. Is that a fair assessment of the content of this email? I think it speaks for itself. Understood. 
And so if we could pull up Windsor document 0006039. And who is Andrew Ray? That's me. Okay. And so were you informed then by Stephen Lafore and Stephen Lafore is the Windsor Chief of Fire, is that correct? Correct. And he also sits on the CCG? Yes. And so he notified you about the protest at Blue Water Bridge. He was informed that the four by EMO that the 402 is now closed and it was closed by OPP and not by a blockade. Is that, were you made aware of this, this fact on February 6th around three in the afternoon? I, it looks like that email was sent to me, but I don't recall reading it. Okay. And I think later in this document too, that they say that they are trying to block off the ambassador bridge or at least threatening to do so. Is that further down in this email? Oh, we can scroll up a little bit. There's concern based on some limited intelligence, the convoy will be or is heading to Windsor today. Earlier intel indicated that the bridge was going to be targeted on Monday. So would it be fair to say that on February 7th, you had some intelligence that uh, there may be an action at the Ambassador Bridge? I think it was even earlier than that. And so I wasn't too concerned about, I mean, I was interested in the Blue Water Bridge, but that, that's not within my, my scope of responsibility. Uh, but I think if, it, you know, as soon as February 4th came and the chief told me, and she actually elevated the fact that there was a slow roll protest, uh, we started making arrangements that weekend. I think I mentioned this morning with respect to Jersey barriers. We started making arrangements with respect to moving the tunnel bus. And I initiated that action, trying to get the tunnel bus on the, on the duty-free side so that we would have a way to get healthcare workers through the tunnel in the event that there was a blockade at the tunnel as well. Uh, and so we, we didn't, I mean, it, we, we started that particular weekend making arrangements, uh, not knowing if the slow roll blockade or protest would ever become a full blockade. Okay, and then if, uh, so, so, after you were made aware of the potential action in Windsor, you basically left it to the Windsor Police Service to implement the plan and, and to deal with the possibility of, of a blockade. Is that correct? Well, again, they had a role to play with respect to actions at the Ambassador Bridge. I was looking at other things as well. Again, the tunnel bus issue uh, and making sure that, you know, the chief had the resources she needed as things developed. Uh, making sure that they could respond very quickly because we were watching what was happening in Ottawa. We were watching what was happening across the country. Uh, and we collectively wanted to make sure that we were finding best practices so as not to see that type of behavior happen in Windsor as well. Understood. Can we pull up Windsor, uh, Win 402174? These are the in-camera meeting minutes from February 8th, 2022 at 7 p.m. Do you recall being in attendance at this meeting? Yes, sir. And if we scroll down here, I believe it's on page two. I have to scroll down a little further. I think there's a quote there that says that at any point we can extend the circle of control. Do we see that here? Perhaps near, closer to the bottom of the page. Perfect. So that's Deputy Belair saying that at any point we can extend the circle of control. What, what did you understand that to mean? Uh, that if this escalated, they could, they could expand the area in which they were going to provide enforcement. And, and did you have any understanding in terms of what was within the circle of control on February 8th at 7 p.m.? No. I mean, I just assumed it would have been here on Church Road, but I, I was never given a plan that delineated the, the boundary. Okay, and I believe somewhere in here, Chief Mizuno says as well that we are ready to ask should we need assistance and that the amount of assistance will be dictated by what happens in the coming days. Do you recall hearing Ms. Mizuno or Chief Mizuno saying that? Yep, I, I believe that to be accurate. Perfect. And if we could just pull up your witness statement. You said earlier no changes needed to be made. I believe this is WTS 5019. 
believe in that document, you said you, you weren't sure where the number 100 came from, referring to the request for additional officers. Well, I know where it came from. It came from the chief to me, but I, I never asked her to sort of explain to me how she came up with 100. I simply asked her, what do you need to help get this situation resolved? She got back to me and said, oh, I need 100 officers. Okay, if we could pull up um, document WIN 402306 at pages 10 and 11. Well, I've been fairly liberal, but uh, you're now well over your time, so you're going to have to wrap I thought we had 45 minutes here today. Uh, no, you have 25 minutes. Okay, um, I'll, I'll pick things up then. Okay, if we look at page 10, and we scroll down, on the right side, is that, is the, uh, the text messages that, that are darker, is that you to, miss, uh, to, to the chief? That's correct. And is it there that you indicate that we need to make an official request to the province and feds for the 100 officers? That's correct. So, uh, could you help me reconcile that? Was, was the request for 100 officers or, or the estimate of 100 officers, did that come from you or did that come from the chief? 100% it came from the chief. Uh, is that February the 8th? Uh, if we can scroll up. I believe, yeah, if we go up a little okay, further, like I think the, there's a time stamp yeah, on there it. We so go. That's February, February 8th. 8th in the evening, right? So February the 8th, that's correct. And so February the 8th, the chief had told me she needed 100 officers, which I amplified up to the provincial and federal governments. What happened in the evening of February the 8th, my chief of staff, Andrew Talazuski, had a meeting with uh, chiefs of staff at the federal level of government who asked that we put the request in writing. Okay, can we... Zuski then told me that we need to put it in writing. I sent it to the chief saying, we need to put this in writing. So, so your testimony is that the request for 100 officers came directly from the, the chief of police and it was not at your direction? Correct. Okay, can we pull up uh, Windsor document 402295? I believe these are text messages between the mayor and Minister Medicino. So if I've got the timeline correct here, so February 8th at 7 p.m. during the in-camera meeting, Chief Mizuno says, we are ready to ask for assistance should we need it. Then later in that evening, you text her, and, and it appears to say probably about 100 officers. Um, if we're looking at here, page four. So on Wednesday, the following evening then, it appears that Minister Minichino is under the assumption that the, the police chiefs, so that would be Chief Mizuno, uh, told the OPP Commission that they are not requesting additional enforcement resources. And you said that that was inaccurate? I, I, I said wrong. Because <laughs> that's completely contrary to the conversation uh, that I had had with the chief and that we had discussed with the board. And if we scroll down a little further here, you had indicated earlier, um, correcting your statement, that CBSA went to offer tow trucks support to Windsor, and then the local police was saying that that wasn't necessary. Is that correct? Or that, that they that's, weren't That's interested? Minister Mendocino's text to me. Right. And so what I said was that we were offered tow truck support but it was, and what CBSA offered to do is to find the pathway to allow tow trucks and tow truck, truck drivers into Canada, which may not normally be admissible, sort of as a matter of right. They, did, they agreed to work with us if we needed to, to bring in US-based tow trucks to find the pathway to get them through the border so that they could be of assistance. Okay, and so, would it be fair to say then that, that the two parts of this conversation we saw you having with Minister Mendocino, Mr. Minister Mendocino was incorrect about whether or not the Chief Mizuno had requested resources and was also incorrect as to the, the type of assistance that was offered by CBSA. I think what happened when I received that message from Minister Mendocino and my response was wrong, I called the Chief immediately uh, to make sure I understand what, understood what was going on. The chief explained to me that in the conversation that she had had with Commissioner Karik, that at that precise moment in time, 
they weren't asking for any more because officers were coming in and she didn't know how many officers were coming in. I understood, okay. And it was also your understanding then that there was a plan in place as early as February 10th to dismantle this protest, is that correct? Well, I, I knew that officers were coming in. I did not know. The chief could not tell me how many officers were coming in, nor was I aware of how long it would take to resolve the issue. Okay, can, can we pull up uh, WPS, I believe that's... I'm, I'm going to have to stop you. You're now well over your time. So if you could wrap up, please. Okay. There's some latitude just to show a couple pictures here to make sure that we're on the same page in terms of what the enforcement action did look like um, on the February 13th. If we could pull up CFF609. Sorry, Council, is that, uh, is there a, another digit after the nine? Uh, not according to this note here. Okay, we can, we can skip that one and look at uh, CFF00000260 instead. And so those officers there, is it, you're saying those are Windsor police officers or are those OPP? I, I can't tell from the flash on their arm. It does not look like a Windsor flash though. What about CFF 00000261? Those appear to be officers on the roof. Do you, do you know if those are Windsor police I, or is that OPP? I can't tell. Can't tell. Okay. And you indicated that you weren't sure exactly what time on uh, either the 13th or the 14th that the bridge had been cleared completely. Do you recall reading a report from, again, I believe this is Chief of Fire Stephen Laforé, that the blockade is clear and that all needs have been met? It's at 9.52 p.m. on February 13th. Yeah, yeah I do recall the, the, you know, the bridge had been, the, the roadway had been cleared earlier than the bridge opened. And so they had to get the barriers in place once the people were moved out and the vehicles were moved out. They had to get the barriers in place before they could open the bridge. And then, of course, they had to make sure. But the area was secure. Everybody. Uh, as secure as it could be. But there was a heightened state of, uh, of alert on that particular day and for weeks afterwards. Understood, and, and just in terms of the, the intentions of some of those protesters there, uh, I understand that you referred to what happened at the Ambassador Bridge almost as a last of the Mohicans moment, and that when asked to clarify, you, you indicated that some people there were willing to die for that cause. Would you agree, based on some of your, your observations, that in the evenings, at least it was a party atmosphere, that the vast majority of protesters there were not willing to be shot in the streets to maintain that protest, and that it was, by and large, absolutely peaceful? Well, I... Professor Button, thank you. Um, that was a compound question uh, that my friend has asked. I think it's an unfair question to uh, the mayor, and he hasn't provided any of these statements for him to see. I, I, I object to that question. Okay, I'll, I'll move on there. And, and just to clarify, so Chief Pan Mizuno, she is no longer the chief of police in Windsor. She announced her sudden retirement on March 22nd. Is that correct? She has retired, yes. Okay, I asked and you lastly, to wrap I, I think I can wrap it up there. Ago, uh, no more questions just for this witnesses. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is uh, the Government of Canada.
Uh, good morning, Mayor Dilkins, uh, Commissioner David Shiroki for the uh, Government of Canada. So, uh, in your evidence in chief through the Commission Council, you'd indicated the city had supported an interim injunction that was granted on the 11th of February. Uh, I'd like to pull up the reasons for that interim injunction, uh, which I think can be found in a number of places, but at uh, OTT 407333. And as that's uh, being pulled up, um, you'd indicated in your evidence in chief that there were concerns about uh, vigilantism leading up to uh, enforcement, and that was a factor that went into seeking the injunction. Is that correct? Absolutely. Where were these concerns coming from? Uh, social media, for sure. A Facebook group had been set up. We had local labor, labor leadership uh, that was uh, being very vocal about gathering a group of people and going down there and ending this blockade. Uh, and so it was, it was a theme that uh, I would suggest had a head of steam fairly early on because everyone appreciated the impact of what was going on here. And were you aware of any organized efforts either through that social media or through announcements through uh, official groups? Well, I'm, I'm aware that there was a discussion with police that had people lower the temperature. People who were purporting to want to do that, to lower the temperature and just let us resolve this in a peaceful way. And so we have the document open, uh, which are the reasons that were for the injunction granted on the 11th of February. And specifically, I'd like to go to page 9, uh, and in particular, paragraph 46 of the decision. And so, uh, paraphrasing a bit, the court finds that there's no question that the blockade had caused and would continue to cause irreparable harm to Windsor. Um, would you agree that the harm that's being discussed here by the court, and in fact the harm that the city of Windsor was talking about in supporting this injunction was the harm caused by a continuous blockade and not temporary increases in traffic? 100% the, the, the harm was economic harm to a lot of people in the community. And uh, is it your understanding that uh, roughly around midnight, either the night of the 13th or the 14th, the, the blockade was cleared and the bridge reopened to traffic? Correct. And with respect to the timing of that enforcement, in your evidence in chief, you indicated that there was a delay in enforcement due to the arrival of children at the protest. Correct. What were you hearing from police about the impact of the presence of children at the protest? I, I, what I heard uh, from the chief is they were going to stand down on the Saturday night, resume enforcement on Sunday. Uh, you know, there were people live streaming on social media uh, from the area, so I watched some of that. Uh, as well, and media was there reporting. And you saw the numbers of protesters swell dramatically. Uh, and it was, all of a sudden you saw kids in strollers, you saw young kids. And it was, I would submit, in direct relation to uh, the sort of call to support by the pastor in that one particular church. All right, and um, sort of in a similar vein, I'd, I'd like to take uh, the witness to uh, WIN 402238, please. Uh, and while that's coming up, you'd indicated the city had asked for uh, an extension of the interim injunction and that this was an indefinite uh, extension. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and, and the document that we're pulling up, again, are the, the court's reasons for granting that indefinite, uh, indefinite extension to the injunction. If we could go to page 8, uh, in specific paragraph 47, and at the bottom there, I think it's at Roman numeral four, the court found that the city of Windsor had established a continued threat of a new blockade. And with respect to, again, the, the evidence and the submissions that were being brought to the court to extend this injunction, is, is that the concern? Was it a, a, either a continued blockade or a reemergence of the blockade? Yes, more, more a reemergence. Uh, I mean, at the time, obviously, it was, it was to try and have everyone move on. But again, I think it's I've said this several times, the, the, the heightened state of alert that everyone was under, that police were under following the removal of the protesters in their vehicles, I've never seen that in my city in the past. Uh, and so there was a strong concern that this would happen again, which would put us on a cycle of having you know another week of trying to move people out and mobilizing resources from across the province and across the country. And so uh, the city provided uh, a number of affidavits in support of this injunction extension, and I believe the 
uh, application record from the city is at win five zeros nine two five, and I, I won't ask that that uh, be brought up. It's a very long document. I just would like to uh, refer to it. Uh, that there was evidence provided that, that spoke to this continued risk of a blockade re-emerging. Um, and so uh, a document that I would like pulled up is WIN50803. I'll just wait for that to come up. Uh, Mr. Mayor, what are we looking at here in terms of geographically within Windsor? Uh, the, the yellow line is here on Church Road, and the X's are intersections that access here on Church Road. If we, could scroll, Church. if we could scroll down briefly. So there's an indication there, no local traffic beyond this point, and that's the period. Uh, you, you spoke of sort of a, a tunnel. I know there is a literal tunnel, but the tunnel leading down here on Church Road to the Ambassador Bridge, that's the area you're speaking of? That's correct. Once you pass that red bar where it says no local traffic, you, you basically had to get on the Ambassador Bridge. And if I told you that this was a map of the traffic uh, structure on the 16th of February, would that sound about right to you? That's correct. So this was a closure of a major municipal road in Windsor, wasn't it? Yes. And it impacted residents in nearby homes and neighborhoods? Uh, massively. And you'd indicated uh, the specific neighborhood of Sandwich Town as being to the west of Huron Church Road. That's correct. And there were no access to groceries for the residents of Sandwich Town as a result of the blockade and then the subsequent closure of the road. They, they had to take a very long road to get to the same grocery store that they would normally get to. And so the city had to provide alternative bus services to those residents so that they could go about their lives. And we did, yes. yes. And you would agree with me that the city and the police would not choose to continue to limit access by residents to Huron Church Road unless it believed there was a real risk that a demonstration could return. Correct. And I know you said that you were uncertain on the date at, at which point these traffic closures stopped, but you would agree with me that the measures to prevent the reestablishment of a blockade remained in place after the 23rd of February? Yes. So uh, Commission Council took you to win five zeros nine seven two, uh, and I'd actually like that to be brought up, please. And I'll take you to a, a similar portion uh, where you refer to uh, it remaining a national security situation. Uh, if we could scroll down, there's bolded text. There it is. Um, and so this is the situation that, again, it says here, prevented reopening here on Church Road. And that's the closure we were just looking at on that map. Yes. If we could go to page three. Um, and so it says here, we cannot ignore these ongoing threats because of the inconvenience that's being caused along Huron Church Road. Uh, with respect to these ongoing threats, can you speak a little bit about, uh, I know you said the information was coming from police, but what were you hearing during that time period? Uh, there were, for several weeks, um, I mean, immediately, once the Jersey Bears were put in and access to the bridge was, was made available, uh, there was a, a high state of alert for police. There was still a huge police presence along here on Church Road. Uh, and there was a, a, a strong concern expressed to me by Chief Mizuno that there was a concern that this could flare up again. And that lasted for several weeks. It lasted, in fact, you know, until the situation was dealt with in Ottawa. And the thought was that when Ottawa, uh, the protest in Ottawa was disbanded, that folks would get in their trucks and come back to Windsor. Uh, so this lasted for quite some time. And so you referred in this statement to it being a national security situation. Did you see the events in Windsor as being connected ideologically or otherwise to other events happening nationally? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly, you know, watching what happened in the U.S., uh, where there were freedom convoys in the U.S., and, and that happened in several cities. Uh, that was concerning. Seeing what happened in Ottawa, that was concerning. Knowing the money that was being reported with respect to flows from uh, um, those the, the, the give, send, go, or whatever it's called, GoFundMe, uh, that, that was concerning. Uh, and so there were lots, there was no shortage of concern. Uh, and this was, in my mind, and, and will remain until I'm long gone, a, a national economic emergency. Uh, and that is a direct, uh, there is a direct correlation to a national economic emergency, and I would submit to a national security issue. And this is exactly what this was.
And with respect to the specific topic of security, were you aware of the arrests that took place in Coots, Alberta on the 14th of February? Yes, sir. And how did you become aware of those? Uh, through traditional media. And what's your understanding of those events? Uh, that, that police were able to intercept uh, a group of people who had weapons uh, that intended to do harm uh, to others. And they were part of the protest in Coots, Alberta. And acknowledging, of course, that Coots is quite geographically distant from Windsor, Ontario. Uh, reading that with respect to, again, to talking about security, were there any concerns that were raised in your mind at that time? You know, I would say that what, from my impression, what I saw happen in Coots was the type of behavior that police were posturing for here, the type of behavior they thought may play out here. And I think that played out in the posture that they presented and the way that they handled themselves in Windsor. Uh, and so the Coots situation happened after the fact, but there was that level of temperature on the ground where police in Windsor were quite concerned and did not want to inflame the situation. They were taking every opportunity to de-escalate a highly charged situation. And so you said both in your evidence in chief and in your witness statement, your understanding or belief that the invocation of the Emergencies Act sent a signal that the federal government was taking the blockade situation seriously. I agree with that. And that it may have discouraged the reestablishment of the blockades, particularly with respect to the Ambassador Bridge. I agree with that fully. And that's, is that still your view? Yes, sir. Okay. Moving on to economic issues. Um, I'd like to take the witness to SSM dot CAN five zeros four nine five underscore REL and in particular page two uh, and, and while that's coming up um, actually we'll, we'll start on page one just so we can identify the document now this is likely not something you've seen this is a, a background or report with respect to the impact of the road blockade on the ambassador bridge that I believe was prepared uh, by Finance Canada so if we move to page two uh, the reason I'm bringing this up, if we scroll down. Now, there's a, a discussion here about uh, both the exports, and I think the exports have been well covered in your evidence. Uh, what's your understanding about the uh, items uh, or goods that are imported from the United States uh, into Windsor? I, I don't know that I have a, a, a discrete... I don't know that I have discrete knowledge on the imports versus the exports, and I would just say that with respect to the trade that we see regionally in our community, or at least locally in my city, uh, there is, I go back to the, 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 the parts that cross the border six to seven times before they're put into a vehicle that rolls off the assembly line. It speaks to the tightly integrated supply chains that we have in Windsor and Detroit, which are we're respectively our own auto capitals of our countries. And so going back to the report in the, the last paragraph that's on the, the screen there, it speaks to Canada importing uh, $4 billion worth of pharmaceutical products and $2.4 billion in medical equipment that, that go through the Ambassador Bridge, and that was in 2021. Is that uh, a figure that would be surprising to you? No, I believe that. Uh, you also mentioned the bridge's impact regionally. Uh, would you agree with me that the imports that come in through the bridge don't stay in Ontario? In their entirety? In their entirety, no. And that it's part of a national supply chain? 100% agree with that statement. Uh, I'd like to now take the witness to WIN 401628. And this is a statement that my friend uh, for com Commission Council took you uh, to earlier uh, that was delivered on the 9th of February. And if we could scroll down to, I believe, the top of the second page. So this is the statement here again that if Canada becomes known as a difficult jurisdiction to do business with, to move goods in and out, for example, then supply chains will evolve and reconfigure to remove this element of risk and avoid Windsor-Essex. And was that your concern at the time with respect to Canada or Windsor specifically's reputation as a place to do business? It was part of the concerns for the reason that I mentioned, and they actually play out in part of the conversation, the, the readout which has been submitted uh, in terms of documents, uh, my, my readout with my conversation with the Prime Minister, where I even raised the issue uh, of, of the battery factory in that conversation with him. Uh, and so there is no doubt uh, that we must tread very lightly with respect to these types of incidents as they relate to our competitive position, not just as a city of Windsor, but provincially and nationally, uh, because we are competing against 
Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee for these types of investments. And you've seen big automakers make investments in those states. And we knew that we were fourth and goal, to quote a, a football term, on landing this battery factory. And so I needed to make sure that the signal was sent to those who would be interested in this, that we, we take this very seriously and we're going to resolve this very seriously and very quickly. Um, acknowledging that I'm just at my 15 minutes, if I could just briefly take the witness to one more document and wrap up, would that be acceptable? Yep. Thank you. Go ahead. It's a PB dot CAN dot, uh, sorry, yeah, dot six zeros two three underscore REL. Uh, and while that's coming up, I'll, I'll provide some context. This is another document that you may not have seen. It's a February 10th email chain between uh, employees of the Canadian Embassy in Washington, D.C. and the Consulate General in Detroit. And, and specifically, I'd like to go to page two. These are uh, a series of tweets uh, from uh, a U.S. representative, uh, Slotkin, who I understand is the congressional, uh, eighth congressional district representative in Michigan. Um, and I, I uh, if the commissioner will allow, I'd like to give the witness some time to read. Uh, there's a series of tweets that go down the page. So uh, if you could take a look and, and let the clerk know when you can scroll a bit further. You can keep scrolling. It's the upside of a tweet is at least they can be read quick. Yeah. <laughs> Just underscores those statements, underscore my explanation. And so you would understand these statements to be a, a political representative from the U.S. saying that we would need to move manufacturing to the U.S. as a result of incidents like the blockade at the Ambassador Bridge. That's absolutely correct. Um, and my friend with Commission Council uh, took you to uh, some texts that you had with Premier Ford, and in the interest of time, I, I won't ask that they be brought up again. Uh, but do you recall him texting you that he had every major company all over him? Yes. Do you understand what he meant by that statement? Absolutely, I do. And uh, what, what was your understanding of that statement? That this was not just companies in Windsor or companies in Essex County. This, this, this bridge and this border crossing has, it's of provincial and national significance. So when it's blocked, he gets phone calls from major manufacturers all the way up the 401. Uh, at the risk of pushing my luck, Mr. Commissioner, if I have two more questions. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, you would agree with me that a blockade of the Ambassador Bridge would be more economically damaging than blocking the Detroit Windsor Tunnel? Yes. And that an experienced truck driver would know that they could not use the tunnel? Correct. Those are all my questions. Thank you very much uh, for that indulgence, sir. Great. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, the uh, convoy uh, organizers. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, Brendan Miller, I appear as counsel for Freedom Corp, which represents the protesters that were in Ottawa in January and February of 2022. Uh, good afternoon, sir, again, and uh, thank you for appearing here today. Uh, my first question is, is prior uh, to you taking on your current office or former office, uh, what did you do in, uh, as a job prior? I'm a lawyer as well. You're a lawyer as well? Yes, sir. And I take it you didn't ever work in national security law, did you? No, sir. All right. And so it's fair to say you're not a national security expert and you don't have background on what constitutes uh, a national security emergency. Is that fair? I, I would say that I've never practiced national security law, but there are some things on the face of it uh, that present themselves and I think would be obvious to everyone uh, could be related to national security. Right. And uh, when it comes to national security, uh, I take it you rely a lot on law enforcement. Is that correct with respect to providing you information? Correct. Right. And in your capacity, of course, municipally, that's primarily going to be your municipal police force and the OPP? Mostly municipal police. Mostly municipal police. Yep. Right. And can you agree if you said you have some of an understanding of national security? So you're familiar with uh, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service? Yes, sir. And what's your understanding of what they do? Well, they have their own act, and, and certainly I'm sure it's well spelled out in the act that if you brought it up, we could go through it. But Yeah, but you're, you agree with me that there's the, the Federal Intelligence Service, sort of the Canadian equivalent to the CIA. Is that fair? 
Yes. Okay. And so the intelligence they gather with respects to threats to the security of Canada, can you agree with me that uh, they would probably have the best information? I think they're certainly a good source. I think RCMP would also be a great source as well from a policing perspective. And okay. Uh, could we please bring up a document? I've sent an email about it arising from my friend's cross. Uh, TS.NSC.CAN.001.0001. Zero zero two zero six underscore rel underscore zero 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 one. Jennifer King for the City of Windsor. Um, Commissioner, we received an email, it appears, uh, from my friend Mr. Miller less than 15 minutes ago with uh, three documents that he is. I'm, if I can assist, I'm only referring to the one. That's it. In any event, we had no notice of these documents. It's contrary to the rules. We haven't had any notice that they, he intends to put this to uh, Mayor Dilkins. Okay, Mr. Miller, I, the, I don't the, think the document, this is the first time. Uh, yes, and it only arose from cross-examination from my friend, as I made clear in my email, not from the City of Windsor, not from the Commission, but from my friend uh, with the federal government, uh, which made it relevant. Okay, well, let's see what the document is, and if there's a problem, uh, either if the witness needs time or if uh, counsel for Windsor has a, right. an objection, we can, we can deal with it. Now, sir, this is a document from the Canadian Security Intelligence Service summarizing uh, what it is they uh, discussed with Cabinet regarding threats to national security. And if we could just scroll down to page five, please. Okay, so I just want you to see that. So on that document there, on February, or February 3rd, CSIS assessed, there was no uh, indicators that known IM, uh, IMVEs, and I take it you know what that is, uh, actors were planning to engage in violence. And then if you scroll down to the, the other bullet points, it states on February 13th, CSIS advised that the implementation of the EA would likely galvanize uh, the anti-government narrative within the convoy and further radicalize of some towards violence, referring to the increase in violent rhetoric following the declaration of the state of emergency in the province of Ontario. Furthermore, CSIS advised the in down yeah, for thank you. Furthermore, CSIS advised that the invocation of the EA by the federal government would likely lead to the dispersing of the convoy within Ottawa, but would likely increase the number of Canadians who hold extreme anti-government views and push some towards the belief that violence is the only solution to what they perceived as a broken system and government. Following the invocation of the EA, CSIS brief cabinet and reiterated the potential for the EA to increase anti-government views and violent ideologies, including in those not yet radicalized. Now, can you agree with me that you would never want to uh, do anything that could create further radicalization of extremists within the city of Windsor. Is that fair? I'm, I'm yeah, going to object, object to this question on this document. Withdrawn. And, and object to this document being yeah. put to the mayor. With, withdrawn. I'm done. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, next is uh, the uh, city of Ottawa. Um, you can get started if you'd like, uh, and uh, we'll seems to always happen at the city of Ottawa to be at lunchtime. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor. My name is Ann Tardif. I'm one of the lawyers for the city of Ottawa. Um, you mentioned in your testimony, and I think in your witness summary, that you had calls uh, with both uh, the Solicitor General, uh, Sylvia Jones, for Ontario, and the Federal Minister of Public Safety, Minister Mendicino, correct? Correct. And you were requesting additional police sources, and I should say that you were amplifying the request uh, that your chief had uh, alerted you to, fair? That's correct. Thank you. And you mentioned that the federal government in particular was very supportive. So was, so was Minister Jones. Both yeah. were very supportive, were fair great. enough. And I take it that staff, if I understood you correctly, staff at the federal level asked that your request or the request for additional resources be put in writing. Is that correct? 
That's correct. And we saw the letters that Chief Mizuno sent uh, further to that request to both the provincial and the federal government, right? That's right. And I take it they were sent more or less at the same time, fair? That's true. And uh, it's fair to say then that no one at the federal government said to you, you've got to go to the province first, you're not following proper protocol or anything of that nature. Well, I, they, they didn't say don't send me the letter, but you know there was a conversation that the order of operations is municipal to provincial, provincial to federal. Uh, but you know the nature of what was happening here and the nature of what was going on uh, across the country, uh, we knew. I think a, a sensible person would know that there are resource. There's limited resources, and they're being drawn to assist in different areas. Uh, that, from my chair and my perspective, and I think it's fair to say from Chief Mizuno's perspective, we didn't care whether it was the OPP or the RCMP that arrived. We just needed more boots on the ground to help resolve the issue. Perfect. Thanks very much. If I could bring up WIN 50410. And while this is coming up, Mayor, it's an email exchange between Jason Raynar. Is, am I pronouncing that correctly? That, yes, you are. Thank you. At the City of Windsor and uh, Chief Laferre, who I understand is the Fire Chief in Windsor and was also the Chair, if I understood correctly, of the CCG. That's true. Uh, and if we uh, scroll down to the bottom, there's the email from Mr. Raynor to uh, the entire corporate leadership team, uh, including, of course, uh, Chief Lafore. Uh, and he's advising uh, that the injunction has been granted and will come into effect at 7 p.m. tonight, which is Friday, February 11th, correct? That's, that's correct. And if we could scroll down, Mr. Clerk. He says, but these advances may have the effect of, quote, unquote, ratcheting up the protesters and their supporters. We will be watching closely to see what developments happen over the next uh, 24 hours. And it goes on from there. So this concern about ratcheting up the protesters with the issuance of an injunction was something I take it that the, the city was aware of on the 11th. Well, the city was, but the, the chief, when I told her, when I asked her, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to apply for an injunction. Do you think this would be helpful? That was never a conversation or a concern that she expressed to me from a policing perspective. So our fire chief saying that, I'm not sure where he, you know, where he, 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 he put that, where he got that from, to think of putting that in an email. Uh, but clearly, you know, we weren't looking to ratchet things up. We were looking to resolve things in a sensible way. And I take it then your chief reassured you that that was not a concern or not one that she had at heart. She never expressed to me a concern about and drew a correlation between an injunction and the, 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 the thought that we would be ratcheting up or escalating the situation. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I understand and um, we've heard already in your testimony that there was an original uh, injunction, time limited for 10 days, obtained on February 11th and that the city then moved to obtain an indefinite extension of that injunction, correct? That's correct. And this will be the, the last document I'll ask Mr. Clerk to put up and it is WIN 50921. Mayor, this is the um, a factum or the legal argument, uh, well, you're a lawyer, the factum, <laughs> as I can use that word, that the uh, city of Ottawa, if we scroll down just a little bit, the city of Windsor, pardon me, filed uh, in support of uh, the order or seeking the order for an indefinite extension of the injunction. If we just scroll down, you'll see it there. Factum of the intervening party, the corporation of the city of Windsor. And if we could go to paragraph two, Mr. Clerk. Before I take you through this, um, you've given ample evidence already about the concern that the city had about the uh, possible resurgence of uh, a blockade at the bridge if the injunction were to expire, correct? Yes. And I just wanted to, to draw this out. This is the argument put forth by the city of Windsor, and it says, the events in the days since the February 11th order was made have reinforced the ongoing need for the injunction. Since the February 11th order came into effect at 7 p.m. on February 11th, 2022, it's paragraph, subparagraph A, protesters defied the February 11th order with numbers increasing and peaking at between 600 and 800 individuals during the evening of Saturday, uh, February 12th, 2022. Um, and I take it that was information the city obtained from, from police. Yes. 
Okay, and that was information that formed part of the city's decision then to seek a continuation of that injunction. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Mayor. Those are my questions. Okay, so I think this is an appropriate time to take the uh, lunch break. So we'll take uh, an, an hour and come back to continue the, uh, the questioning. The commission is in recess for one hour. La commission est levée pour un heure.
order a lot? The commission is reconvened. La commission reprend. Okay, next uh, up, I believe, is the uh, Windsor Police Service. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, I am Tom McRae for the Windsor Police Service. We have no questions uh, for Mayor Dilkins and uh, give our time, if we may, to the City of Windsor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, former Chief Slowly. Thank you, Commissioner. Mayor Dilkins. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Curry for former Chief Slowly of the Ottawa Police Service. And I just have a few uh, questions for you, if I can have you assist the Commissioner. Um, first things first, uh, unprecedented in your experience, both in politics and as a resident of Windsor. That's correct. And um, I think you told the commissioner it was unlike anything you have ever seen in the roles that you've played, including as the chair of the Police Services Board. That is correct. Um, all the way down to the death threats against you and presumably other, other members of your council or the administration of the city. Is that true? I, 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 there were threats to firebomb my house. Uh, I was my some of the folks put my home address online. Uh, people were driving by my house and the police were there. So, you know, there was there was that threat directly. Uh, the other threats were to protest and and I'm not aware of any other death threats to members of council. Right. And that's a first an unpleasant first for you as well. Yeah, I, I think it's you know, I, I live with my wife and two kids, so it's unpleasant to have someone threaten to come and fire by my house. In, in, uh, Chief Slowly has told the, the commissioner that, this, that the events in Ottawa represented a paradigm shift in, in protest as we have understood it in Canada. Uh, do you share that view? Well, I can speak just from my perspective in the city of Windsor, and again, I would I would reiterate that this was different than almost anything else I can recall seeing in my entire time in the city. Certainly, my entire time as an elected official uh, in the city of Windsor, and it was the the temperature and the tenor and the 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 aggressive nature of the actors that certainly. Um, caused everyone to respond in a different way and be far more calculated and, and uh, concerned about the approach. And it, it, I believe it's also true that this is the first time that the Ambassador Bridge um, or other critical infrastructure in Canada, I suppose, has been used to by protesters. The first time it's ever been closed by protest, first of all, is that true? That is not true. Uh, there was a protest back in the early 90s, uh, but there was an injunction granted very, very quickly to reestablish the, the route to the Ambassador Bridge, so it, it did not last for a very long time. Okay, got it. Yeah, first time, I suppose, also as the chair of the Police Services Board that you have seen the Windsor Police Service unable to mount a police response with their own resources. Correct. And uh, that led you to, as you have told us, that led you to engage with your provincial and federal and municipal partners, along with Chief Mizuno, to get the resources that you needed, right? That's right. And I think you also told the commissioner that there were no impediments raised by the provincial or federal, your provincial or federal counterparts at the political level. Um, to the, to the uh, obtaining of those resources. You put your hand up and said, we need help, and they came to your aid. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. I, I think they were responding to the best of their ability. Chief Mizuno did tell me 
that someone in the mechanism of, or in the, in the, the group of folks she was working with, the mechanism of the police order, that they had to figure out how to allocate resources in Ontario because we were not the only place experiencing a, a, a protest like this. At the time of the protest in Windsor, the blockage on the 7th of February, of course, Ottawa was, had by then been, um, uh, choose the word, but I'll use the, the Occupy language. It had been occupied by protesters uh, for several days by that time. You knew that. That's correct. And were you told, do you, or do you recall being told by the minister, I'm now referring to the Solicitor General, uh, or the federal minister, that Windsor was the provincial and federal priority for the OPP and RCMP? No. All right. It, it, you, you, you did not know that, that Windsor, by the 7th, or soon after the 7th, was identified by those partners as the as their priority no one said that to me but you know because of the significant economic damage that was being caused a reasonable person would say right. they need to fix this quick understood it and you you told us i think you told the commissioner that these events in windsor affected tens of thousands of of canadians it would be it would not be an exaggeration to say it it affected many more than that uh uh, given the given the uh, the economics that you described, is that fair? I, 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 it, it, it's probably hundreds of thousands, if we're being completely honest. Uh, you you as the chair of the police service board, just a couple of questions about that. You um, e whether whether as the chair of the police services board as or as mayor, am I right that you made public statements to provide information to the residents in Windsor and to the uh, wider audience about the need for resources? that you had requested? Not specifically. We did not go out and say we need 100 officers, but we did amplify the police request for additional officers so that the public knew uh, that the city, the police, that we were in harmony, working together, and we needed additional support. Right. I saw, I th tell me if, if my memory is right, but I thought I saw that on, on one, in one of no doubt many interviews that you were giving at the time, I think it was to a CTV reporter that you did identify the number that had been requested at the earliest date, I think being 100. Is it possible you mentioned that? If I made that mistake, it was corrected very quickly and it was not made twice. Okay, understood. Um, and, and as well, am I right from the record that you held your police, you decided as the chair of the police services board to maintain those meetings that you had with Chief Mizuno and her staff in camera? The, the police board meetings? Yes. That's correct. Okay. Um, now, uh, can I just ask you, um, please, to look with us at uh, one of those police services board meetings that you, t uh, you showed my colleagues. Um, and that is, uh, for the registrar, Windsor, WIN2173. These are minutes, I think, Mayor, of, uh, uh, of the police services board meeting. Just while that's coming up, can I just ask you also, it, it, it seemed, both listening to you and looking at the record, that you made a conscious effort to have your council and the police services board speaking with one voice. Very early on, my chief of staff, Andrew Telezuski, sent a message to city council asking that any requests for media interviews, any public comments, any desire to post on social media that we really speak with a unified voice so that there was clarity uh, and no confusion. And, and I must give the city council immense credit for doing that. They were very, we worked very well in harmony together. And am I right, for, and again, for the commissioner's purposes as he considers recommendations, um, you faced enormous public pressure, didn't you? Yes. To act and the police service um, experienced enormous public pressure to act. That's true. And do you agree with me that it was important, and it would be important in the future, for municipal leaders like you and police service board chairs like you uh, to, to, to be disciplined about speaking with one voice and to have matters dealt with in camera? Uh, that was extremely helpful. Uh, it was extremely helpful on, with communication to the public that they had one source of contact that we weren't um, 
stepping on each other in terms of messaging. And as a city councilor, there's a great desire to respond to every complaint that's coming in from residents, and we were all receiving them. Uh, and so by sticking together like we did, I think it was actually good for the public that they had cohesive communication, that it was checked in many times, uh, the public comments where we had uh, 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 public press conferences. Those comments that I delivered were reviewed by the chief of police and, and, and her team. Uh, so that there was no, there were no surprises when we delivered a message. Understood. And it, am I right that the other thing that you did was, um, you became the the voice of the Unified Council Police Services Board and the city's response. You were the spokesperson. Spokesperson for the city. Yep. Right. And uh, did in that role, did you take, did did you take some of the pressure away from the police service? having to deal with those matters uh, themselves or the chief herself? Uh, probably. I mean, the, the, the most important point was that they were focused on the police operation and, and the communication to the public, even as enunciated in our, our CCG and, uh, you know, duties and responsibilities. It's the mayor's responsibility to communicate with members of council, members of the public, members of media. Uh, and so we just followed the rules that were, were spelled out and it worked very well. Thank you. And while we're on recommendations, you mentioned to the commissioner that you had penned a letter to the to your federal and provincial counterparts uh, concerning the expenses that Windsor has borne as a consequence of the of the blockade. And so far, no reply. But uh, would you say that for re in terms of recommendations from what you have gone through, that what would be worth considering is is a coordinated effort by all three levels of government to deal with these kinds of events in the future were they to arise again, including down to cost sharing? Absolutely. These things should be spelled out. So especially, the, use the Ambassador Bridge as the perfect example where you have federal responsibility, municipal roadway, and municipal responsibility, and then connecting to a provincial highway where there's provincial responsibility. These types of things ought to be worked out. I'll slow, slow down. These things should be worked out in advance. Uh, most importantly, who's, doing, who's paying for what? because at the end of the day, we've, we are shouldering a big expense on the backs of the residents in the city of Windsor to deal with what I call a national economic emergency. Understood. And then may I just uh, get your help with this? Uh, what is on the, uh, on the screen now, 2173, thank you, Mr. Register, is the, the in-camera meeting of the Police Services Board February 11th. So this is just shortly before the operation uh, began on the next day, the 12th, is that true? That's correct. And Chief Mizuno is there, you're there. Just scroll down if you don't mind. I just wanted to have you uh, help us with, uh, you, you asked um, if there was anything required. Chief Mizuno said, no, resources are, are flowing. What are the outcomes and so on? Just scroll down, it's just a page two that I wanted to, stop, stop there please. Chief Mizuno, when asked about specifics, said the situation is still fluid. We are working on our operational plans and continue to review as new information such as this becomes available. The goal is to reinstate traffic on the bridge. Uh, counselor asked a question about the injunction enforced, uh, being enforced and she said, we are actively working on our plan. I'll, I won't take you through the rest of it, but do I have it that Chief Mizuno did not ever provide the police services board with details of the operational plan, which was as of the 11th still being actively worked on. That's correct. And is it true also that the absence of that finalized plan to be presented to the Police Services Board or to anyone did not impair or delay the, the delivery of resources from your policing partners at the provincial and federal level? That's true. We, we, the board was never waiting on the plan to be presented to us for some sort of receipt for information or approval. We knew we, but the point was, does the chief have the resources to implement whatever plan is being prepared? And that was the question asked by the board. Understood. Then just two, two more things very uh, quickly to have your, your help with, please. Could I please show uh, the mayor WPS, f uh, lots of zeros, 522, Mr. Registrar, please. This is a situational update, uh, Mayor Dilkins, and I just want to get your help for the commissioner in terms of the status of these um, the cir circumstances in which you found yourself as of the 8th, this is at 14.30 hours, you knew that these situational reports were being prepared? 
Uh, and, and you would be briefed by the chief or her deputies? I, I was not privy to this. I didn't know that there were these particular reports, but the chief would share with me the things she thought I needed to know. Right. I just want to tell me whether you learned this information in any of the briefings that there were 50 to 60 vehicles at that time. So this is the afternoon on the 8th. Um, and they're described there. And this last sentence of that first paragraph, one group is willing to work with police and open some lanes, while the other is very oppositional and refuses to give up any ground. Propensity for violence is possible. Windsor police attempted to tow a vehicle. Drivers exited their vehicles with tire irons and threatened to assault the tow truck drivers. Uh, officers blocked off traffic points leading to the demonstration. Um, and then just scrolling down, Uh, there was a, a, the, you see the concern of the, the police is if they start to allow traffic into the area, the one they've described, there is a potential for many additional supporters to join the demonstration. Does that, is that the tenor of the briefings that you were getting in and around that time? Yep, that's true. That's including the, the, the risk, the actual risk that, that there was a violent act uh, uh, threatened against tow truck operators with protesters using tire irons from there. That, that specific incident was relayed to me directly by the chief, uh, and that happened in the parking lot of the, of the high school. I think you told the commissioner no negotiations um, were successful in any material way to resolve this protest. Not in any lasting way. Right. Were you made aware that the Solicitor General herself wrote a letter to the uh, protesters or proposed to, to negotiate with them and they refused that invitation as well? I only became aware of that in reviewing some of the documents uh, for this commission. Right. I, I wasn't aware at the time. Okay, fair enough. I won't take you to, but Commissioner, just for your reference, that's WPS 1454, a letter from the Solicitor General. Mayor Dilkins, thank you. I don't have any additional questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ottawa Police Service. Good afternoon, Mayor Dilkins. My name is David Michikovsky, and I'm counsel for the Ottawa Police Service. How Good afternoon. <clears throat> the um, protest in Windsor began, or the blockade, I should say, began on February 7th and was cleared on February 13th. Is that correct? That's correct. And geographically, the area where the blockade was, I understand, was a significantly smaller footprint than in Ottawa. Is that fair? From my understanding, that's true. And so the total number of trucks when um, at its highest was, I think you said, 200? I, I would rely on Deputy Chief uh, uh, Crowley for that information. I know the, it, the, the number of protesters ebbed and flowed, and there were 200 at one time. But oh, in terms of the number of trucks, I'd, I'd hate to hazard a guess because the police were tracking that with more precision. Sure. I seem to recall that it was about 100 or so, but we can verify that with um, the Deputy Chief. Um, the um, convoy reached Ottawa um, on January 28th, I believe, and I understand that the city of Windsor learned some important lessons based on what had occurred in Ottawa. Is that fair? That's, that's fair. And that was because it was an unprecedented situation for which neither the city of Windsor nor the Windsor police could be uh, prepared, but um, given what they learned in Ottawa, there were some things that they thought they could adapt. Is that right? It's true that there were lessons learned that they were trying to employ in Windsor that were happening in Ottawa. Sure. And so one of them um, was, and you mentioned it uh, to my friend, Mr. Curry, if we could just pull up um, WIN 400152. At page two, please. There's an email from uh, Andrew uh, at uh, 18, uh, further down, please. 
uh, you'll see um, the uh, Councillor uh, Costante. Co Councillor Costante is a municipal councillor. And um, actually, if you scroll down a little bit further, you'll see the beginning of the, of the chain. Um, and so what I take, and you can scroll through this if you need to, um, what I take from this is the point that you made with Mr. Curry is that it was important that the city be uh, united with the police in terms of their response, correct? Absolutely. And um, that everybody from the city speak with one voice, that the councillors not all be saying different things. That's correct. correct. That's correct. And um, uh, I see from that email chain that, in fact, uh, Councillor Costanti did comply with that request, correct? Yes, that's correct. And the concern was that that was not what had been occurred in Ottawa, correct? That's what Mr. Telezuski put in the email, yes. And I believe um, the OPP also may have uh, talked about the need for everybody to speak with one voice, correct? I believe that's true as well. Um, and um, there's another example. Uh, I'll just uh, call it up. It's WIN four zeros ten ninety one. And so if you scroll down to the bottom of it, um, you'll see that uh, a constituent, if you just scroll, uh, it was a constituent writing to, and if you could scroll up, please, a constituent writing to the councillors and complaining that Windsor police were doing the same as Ottawa and surrendering control uh, to the protesters. And you'll see the response uh, above that um, was really uh, twofold, uh, which was, um, Firstly, council can't direct the police. And the second point was to tell the constituents that they're misinformed when they think that the police are not doing anything, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And it's important for the city to be supporting the police because sometimes the public doesn't see what the police is doing and why they are doing or not doing, taking certain enforcement actions. Is that your understanding? That's, that's true. And another useful lesson you indicated you learned uh, from Ottawa was, was not to publicly announce the number of officers uh, requested. And I believe, as I understand it, had Ottawa not happened first, you might not have realized that. Is that fair? Well, I, I think that may have come out very quickly uh, to the extent that it was mentioned to a member of the media. Uh, the course was corrected very quickly thereafter. Uh, and so... We obviously don't want to, and certainly as the chair of the police board, did not want to do anything that would jeopardize the police operation uh, or tip our hand in terms of what additional resources might be needed specifically. Right, and that was something I think the OPP conveyed to you as a result of lessons learned from Ottawa, is that right? Yes. Um, and another thing I know, um, and we don't need to turn it up unless you want to see it, is I, I think another message that was repeated by the city was for councillors not to go on uh, social media, uh, to be very careful what they put on social media, correct? Correct. And um, the blockade, uh, just finishing off my last point, the blockade, I think we said, began on February 7th. And we know uh, from your evidence this morning that on February 4th, I believe you wrote a text, me you sent a text message to uh, Minister Mendocino. Yes. So a couple of days in advance. And at that time, you were not considering blocking all access to the bridge in advance because no. that would involve many, many access points it, it, it would have been such a dramatic action to take that step in advance of a full blockade that, I, I mean, no one would have understood that. Right. No. And it would require many more resources, obviously, oh. than would be available. Yeah, absolutely true. 
And I guess finally, blocking all access would um, disrupt residents and businesses, obviously. But it could also mean that if you did that, the trucks would spread out over a larger part of Windsor as well. Is that fair? That was a concern, especially as it related to the Windsor-Detroit tunnel. And that would disrupt even more people. Absolutely true. Thank you very much. I have no additional questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ontario Provincial Police. Thank you, Commissioner. This is Janine Kabursi. I'm here for the Ontario Provincial Police, and I have no questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, next are the Ottawa Residents uh, Coalition. Thank you, Commissioner. Christine Johnson for the Ottawa Residents and Businesses Coalition. We also have no questions for this witness. National uh, Police uh, Federation. Uh, this is Lauren Pierce uh, coming in via Zoom. We also have no questions for this witness. Thank you. Okay, City of uh, Windsor. Good afternoon, Commissioner uh, Mayor Dilkins. Good for afternoon. the record, I am Jennifer King, Counsel to the City of Windsor. I only have a few questions remaining for you. Most of my questions have already been asked and answered. Uh, could I ask you to please look at WIN 50992? While this is coming up, uh, Mayor Dilkins, this is a letter from yourself to the Honourable Helena Jacek, Minister responsible for the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario. Do you recognize this letter? Yes, I do. Okay, if you could scroll to the last paragraph on the page. You'll see here you wrote, Windsor Police and their partners in law enforcement have done an exemplary job in quickly clearing the illegal occupation and maintaining the security of Huron Church Road for over 400 million in goods that travel this crossing each day. Unfortunately, the price of that economic security has meant a significant and sustained loss for small and medium-sized businesses who operate along Huron Church Road in Windsor. If you could keep strolling down. And you'll see here that you ask or you urge the minister to show the same level of leadership and support the business community along Huron Church Road uh, as was showed to Ottawa resident, uh, businesses who managed through the pandemic and now must cope with police barricades designed to protect our national economy from those who would seek to disrupt it because they oppose Canada's pandemic related policies. Did you receive a response to this letter and request? Yes, I received a, a phone call from the minister uh, and then the, the gov federal government provided funding and business support for the businesses affected by the blockade. Okay, and just to confirm, was it the federal government or was the Fed Dev program? Uh, I'd have to double check, but through this federal minister, the, the funds flowed to uh, our Invest Windsor Essex organization, who acted as the clearinghouse for uh, businesses affected to, to make application and receive payment. Okay, and they received those funds? Yes. Uh, I just have a question. If you could pull up, please, the clerk, bring up WIN 402240. Well, this is coming up, Mayor Dilkins, it'll take a moment. My friend, Commission Counsel, asked you questions, if you'll recall, about your March letters to Minister Freeland and some others, and then also a second letter to former Solicitor General, uh, General Jones. And what you see here, is this your letter uh, from dated March 17th to Minister Jones, Minister Mendicino, and Minister Blair? Yes. Okay. And if you could just go to the second page, second to last paragraph, please. All right, you'll see here, Mayor, that uh, you wrote that the recent blockade incident at the Ambassador Bridge highlighted a vulnerability in our governance model. Can I just ask you to go slowly when you're reading for okay. the interpreters? Uh... Thank you for the reminder. The City of Windsor is certainly responsible for local infrastructure and the Windsor Police Service is capable of providing adequate and effective law enforcement for our community. That said, the need for broader collaboration and support from provincial and federal governments to bolster the safety and security of our borders appears obvious. Can you tell the commissioner and, and give us some uh, of your thoughts about what role you think each of the three levels of government, federal, provincial, and municipal, should play in protecting the Ambassador Bridge? 
Well, because of the, the construct of the roadways and the infrastructure that exists going back 90 years, uh, it really is imperative that we have uh, you know, a three-pronged approach here. Every level of government has a role to play. The city has to be an equal partner. Uh, and the city respectfully plays a, a disproportionate role in trying to resolve some of these issues, like the issue we're talking about uh, in February, uh, that we need to have these things coordinated in advance, have the conversation worked out in advance so we know who's doing what and who's responsible to fund uh, some of these costs. And so after the fact, trying to, uh, to, to get payment of over $5 million is it's, it's frustrating. Uh, to be honest, but you know we need to have these things worked out. And the response that we provided during the, let's say, the week uh, of the, the primary week of activity, all we did is respond. You know, we responded. We we if, it, if Jersey barriers, someone said they're 1.3 million dollars. How fast can you get them here? Was the answer. We wanted to be as responsive as possible. But you know, from a city perspective, uh, there is a, a disproportionate burden. Uh, and so hosting an international crossing like this uh, presents some opportunities for the city uh, from an economic development perspective, uh, but it also puts a disproportionate burden on the, the residents in the city of Windsor, whether it's noise and air pollution, uh, whether it's you know traffic congestion on municipal roads and having to fund the cost of some of these municipal roads that fund uh, truck traffic to an international crossing. All of these things we really need to sit down and the point of this letter was let's sit down in advance this may happen again it may not happen again but it's probably worth a few hours of discussion to figure out how we're going to do this moving forward so that it is it is you know pull from the shelf and implement as opposed to trying to figure it out in real time thank you those are all my questions thank you any uh, re-examination uh, yes just very briefly uh, Natalia Rodriguez for the Commission. Uh, Mayor Dilkins, uh, my friend for JCCF had asked about an annual marathon, I believe, that takes place that closes the bridge in its entirety. Is that right? That's correct. And um, I just wanted to better understand how the closure of the bridge for that purpose affects the just-in-time delivery that you had um, spoken about in your earlier testimony. I, I would submit that it really has no impact because this event has been happening for decades. Uh, it happens on a Sunday morning, I believe, generally, and the closure is very early in the morning, say seven o'clock, uh, for a defined period of time. Uh, and so runners will, will start the race in Detroit, run across the Ambassador Bridge, run down municipal streets in the city of Windsor, run back through the Windsor-Detroit Tunnel, back to the United States. Uh, and so everything is planned, coordinated, organized, and it's very time limited. Uh, and so it, 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 with respect to uh, local industry, they're able to adjust and adapt for that very time limited period. And is a time limited period more than 24 hours? Oh, no. No, we're talking the matter of maybe two hours. I see. Okay, thank you. That, that does help clarify. Um, and I, I just wanted to also clarify uh, the communications that you had with the Premier and um, Solicitor General Jones over this period of time. Uh, my understanding is that you had one phone call with each of them. Is that correct? Uh, no, I think I had two phone calls. Um, but they, they were all quick. You know, it was just everyone was busy. I was trying to give information, so they had situational awareness pass up the information that I knew was coming, you know, through other channels like the number of officers. And both the, the Premier, I think I've said this, but the Premier, the Solicitor General, Minister Mendicino, the Prime Minister, all extremely receptive, understood the issue, were well briefed, and, and certainly, you know, it was, it was very good communication from my perspective with the two orders of government. And with respect to the Premier specifically, we know you had a discussion with him on February 9, it's in the institutional report. Uh, when would the second phone call have taken place? I can't remember if it was just a text or whether it was a quick phone call in and around the time the injunction was granted. And um, with Solicitor General Jones, uh, my understanding is that there was also one phone call around the 7th or 8th of February to discuss the resource request. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And aside from that, the discussions would have been over text message? I, I I thought there was more than one call uh, with both, 
but I just can't be sure. And it's, it's, it's a function of the volume of what was happening. They were very quick touch points. Uh, and it was just a matter of sharing information very quickly. These were not long phone calls. Uh, it was in an effort for me to share what I knew. And, you know, the Premier was excellent uh, in terms of understanding the impact uh, on the business community. He relayed that to me. Uh, and both of them were great to deal with. Anything else that you can tell us about the content of those discussions other than what you've told us? Nothing else to add. Uh, and I understand you also had a discussion with the Prime Minister on February 10, is that right? That's correct. And uh, did he initiate that call or did you? Uh, I, I, I can't remember who initiated it. I mean, it was set up uh, and I know our federal member had asked and, and you know, there was lots of things going on behind the scenes. Uh, but I was told the Prime Minister is going to call at a certain time on that date. So I, I was by the phone waiting for the phone call. And what can you tell us about the content of that discussion? Uh, the, the, we talked about what was happening on the ground uh, in the city of Windsor. We talked about the battery factory and, and uh, uh, you know, the work that was being done. Uh, and the Prime Minister understood very clearly what the impact was. He knows the city of Windsor. He understood what the impact was with that particular closure as it related to the Ambassador Bridge and the importance of the Ambassador Bridge. Uh, and he was very supportive in, in conversation about trying to find a resolution that got us all past this particular point in time and got things back to normal. And was the Emergencies Act discussed in that call, either by you or by him? No, not at all. The Prime Minister mentioned in that call that, you know, there may be something coming with respect to the United States uh, that would make folks who participated in these types of activities perhaps make them inadmissible to enter the United States. Uh, and I think that was enunciated in the, in the readout of the call. Uh, but no, no discussion, and nor was the Emergencies Act ever mentioned in that call. Okay, thank you. Um, now, uh, with respect to um, my friend from the City of Ottawa, you told her that uh, at some point somebody did indicate to you that the normal uh, order of operations would be to go to the OPP or the province for resources first and then to the RCMP or the federal government. Can you tell us who, who indicated that to you and at what point in time in terms of the, the resource request? It, it came up in a conversation with Minister Mendicino, um, but I didn't, you know, when, when I mean, I, I knew that that was, that was the order of operations. He knew that was the order of operations. So we had a quick discussion about that. And I, I relayed to him that my primary concern was getting the resources here on the ground so the response could be provided. I never felt like the federal government was sitting on their hands and not wanting to act uh, in any way. I always got the sense that they were very receptive and trying to be a partner and trying to solve the situation and to find resources that would be helpful. So there was no sense that uh, RCMP resources could be delayed as a result of having gone to the OPP first, for example? I never felt that way. No one ever enunciated that, and I, I don't believe that to be true. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, finally, um, my friend um, for, I believe, former Chief Slowly, um, spoke to you about the in-camera board meetings that you had. Uh, I just want to, I want to clarify, wh who requested that these meetings be held in camera? Uh, I did. You did? I okay. did. And why was that? Because I anticipated that police would feel more comfortable to share operational details that we would not want to be in the public forum. And I also wanted the board members to feel comfortable to ask any question uh, of the chief or the administration that they felt needed to be asked. And, and so in camera was the best place to do that. And I, I you know, I thought it was right then. And I, I think it's right now. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Okay, well, uh, Mayor Dilgans, thank you very much for your, uh, your testimony. Uh, you're free to go and uh, thank you, sir. very appreciated. Thank you. Okay, next uh, witness. I think you have a procedural uh, matter to deal with first. Yes, uh, Commissioner Eric Brusso, uh, Commission Counsel for the record. Uh, before we call the next witness, I just want to um, formally table the bulk entry list from last week, uh, which some may have noticed was not uh, tabled. Um, the list being entered today was first circulated on October 24th. Uh, we asked parties for their objections by 5 p.m. on November 1st. Commission Council received those objections, removed uh, those doc IDs from the list, and the final list consists of 
uh, 250 documents identified by Commission Council working on the police aspect of the Commission's mandate, uh, as with the prior lists, emails, plans, uh, a number of documents which we did not have time to put to the witnesses. And uh, as well, there were 92 documents identified by Commission Council um, working on the protester aspect of the Commission's mandate, largely documents produced by the, the Convoy Organizers Group, uh, but other Commission documents, OPS, uh, JCF, and a few other parties. So those now will be um, sort of formally tagged and marked as exhibits. And I also just want to speak very briefly about the process for resolving the objections um, which the parties were advised of this morning. Going forward, Commission Council will be using a, a revised template to send out the doc IDs each week. Um, we will continue to give a, a week's sort of notice and opportunity to review the documents. By 5 p.m. the following Monday, uh, we will ask for the parties to put their objections in writing within that Excel spreadsheet. We will, as Commission Council, put them together and uh, then try to deal with them directly with the party who has objected. And if not, Commission Council will embed their, uh, their responses within that sheet. Um, which will then uh, be up to you, Commissioner, to sort of make a, a decision on the admissibility. Uh, the default will be that it will be done in writing, so parties are being encouraged to put their submissions as, uh, as fulsomely as they'd like in that Excel. Um, oral hearings will be sort of exceptional, subject uh, to your discretion. This is the process which we will use starting today for, for this week's bulk entry. Um, and at some point, we will communicate a, a timeline for dealing with all of the objections which have uh, accrued to date. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Um, and now I'd like to call the Commission's next witness, uh, which is Deputy Chief Crowley of the Windsor Pol Police Service. Deputy Chief Crowley, will you swear on a religious document or do you wish to affirm? It's the Bible, please. For the record, please state your full name and spell it out. Jason Crowley, J-A-S-O-N-C-R-O-W-L-E-Y. Do you swear that the evidence <clears throat> to be given by you to this commission shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do so swear. Thank you. Good afternoon, Deputy Chief Crowley. Good afternoon. Um, what, what is your current rank with the uh, Windsor Police Service? I am the Interim Deputy Chief of Operations. Okay. And um, that's not the same rank that you held in January and February, correct? That's correct, sir. I was uh, Superintendent of Investigation Services at the time. Okay. Um, and I'd, I'd ask the clerk to pull up your witness statement, which is WTS uh, 6017. You'll recall uh, sitting for an interview with Commission Council this, uh, this summer? That's correct. Hey, and you reviewed this witness statement um, before it was finalized? Yes. Okay. And do you have any corrections uh, that you'd like to make to it? Uh, there is one uh, small correction on page three. Okay. If we could go to that, please. I think it's near the bottom. Uh, the very last paragraph, it says protesters block the lanes that lead to the Ambassador Bridge. They actually protest, or they actually block the southbound lanes away from the bridge originally. That's the only correction. Okay. Thank you. Everything else uh, remains accurate to your knowledge? Yes. Okay. Um, and I'm also going to ask that the Windsor Police Service uh, Institutional Report be pulled up. That is WPS. Dot IR dot seven zeros one, and you've reviewed this in uh, pre in preparing to attend today. Yes, sir. Okay. 
And uh, does that remain accurate? Uh, I, there are a couple of clarifications, if I could. Uh, absolutely. Um, just You just let uh, Mr. Clerk know which page. Uh, paragraph 23, sir, please. Okay. Uh, more of a clarification, it says the public order units were, were uh, from the OBP and Waterloo service started to arrive on the 9th, I believe. Can you scroll down just a little bit, please? Yes, on the 9th? Yeah. Um, so they did, it was like a slowly through the night, they, they weren't deployed that night. Uh, they were just slowly arriving uh, amongst other uh, agencies as well. But uh, that was just a clarification. They all didn't show up on the 9th. Okay. Uh, the other uh, clarification is uh, paragraph 58. Uh, so, essentially, uh, the public order unit was um, moving southbound down here in church. Uh, this paragraph refers to that. And it talks about uh, the uh, more uh, other a secondary group of officers traveling northbound. If you could scroll down, please. Uh, to the southbound, in the southbound lanes of here in church to move the crowd eastbound onto Tecumseh Road. So that was the eventual movement once they hit Tecumseh Road. That was the movement towards the, on Tecumseh Road towards uh, the east. Um, they just, they, those two roads intersect, as we know. So I just wanted to clarify that. That's all. Okay. Thank you. And that is it. And the, and the rest remains accurate? That's correct. Okay. Um, now, so in your role at the time as Superintendent uh, of Investigation Services, what did that entail? I oversaw the entire division in investigations. So everything from uh, the investigative side of the house uh, which involve, includes major crime and uh, property crime, uh, right over to the support side of the investigations, so the drug unit and, um, you know, IDENT, things like that. So that was my uh, designation at the time. I also was the uh, um, in charge of our critical incident command program, um, and I oversaw that as well. Okay. Uh, and so you're trained as a critical incident commander? Yes, I am. And uh, I understand you were appointed as one of the two critical incident commanders from WPS for this incident. That's correct. Okay. Um, and at the time of the convoys, did uh, WPS have any public order unit trained officers? No, we did not. Okay. How about a uh, police liaison team? No, we did not. Okay. We had critical incident, uh, or sorry, we had uh, uh, critical negotiators, critical incident negotiators, but not uh, PLT. Uh, per se. Okay. Uh, and, and we heard Mayor Dilkins this morning explaining to us a little bit about jurisdiction, but perhaps you can just sort of refresh us and, and help us in terms of what WPS is responsible to police versus um, the RCMP versus the OPP in this sort of Windsor area. Mm -hmm. So the Windsor police uh, would uh, be responsible for municipal policing within the boundaries of Windsor. Uh, there uh, is an OPP uh, presence on the provincial highways that lead into Windsor, which I believe now um, includes the Herb Gray Parkway, which is the extension of 401 to the new bridge. And the RCMP, they do have a, uh, a presence um, that is more, uh, I believe, customs and excise, things like that with when it comes to international um, responsibilities, but nothing as far as municipal policing goes at all. Okay, and so when an incident occurs on the bridge, who responds? The Windsor Police do. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about the, the intelligence leading up to um, the blockade. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand there were a number of slow roll protests that had come through Windsor previously. Is that correct? That's correct. When did those start? They started months before the bridge uh, blockade, months. We, we were dealing with them uh, on a weekly basis uh, all over the city, uh, but the ones uh, pertain to the bridge, uh, really we, we were well, like made aware of them um, that weekend they were going to be uh, ramped up, which would have been the uh, 4th, 5th, and 6th. Okay, so before that, um, there had been slow rolls in the Windsor area, but nothing that targeted the bridge That's specifically? Correct. Okay. Uh, and how long had these slow rolls lasted typically? Um, typically they would be, you know, last two or three hours. 
uh, we would assign a certain um, group of officers to basically monitor it, manage it. Uh, there were never any issues typically. Uh, the, the slow rollers were um, uh, typically they were uh, cooperative and we would work with them prior to the slow roll. We would reach out to them to uh, ensure that they, um, you know, if we, if we could do something for them essentially, uh, as in um, facil facilitate their route or things like that. But we would try and reach out to the organizers to, um, to maintain that uh, communication piece. Okay. Um, now you're familiar with uh, the, the terms Project Hendon and the Hendon reports? Yes, I am. You were receiving those directly from the OPP? Uh, yes, but I did have, I, I was not responsible for monitoring Hendon. Uh, I had an inspector that was responsible, Inspector Carl de Graff, who was uh, on those calls daily, or, or as much as they were happening anyways, uh, and he was responsible for intaking those Hendon reports and updating me on any pertinent information. Okay, did you, uh, did you read them when you received them? No, I read them on Inspector DeGraff's um, recommendation. Okay. Would you have discussed most of the Hendon reports with uh, Inspector DeGraff on a daily basis? Yes, and, and particularly when Windsor was uh, mentioned, but uh, that wasn't very often um, at the very beginning of Hendon. Okay. And um, did you brief uh, Deputy Chief Belair or Chief Mizuno on the reports? Yes, anything I thought they needed to be aware of, uh, I would certainly bring that to their attention. Okay. So I'd like to bring up uh, the Hendon report for January 31st, which is OPP 50819. Uh, and this, if we can go to page three, looking for point 13. This is uh, an like I said, from the 31st. So point 13 says, open source information uh, suggests that truck drivers from the United States plan to block the American side of the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor to coincide with Canadian drivers blocking the bridge in Windsor. The available information does not include a date or time. Uh, so do you recall seeing that at the time? I think I do, yes. Okay. And what, uh, what steps did the Windsor police take to prepare for that possibility? Um, again, these are, this is our best source of intelligence, so uh, we would obviously um, meet and discuss potential blockages, but there was also reports saying that numerous bridges might be blocked. So we would basically just uh, uh, keep that uh, intelligence handy. Uh, I was on the, I still am actually on the uh, Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police Emergency Preparedness Committee. And this is, these are the things that were discussed during almost a daily meeting on those, that committee. Okay. Um, what, would, did, would this information have gone to the OPP from Windsor Police or this is coming to you through the Hendon Report and you're sort of learning of it for the first time? Um, this was being learned about for the first time essentially. Okay. Uh, so there was, if I can take you back to that time, you can imagine uh, Ottawa was, uh, you know, just starting to, um, uh, gained some traction and, and the protesters had just rolled in here. Uh, we were dealing with protests in Toronto as a committee on the weekends at Queen's Park. Um, so that, a lot of the discussion went there and this, this intelligence and this information uh, wasn't really uh, uh, at the forefront at this time in that kind. Um, now a few days later, sort of skipping ahead to February 3rd, I believe you told us this summer that the, the Windsor police learned through monitoring social media that there was uh, a slow roll planned for the coming weekend. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and at that point in time, was there an indication of a blockade on February 3rd? Just what I had previously mentioned about, um, you know, potential bridge or border crossing blockades, but nothing that I recall that was specific to February 3rd. Okay. And, um, I, from what I understand, at that point, perhaps it, it was a little bit more serious and Chief Mizuno actually sort of put you in charge of uh, the Windsor Police Service's response to that intended slow roll. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And what did that response look like? Um, at this point, I, uh, 
uh, I met with our uh, patrol inspectors. Uh, I asked for an operational plan from them uh, regarding the slow rolls. Um, they seem to have more traction and, and, and be a bigger, uh, um, a, a bigger entity than we have been dealing with. So I was asking for a, an operational plan. Um, I also started to include uh, members of uh, the bridge, so C uh, CBSA, the bridge company uh, was their contact, so indirectly they were involved. Um, our intelligence unit, I, uh, I included them quite a bit. So th this is the day that meetings really started about, um, okay, we're going to deal with these slow rolls, but what if? This is where these conversations started. Okay. And what was the plan? I mean, you, you mentioned what if. What was the plan if the slow rolls just blocked the bridge? Well, this was the problem. Um, so I think it's been discussed prior to this about the difference between intelligence and information. Um, intelligence was very, was, was limited in my view at this point, about a confirmation of a blockade or a slow roll that would bear hug the bridge. Uh, to me, it was more information at this point. Um, we still didn't, didn't explain how they would do it, how it would be done, and what we could do to, uh, to stop it. Uh, I think what we really were thinking at the time, this bear hug idea, if, if you can re recall the geography of the bridge, it's essentially the road is a circle around the, the entire bridge property. And they talked about the bear hug, and if that, essentially, if vehicles went around the bridge and stopped, that would essentially shut down the bridge. So that's kind of where we were thinking that might happen. So we tried to put some um, mitigating plans in place there for that. Okay. Uh, and if I could just stop you there for a second, um, because we've talked about slow rolls and how the Windsor Police Service you know, took steps to facilitate those in the weeks leading up to it. Um, I mean, Section 132 of the Highway Traffic Act uh, prohibits unnecessarily slow driving. And so a slow roll, in, in, depending on the speed, would be contrary to the Highway Traffic Act, correct? Correct. And so why was it uh, that the Windsor Police Service was, to use your words, were facilitating those protests? So we were of the mindset amongst other police services in the, in the province, we were trying to find that balance of uh, people's ability and, and, and uh, right under the charter to protest. Uh, we felt it was better to work with um, the protesters to facilitate their slow rolls. It maintained uh, public safety, which is what we were concerned about. Um, and uh, we did not certainly want to escalate any situation. And it was in the model of um, the way slow rolls were being um, policed throughout the province. Uh, if we could pull up OPP 50825, uh, I'm taking you to the Hendon report dated February 4th. Okay. And uh, Mr. Clerk, if we go to page six, there's a section entitled Ontario Open Source Information, Media and Social Media. And so this uh, right there, the second point, um, commercial truck drivers and supporters may conduct slow rolls on roadways near the Ambassador Bridge over the next three days and may attempt to block the bridge on uh, February 7th. I think this is the first time that there's actually a kind of specific date to a potential blockade. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And in light of this information in this hand-in report, uh, what steps were taken to, to prepare? So, not undifferent to um, other slow rolls, we were in communication with the organizer. Very cooperative, worked with the police, supportive of our involvement. Uh, we had no issues with this slow roll group this, for that weekend. Um, but as the weekend progressed, this intelligence became a little bit more um, solid, I would say. Uh, and that's when, um, by the Sunday, which would have been the 6th, we started to gain more information about um, this date being legitimate of, of blocking the bridge. Again, the, the, the problem we ran into was how? How are, we going, how are they going to block the bridge? We had no intelligence. Uh, again, the geography of the bridge is very porous. 
uh, as critical infrastructure in the in the middle of our our west end um, with side streets and access uh, to the bridge uh, exits to the bridge it's it's uh, it's not as easy as a one way in one way out so we were trying to make considerations for numerous plans but nothing was in stone because we didn't know what we didn't know fair enough um i'd like to take you to the the operational plan for dealing with the slow roll now which is uh, wps uh, four zeros one eight eight three although it might actually be five zeros i think uh, wps has used nine digits So I think this is the operational plan that you had asked be put together on February 4th for the slow rolls. You'll be able to tell me if that's correct. Yes, that's correct. That's it. Okay. And if we go down to page two on the situation, um, in the middle of the paragraph, there's further mention of the ongoing protests slash blockade situation at Coots, Alberta, Port of Entry, with intention to mirror this type of activity at in Windsor at the Ambassador Bridge Port of Entry. And if we can go down to the execution on the same page, the fourth point, they will be utilizing this route for three days, uh, and then consider Ambassador Bridge blockade on February 7th, 2022. And so, I, I, I mean, I think there was pretty clear evidence as of the 4th that the 7th was going to be the, the day of a blockade if one was going to occur. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And so, what kind of um, assistance did Windsor Police Service seek at that point? So that weekend um, was very busy reaching out to numerous uh, partners. So locally, it was the Chief of Fire, Windsor Fire and Rescue, Steve Lafayette. Uh, it was also Bruce Crowder from our, our uh, emergency medical uh, EMS. Um, again, I already said we spoke with CBSA. Uh, those kind of plans started uh, logistically again what if this happens what do we need to do to help our our partners we believed right from this, this point it was a police response uh, so we certainly were trying to help out uh, our partners uh, as best we can to plan for them as well as us and i understand um, that uh, chief mizuno spoke with commissioner creek of the opp on february 4th as well yes that's correct do you know, I, I, don't, I don't think you were on that call, but uh, did Chief Mizuno relate to you what was discussed? Uh, I think in the email, there was, there was some discussion about, um, I was not on that call, sorry to clarify that. Uh, there was some discussion about getting some local assistance from the OPP from uh, the two detachments within our area uh, some, for some help. Uh, also, uh, uh, sending some uh, public liaison officers, the PLT, down to Windsor to assist us uh, on Monday. Uh, those were the discussions uh, of potentially maybe having 35 officers or so come and help us. Uh, and at that point, it was strictly to uh, for for um, traffic control, intersection control, that kind of thing, to set up a perimeter that we felt was manageable. Okay. Uh, so on the 4th, the intention was to be setting up a perimeter to try to prevent the blockade? Yes, essentially. Like so, uh, to, to prevent the blockade, to manage a slow roll, all these things that uh, again we didn't have specifics where we could plan a specific response to a specific action by uh, by protesters. But certainly, we uh, we were trying to do um, a very general response to be able to react to something that, that would possibly happen. Okay, I take it you didn't have. Uh a time on the 7th. You didn't know anything more than something might materialize on the 7th. Yes, the information I had was that um, the bridge would be blocked if they didn't get what they want, meaning um, relief of vaccine mandates, things like that. That was the only information information I had about Monday. Uh, I'd like to take you to, I think, probably one of the emails you just mentioned, which is WPS 501880. This is an email exchange between yourself and someone named Dwight Tibb of the OPP. Who is Dwight Tibb? Dwight Tibb is the chief superintendent of the region. So as a result of Chief Mizuno's conversation with the commissioner, um, I spoke to uh, Dwight, who you can see here that she, or that he, uh, he put me in touch with Dana Early, who is a superintendent of the region, one of the superintendents for the OPP. 
basically saying, um, if you need something, uh, please don't hesitate. Uh, and uh, uh, he's super, he CC'd Superintendent Dana Early, uh, who oversees their emergency response team. And he says in this email, as discussed, you can continue to liaise with our Essex Detachment Command team. Yes. Um, should intel be received or action by demonstrators taken to shut down the bridge, don't hesitate to reach out. So, yes. That original discussion with the Essex Detachment Command team was um, more of an information sharing session at that point, and um, they were going to monitor the 401 for us, but uh, exactly what... Uh, what the intention there was to continue dis discussing with them. Okay. And at this point, I guess what I'm trying to understand, even on the 4th, there is a, a threat of a blockade on the 7th. And th the response uh, is at the local OPP detachment level, nothing that kind of was escalated above that from a resource perspective. That's correct. That's right. I would call those like informal requests. And uh, I think you mentioned earlier that there were 35 officers dispatched as part of that? Approximately, yes. And those would have all come from the Essex detachment? Essex and Lakeshore and, and anywhere that might be close to those. Okay. I'm assuming. I, don't, I can't say for sure, but I would assume. And your, um, your summary of, of our interview this summer mentions that uh, you spoke with a CBSA officer and RCMP officer uh, border integrity officer on that day as well. What can you tell us about that? That's correct. So my first call was to um, um, a chief superintendent, RCMP officer uh, in London, who put me in touch with uh, Kevin McGonagall, who is a border integrity officer. I believe he's also out of London, but he was the closest um, contact for, for me as far as the RCMP goes, as, as the border, uh, it pertains to the border. So I spoke with Kevin and um, basically said, you know, they, their resources were stretched in because of other uh, potential threats to other borders uh, in the province, but uh, certainly they had people on call and that they would uh, assist as needed or, or as could be. Neither of them were, uh, neither the CBSA nor the RCMP were taking steps to prepare for it, like the blockade? Uh, not at that time. Um, in speaking with CBSA, I asked them if they had an operational plan, I believe on the Friday the 4th, and they didn't. Uh, they were referencing Coots as well because uh, the Coots blockade was not on the border property. It was down the road similar to ours. So they were, um, they were just trying to work with us uh, in a response and help us in any way they can. Okay. Um I'd like to take you to another Hendon report dated February 6th. That's uh, OPP 401622. And on page six, um, there's again a reference to the uh, possible attempt to block the Ambassador Bridge. Um, so this is we're now February 6th is the, the Sunday. What steps were being taken that weekend to prepare the 5th, the 6th um, as the, the information still says, yep, yeah, Monday, there's likely to be a blockade. Mm -hmm. So, and again, we didn't know, we didn't know uh, with, with the, the, the geography that presents itself to us, uh, the bridge, it is very difficult to, to uh, plan something solid that we don't know what's going to happen or how it's going to happen, I should say. We did discuss, um, as was suggested earlier, about, you know, potentially rerouting traffic off 401, closing the 401, which just was not an option coming into the city. Um, so there, there was all kinds of discussions on how we might be able to do it. Um, but essentially we thought if we could control that intersection around the bridge, that again, we were in the mindset of this bear hug. If we control the intersection, uh, limited vehicle traffic through it, uh, we would be able to uh, essentially control access to the bridge okay and we'll um we'll talk about that in a moment okay uh but th th that evening of the sixth there was a slow roll protest at micmac park correct yes and what happened there uh that was the first uh, noticeable difference in any of the slow rolls that we'd had uh, there was a little bit more aggression by the uh protesters at micmac park there was uh, a, a fair number of them 
And uh, that was the first time that like officers had to actually disengage some of the protesters because of the um, aggression that they showed. Disengage uh, from the protesters? Yes. Okay. Again, we're trying not to escalate things. Uh, we're trying to plan, you know, knowing what hap is going on in Ottawa at the time and in Coots, we're trying not to escalate anything and work with, uh, as all the previous other, uh, the previous uh, slow rolls, we're trying to work with the protesters. Um, and also at this time, we are also planning for uh, information we had received was for the next morning, uh, a, a potential gathering at a Comber rest stop, which is about 25 minutes outside of Windsor off the 401, there's a truck stop. And we were uh, potentially uh, planning for this gathering. So we had uh, planned for our surveillance team to go out, uh, as well as the OPP. They were going to be there and try and engage the truckers to see what their, their plan was and their intentions were uh, that morning. Okay. Um, you mentioned by this point you had seen what was going on in Ottawa. So if you can just pause there briefly and tell us what, up to the 6th, uh, what what lessons the Windsor Police Service had taken away from what had been going on in Ottawa for uh, 10 days by then? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, uh, like, to be honest, at this point, we were so um, uh, involved in our in our planning and, and what we've been doing. I can't say that uh, there was a, a, you know, a lot of takeaways at this point from Ottawa, but certainly we knew about um, private property, uh, uh, engaging our, our, our partners and our, our, our business owners at this point about uh, who is willing to have protesters on their property near their bridge so we didn't have to waste uh, any kind of valuable time in the, in the moment. Um, again, dealing with uh, protest leadership was a, was a big one and also um, we, we knew uh, a, a strong command team had to be set up. Okay, and those are all you're saying those were all lessons that you had uh, taken away from what had been going on for 10 days. Yes, so it, it, part of it was because of um, this emergency planning committee that I sit on. A lot of the uh, other police leaders were in Ottawa, um, you know, um, could see the, some of the issues they were going through uh, as it went to planning and things like that. So I, I realized that this was a, a large piece of what we needed to, to accomplish. I'd like to pull up WPS, uh, I think it's 560-221. These are some emails early in the morning between um, Deputy Chief Belair and Chief Mizuno. I want to ask you about them. Okay. We're still on the, on the 7th. Uh, Chief Mizuno emails Deputy Chief Belair. If we know uh, when they are coming and where from, any thought to stopping the convoy and negotiating some terms before they reach the bridge? It sounds like they want the transports to lead the convoy with everyone following, so there may be an opportunity to try to control it. And then Deputy Chief Blair says, yes, talking to JC about that exact thing. I assume JC is, is it's me. Yes. So what can you tell us about these attempts at negotiation the morning that the convoy is descending upon uh, Windsor? So this was one of the major um, uh, differences from Ottawa. Again, we assumed a lot, seeing what we had seen here. Um, this is not, um, so at Comber that morning, there was some trucks, which there always are gonna be trucks at the truck stop, but there was more pedestrian cars than we expected. Uh, we had information again that there was convoys sitting in concession roads off the 401, hiding, waiting to 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 uh, join the the, the trip down the 401, which never materialized, uh, but it was something we thought, okay, this, that's the inf information, that's, what, that's what's happening. Um, but the, the main difference was it wasn't all semis. It was a lot of pedestrian vehicles, pickup trucks with flags. Uh, and at this point, when, when we were there, we don't know who a pr protester is uh, at that point, other than you know, people with flags, for instance. Uh, so it was very difficult to even determine who is a protester and who is just driving down the 401, essentially. So stopping a convoy uh, just wasn't as easy as it sounded. Okay. And I understand that ultimately there were sort of multiple groups of protesters that set up in Windsor. Was that a 
apparent at this stage in the morning of uh, February 7th? Um, I wouldn't say it was as obvious as it became. Uh, at this point, uh, like I said, we had very good relationship with the organizer of the slow rolls. Um, and that was the first, that Sunday group was that first different group that we said, okay, there's a different leadership faction here. Uh, and in fact, the, the original slow roll organizer um, actually uh, pleaded with the other group not to block the bridge. So he, we had to develop that relationship with him to, on our behalf, try and plead with him not to do it. So that's the first, but it wasn't as obvious down, down the road. And did that, that original slow roll organizer ultimately participate in the blockade of the bridge? I don't believe he did. I, I just can't say for sure, but I don't believe he did. Okay. Uh, I'd like to go to WPS uh, 60266. These are emails between yourself, and somebody uh, at the RCMP. Go down. Kevin McGonigal, I think, is the, the name that you yes. gave us before. So he is writing to you again the morning of the 7th, wanted to check in to see how things are going in Windsor this morning. As you are aware, we are being requested to support Ottawa with the situation there. We will have to balance operational response in all of our border points, especially Windsor, Sarnia, Erie, et cetera. Evaluating what is going on in those locations will assist with our decisions. So I guess my first question is what sort of pre February 7th assistance was the RCMP making available or had they made available to the Windsor Police Service? At that point, it was just a connection that was made uh, with Kevin and offering, if there's anything they could do, let them know. It was more of an intelligence thing, I think, at that point. It, we, we didn't really uh, utilize uh, Kevin McGonagall's services at this point. And there's sort of a reference needing to balance operational response. Now, I'm just talking about the convoy protests in general. Did that, did that play out in the sense of did you see an, uh, an inability or a reticence, or were you told we can only send you X number of officers because we've got a police, a whole bunch of different protests? Mm -hmm. The police resources were spread very thin throughout the province. Uh, it was very clear to me, uh, being as a part of, uh, of the emergency planning committee, it was quite clear that resources were in high demand. Um, so yes, I, I saw that quite clearly. I, I think uh, you told us this summer, and it's in your statement, that you attended a meeting of the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police uh, Committee that, that day on the 7th, and you were told effectively the same thing. There's, there's a limit to the number of resources that we have for Windsor. That's correct. And how about when it came to the OPP at this stage on the 7th, were you being told the same thing? There's, you know, we can only give you X number of uh, officers, vehicles? Uh, yes, at this point, uh, the bridge had not been blocked. So we were, um, you know, we were okay with uh, just having boots on the ground, providing traffic, uh, you know, um, resources at that point. Uh, but I had sent uh, Dana Early an email, I believe the night before, or maybe, maybe this on the 7th, asking, hey, if things go a bit sideways here, how available are, is, is any POU resources? Um, so that was really my first, again, informal ask, just to, to get a, an understanding, if we need to look that way, what, what does it look like for you? And what was the response? Um, I know I'd have to see the email exactly what the response was, but uh, at this point, Dana was uh, working with us uh, from London still, uh, basically trying to put resources together. I think the response essentially was, uh, if you need something, uh, we're going to supply it for you. Okay. And I think I've got the email. You'll tell me if I'm wrong. If we could pull up WPS uh, 60374. This is an email from February 8th. This may not be the one that you're looking for, but reach out to Superintendent Early and say, hi, Dana, I received direction from Aurelia to contact you if our blockade occurred uh, and began to get to a point where extra resources may be required. It's relatively manageable. I know your people are very spread out, but 
I ask at this point is if we were to need POU or PLT down here, what would availability be? This is the email? This is this correct, yep. And again, what I, I don't know that we have uh, her response, not in this thread, but what was the response in terms of availability? Uh, again, I think it was, uh, you, if you know, let us know what you need and we will try and make arrangements, essentially. And what kind of coordination occurred with the CBSA at this point, once the, the blockade started? Um, so at, at the very beginning of it, we were managing the, uh, the blockade from our Windsor Police Headquarters in a project room. Uh, to later in the day, we moved to the EOC, EOC and stood it up. At that point uh, is when I expanded the command team and invited CBSA to be a part of the command team. So they supplied uh, personnel at that point to be that direct link uh, with, with us to CBSA. And uh, they were providing intelligence and any information they had uh, along with the resource at that point. Which other organizations were part of the command team? At this point, uh, I would say CBSA was the only external partner that was in the EOC with us. Uh, we had um, expanded our uh, internal resources to include major crime at this point. Um, we expanded uh, to include more intelligence officers, uh, along with the sergeant that was already in the command team, um, and uh, some more uh, resources for logistics because we, it was growing. We needed, we needed some help. Okay. Uh, if we could pull up WPS 60235. This is an email uh, with Glenn Miller of the OPP about the availability of the OPP's PLT for Windsor, uh, to Windsor Police. Go down to the email at, yeah, there, sorry. Uh, as the last paragraph, as we speak, Brad is reaching out to Sergeant Mike Acton, PLT, if he could have his resources immediately deployed to Comber, as it's anticipated those in attendance will be leaving at uh, 10 hundred hours. So were the OPP PLT able to reach the, uh, the protesters before they set up the blockade? Um, you know, that's a really good question. I don't recall if they did or not. I had never heard of PLT till this weekend, okay. uh, unbelievably. Uh, and um, I don't recall if they made it or if it was just regular OPP officers um, discussing uh, intentions with the Comber people. Ultimately, there were OPP PLT deployed to Windsor. Yes. And I think you told us this summer that they had some success. Yes, that's correct. Can you expand upon that or elaborate on that? Uh, so in those first few days when uh, we, we were really relying on just essentially, you know, mostly Windsor Police resources, uh, we had some difficulty in negotiating ourselves with, with all the protesters. Again, we talked about the fractured leadership and different groups. Um, the PLT, how it was explained to me through local OPP resources where, you know, they have relationships with a lot of people through different protests across the province. They, that's their, essentially that's their role uh, to maintain these relationships. And uh, because of that, trust is built and they are able to, um, you know, um, basically fulfill their mandate um, with the negotiations with, with um, any kind of demonstration. In this case, uh, they were able to, and, and again, it was so dynamic over the first four or five days with lanes closing, lanes opening. I can't tell you times or days, but there was numerous times where lanes were open and closed, but essentially it was PLT doing that for us. Uh, they had also brought in um, a couple of minor tactics with printed pieces of paper for officers in their notebook for common messaging, um, handouts for the, for the protesters. So it was all about education and communication with them and they did a fantastic job. Do you know why uh, when they succeeded in opening a lane or a couple of lanes, those lanes would then subsequently reclose or be blockaded again? Yes, so um, we had the, um, we were monitoring many open source uh, sources for intelligence. Uh, we actually uh, heard a lot of the conversation from the protesters about their, their conversations about the police on a Zello app. And um, so that was part of it. We, we could hear 
the infighting. So somebody would negotiate a lane open and someone else would step up and say, no way we're giving, not giving this to the police and their people would come and clog, clog it up. And, and then we would hear that right on ground as well. So it was quite obvious that the leadership was not, uh, there's no solidarity there for sure. Uh, now I wanna move ahead to the evening of February 7th and there's an event that happens on the property of Assumption High School. That's correct. Can you describe that for us? Um, so if I could just back up uh, uh, to the Monday, one of my first questions was, uh, again, when it comes down to lessons from Ottawa, uh, knowing that uh, the tow truck companies did not want to participate with the Ottawa police or, or help them, uh, that was one of my first questions. Are, we have a contract with a company in Windsor, uh, and my, uh, to Inspector Crosby, I remember asking her, are they on board? And she said she already asked, asked that question, and they were. So that was good news to us. Um, and that first night, um, again, the, we were trying to keep protesters off of uh, private property. And Assumption High School is, as the mayor said, right in uh, the protest area on here in church between Tecumseh and College. Uh, we started seeing protest vehicles go into the school property parking lot and we went over there to discuss with them to, you know, you're not welcome here. We've already talked to the board. You're not welcome. It's time to go. And we kind of gave them an ultimatum saying, listen, you have 10, 15 minutes to move. We're going to tow you. So we held the tow trucks uh, back out of sight as best we could. Uh, again, not wanting to escalate things, um, you know, uh, and somebody spotted one of the tow trucks and uh, we had some um, altercations or sorry, not altercations, um, some uh, of the protesters came out of their cars with tire irons and we were at times uh, not only on this occasion but almost outnumbered and getting swarmed a little bit and again having our officers have to um, disengage to not escalate so uh, then they ended up moving after some negotiation but that was the assumption high school uh, incident okay and uh, just Jumping ahead a bunch in the story, but you mentioned wanting to keep protesters off private property as, uh, as something that you had learned from the experience in Ottawa. Yes. And once the, the blockade was cleared, my understanding is there was a decision made within the Windsor Police Service not to set up an alternative protest site on, on private property or sort of away from Huron Church Road, and that that was also a sort of lesson drawn from Ottawa. That's correct. So can you tell us um, what, what that lesson is and why that decision was made? Um, so under the Trespass to Property Act, uh, we cannot remove someone from private property without, uh, we, we, we act as an agent for the owner. If they are not, uh, if they're willing to have someone go to their property uh, and not be removed, then the police are, uh, have no authority there to remove them. So we did not want to give uh, any kind of you know, spot for the protesters to, to basically uh, congregate. Um, essentially right there at Tecumseh Road, we have very large parking lots. There's a grocery store and, and numerous, it's a strip mall essentially. So it's a very big parking lot. So that could have really led to some, some um, you know, another protest area essentially. Uh, plus we had smaller businesses, uh, the cab company, all these places that we just did not want to interfere with business any more than we already had and um, keep things under control. Okay, so there was no, um, there was no option to continue protesting in the way that had been the case uh, once the, the blockade was cleared. That's correct. Sort of going back in time to the establishment of the blockade, can you tell us how that unfolded the evening of the 7th? So uh, we had carried through with the plan that we had talked about with trying to control the intersection of college and here in church, which is the first intersection south of the entrance to the bridge. And what we did, we uh, established control of it with um, traffic officers, our traffic enforcement officers, by basically just letting two or three cars go at a time. And if they went on the bridge and crossed, then we let another two or three. So that's how we controlled it for quite a while, actually. Same with coming off the bridge. Um, we would try and do that best we can, we could. Uh, and then um, I think doing that for some time, it was frustrating the 
uh, protesters. Again, we're, we're listening to open source media and they were getting frustrated with us. Uh, so I think the comment was one of them basically said, I wonder what happens if I just stop my truck right here in the southbound lanes. And that's what happened. <laughs> Uh, that truck stopped, uh, a pickup truck stopped, I would say two, 300 meters south of college. Another one stopped and another one stopped. And next thing you know, all three lanes were blocked and that's how it started. So from there, uh, the traffic started to block up or clog up very quickly. And within probably 20 minutes, there was a, a line of semi trucks that were just regular commuters uh, for industry. Uh, creating a line of trucks miles into Detroit and Michigan. So it, that's how it started. And I understand early in the blockade, a number of trucks sort of stranded on the bridge. Is that right? How were they? How were they cleared? How and why? So the why would be, uh, you know, people were stuck on this bridge for hours. The, the bridge is almost 100 years old. So we were worried about structural integrity of the bridge. Uh, we were worried about commerce. We were worried about people having no, um, you know, food, water, uh, you know, uh, washrooms uh, being up on the bridge. We had, we wanted to get that bridge cleared off. Um, so the, the how was very difficult. So again, the, the geography of the bridge, there's one main entrance that comes out onto Huron Church Road, which is southbound. There's a secondary entrance or exit, sorry, I said entrance the first time I meant exit. There's a secondary exit that turns to the west and goes up a small road, a part of Huron Church beside the bridge towards Wyandotte. And then the, the only other access to the bridge is uh, off of Wyandotte Street. It's an entrance. So at that point, again, very dynamic. There was blockages at all three at times. So we were some, at points we were using an entrance on the north side of the bridge for exiting. We were trying to get out that secondary exit, which was impossible because cars and trucks had clogged that small section of, of Huron Church just west of the bridge almost instantly. Um, there was a decision made at one point um, by myself to allow trucks access to college westbound, which I didn't want to do because that was our, our emergency route for fire because they their their fire station is just east of Huron Church. And if protesters clogged college, we were in a bad way. Uh, but there was no, there was just no uh, other decision to make at that point. We literally had to do what we could to clear that bridge. So, and again, with negotiations through all that to allow us to essentially, you know, open this part, open that part uh, to eventually clear the bridge. And I think the bridge was cleared of traffic by about 1020 at night. So they were up there a while. I want to pull up WPS 60356. This is an email from February 7th, uh, and it's regarding the Ambassador Bridge Corporation and the president of the corporation. So you're not, you're not on it, um, but Gary Williams sent an email to, uh, looks like, M. M. Murphy, I don't know if you know who that is. Mark Murphy's an inspector of patrol. Um, and it's essentially relaying a conversation that uh, Gary Williams has had with the president of the Ambassador Bridge Corp. And Mark says, I will forward to DeGraff and Crowley to deal with. Thanks for the heads up. So first of all, did you um, get that email and sort of deal with it? I don't know if I got this email, um, but I definitely got a message either directly from Murphy or from our communication center, our 911 center that this call was coming into them as well. Uh, the bridge company was not happy with us. I think they thought we were blocking the bridge um, and we were just trying to tell them we are doing the best we can. And, and my question to them was, have you stopped letting trucks on the bridge? Uh, because that just wouldn't help us to continue to let trucks on the bridge. So at some point uh, they started routing traffic to the Blue Water Bridge, which at this point they had no issues there. Do you know why they thought uh, Windsor Police was blocking the bridge? I don't have a clue. And how uh, was this your only sort of com contact with the company, or did did the Ambassador Bridge Corporation you know, weigh in or, or sort of get in touch with the Windsor Police 
throughout that week? Yeah, I can't say I, I didn't have any more conversation or contact with the bridge company at that point. That was my only, my only contact with them. Okay. Do you know if anyone, uh, do you know if Chief Mizuno or Deputy Chief Belair did? No, I don't. No. And how about just, again, generally speaking, um, other interests, unions, uh, there was some evidence this morning about Stellantis, this, this new uh, EV battery manufacturer, I think. But what was the sort of economic pressure like from the businesses in Windsor? Um, so being in the AOC, uh, I mean, we were approximately 10 kilometers away from the bridge. So it, like I was getting reports, but to be all, all honesty, the pressure that we felt just knowing the impact of, of what was going on in the EOC was, was enormous pressure. We, we felt that we, we wanted to do more, but we, we were so uh, handcuffed at this point with what was going on. Uh, but certainly, um, um, you know, just reports in, in mainstream media and, and the economic uh, um, impacts, we knew it was, was humongous. It was just giant. So, so is it fair to say, I mean, you were aware from reading the news that this was having an impact, but you weren't personally aware of pressure being exerted on the Windsor Police Service to... No, that was them. not in my, in my um, realm at that point. But growing up in Windsor, I grew up my whole life. I understand the, the, the uh, essence of, of what, the, how important that bridge is to our, our community and, and our country, to be honest. So uh, it's just not lost on me, the, the impact that that would have. Okay. Uh, I'd like to go to WPS 606... Oh nine. So move ahead to Wednesday, February 9th. This is an email from you to Jen Crosby and uh, Inspector DeGraff saying, I was asked by Jay to put something together, together to present to the OPP for a request for 100 officers to assist and include how, why, uh, what, etc. Further down that paragraph, the 100 officer request does not include POU. And so the attachment, which is uh, the next number, 610. I assume when you say I was asked by Jay, that's um, Deputy Chief Belair? Uh, no, I think that was me. Sorry, I think you were writing that. If we can just pull that back oh, up. Oh, sorry, it was I? You were writing that email. You sent that email. Okay, sorry, then I that believe. would be Deputy Chief Belair at the time, yes. And so you, you're the one who spearheaded kind of putting together, okay, here's the numbers we're going to request and here's how they're going to be used. Is that right? Yes. Uh, the background of that uh, actually was before the, sorry, that was on the 9th. Bef before that, I had uh, received a call on the 8th uh, at about 6.30 in the morning from Superintendent Mike McDonnell uh, from the OPP, who I was a colleague with on the Emergency Preparedness Committee. And he uh, obviously had seen on the news what was going on, and he asked me uh, what we needed. And I uh, just told him we need some bodies. Um, so his, his ask to me was, uh, and this was over time, this was not on that first conversation, he said he would talk to the commissioner. But again, informal request here, right? This is a superintendent asking another superintendent. Uh, it's an informal request. Um, he, so within time, he gets back to me and says, I, I need a plan. Uh, of what you're going to do with 100 officers. And I understood that uh, just to ask for 100 officers. So I put together a very generic plan, uh, considering there was two you know, 24 hour coverage, two 12 hour shifts essentially. Um, and we are also policing a very busy city uh, with our own resources and resources for the bridge. So that was really my ask. And, and I put together this uh, very generic plan for them. Okay. And just so I, I want to make sure I understood correctly, it was uh, McDonnell who suggested the 100 officer figure to you? No, he, he asked me what we needed. And, you know, just, just literally doing the quick math kind of right there, I said, I could probably use 100 officers. And he asked me for a plan. Well, I need to know what you need 100 officers for. I said, no problem. Okay. And so this document that we're looking at on the screen is, was the plan for how you're going to use the 100 officers? Yeah, I think so. Yep. If we could just scroll down. Just so you see all of it. Yeah, I would that. say it is. Yep. And it, this is being put together with not knowing anything about the OPP's collective agreement, what shifts they work, what you know. I came to find out over find out over time how this is very normal for them, and they all expect deployments like this, 
and you know th this is very normal so but this is at a time where i you know i'm trying not to step on another organization's collective bargaining agreement um and to, to try and you know satisfy our needs as well so we saw in the covering email that this doesn't include pou units why would you have left those out of this request um i think this was still fairly early in the in sense of this conversation happened essentially less than 24 hours after the bridge was blocked. Um, so again, our, our plan at the time was to negotiate. Uh, we had set up a perimeter and to negotiate with them. And at the time, uh, this is, we, we thought hopefully we could get there at the end of it through negotiation. Um, again, not trying to escalate anything, say, but that's why, you know, my, my background told me three days before to ask Dana, Hey, if it goes this way, uh, what are we looking at? But but that was not in the plan yet. I, and again, knowing what was going on here and in Toronto. So. And so this um, exchange is between, this, this arises as a result of your discussion with Superintendent McDonnell, uh, but you're aware on the same day, Chief Mizuno sent letters to uh, Minister Jones, the Solicitor General in Ontario, and to Bill Blair, Minister Blair, correct? I was not aware of that at that time. Okay. I, I, in preparing for this, I found that out, and I'm assuming that that ask was the formal ask because of this. But I, I can't confirm that. I don't know. So, and again, just so we understand, on February 9th, uh, Chief Mizuno did not consult you or make you aware that she was writing to those two politicians asking for 100 uh, officers. I don't recall that she did, no. Now, if we could pull up um, WPS 60827. And so apart from seeing the letters, do you remember any discussion with Chief Mizuno or Deputy Chief Belair at the time about those that correspondence to, uh, to Sylvia Jones or Bill Blair? No, I don't recall that at all. I, there, I was sending situation reports to them regularly, um, and there, there may have been conversations back and forth, but I don't recall them, to be honest. So I'm showing you an email, and again, you're not on this email, um, but it's, it's an email in which Commissioner Creek of the OPP is writing to Commissioner Lucky of the RCMP, and it's subsequent to Chief Mizuno's uh, emails and letters to the ministers. It says, Chief Pam Mizuno and I had an opportunity to discuss the attached correspondence. Uh, currently, Windsor Police does not require the deployment of additional police officers from the OPP or the RCMP. And so I, what I'm trying to understand is, do you know why the about face? I mean, that morning, Chief Mizuno had said, we need 100 officers, sent the letters directly to the ministers. And then that evening, it's uh, according to Commissioner Creek's email, it's everything's fine. Yeah, I can't explain this. I did not know about this when it happened. I mean, if you look at the time, it's 1120 at night on the 9th. Um, I, I was working straight midnights at that point. Um, and if I would have known this at the time, I, you know, I, I understand there was mass confusion to a situation that we've never dealt with. Uh, so I can't explain this email. I, I did not know about it at the time. Okay. And we heard this morning uh, from Mayor Dilkins that there might have been some, some issue or confusion over going to the OPP and the RCMP and that the proper channel is to go to the OPP first. Was that something that you were made aware of around this time? Um, no, but the, the um, Police Services Act of Ontario is quite clear that if we can't provide our own, for instance, in this case, public order unit, um, we need to go to the OPP. Uh, and uh, our directive, our policy says that as well. So, Thank you, Deputy Chief. Um, Commissioner, as I believe you know, I, I, the balance of the examination will be completed by my colleague, Guillaume. Um, I don't, uh, we're sort of 15 minutes prior to the break. I don't know if you'd like uh, Guillaume to start now or take the break early. This might be a good time to take the break then uh, if you're going to change council then. Uh, so we'll take uh, the afternoon break for 15 minutes. Thank you, Deputy Chief. The Commission is in recess for 15 minutes. La Commission est pour 15 minutes.
Order à l'ordre. The Commission has reconvened. The Commission of Law. Good afternoon. I'm Guillaume Serrois, Commission Counsel. Um, I, I will be leading you um, from the events of February 10th. Um, on, in the morning of February 10th, this is when Superintendent Dana Early from the OPP arrived in Windsor. That's correct. Um, I would like to pull up WTS.00000022. While it's being pulled up, I'll, I'll just summarize what's mentioned. That's Dana Early's witness summary at page three, um, second paragraph at the top. She mentions that um, upon arriving in Windsor, Dana, uh, Superintendent Early, engaged in discussions with um, the Windsor Police Command Team, including Deputy Chief Belair, and that during those discussions, the Deputy Chief Belair told her that WPS welcome OPP's assistance, understood that OPP had more experience policing blockades and, uh, and protests than WPS, and understood that all operational decisions needed to come through superintendent early. Is that where you present during these discussions? I was not uh, present during these sessions. I was uh, working midnights at this point. Uh, Carl de Graff was uh, the, in our, our critical incident commander on days. But I was not present during this. No. And were you informed about the content of these discussions afterwards, or? Uh, n no, I mean, so Dana uh, Early came with an, uh, numerous resources. Um, it was clear that the Windsor Police, to all of our admission, had no experience in public order. So it was my understanding right from the beginning that Dana. Uh, and her team was, was in charge of the public order um, response, uh, as well as uh, numerous OPP resources. So that would just, uh, my, my, my um, it, uh, understanding was we would be forming a, a unified command team. And was this understood prior to Superintendent Early's arrival or once she arrived? Uh, I would say before she arrived, that, that was the intention. Uh, we did not have that experience, and uh, we were uh, asking for help, essentially. So it was, just, just to make sure I understand correctly, it was OPP, um, sorry, WPS command's position that OPP should take over the, the, the event in Windsor. No, that's, that was not my understanding. I was never told that. Uh, my understanding was unified command. Okay. Uh, which, again, so in my... My experience, uh, it, before I was a critical incident commander and as a critical incident commander, when you have multi-jurisdictional um, command and unified command in that multi-jurisdictional command, there are times to step forward as a critical incident commander and there are times to step back. And that's what unified command is. Um, we learned through this process that uh, Superintendent Earley's command was... Uh, she was in command of public order response, was in command of OPP resources. Uh, those were the times she stepped forward. Then there was operational times when the Windsor police would step forward, be it myself or Inspector Carl de Graff. So, so you would say that OPP was in charge of the POU response and PLT perhaps, and WPS maintained control of the overall operation? It was, again, this unified command. I, I can't say anyone was in charge of the overall operation. Unified command, uh, there is um, uh, consultation that goes on. Um, like, for instance, even the POU plan, where Superintendent Early was clearly in charge of the POU plan, uh, she consulted us on it after that it was done. She would consult us. Any, any issues, any logistical issues, any Windsor issues. Uh, so that's, that is the true meaning of that unified command. So... Uh, this, uh, I, I was not part of those discussions, so that was not my understanding. Okay. Um, so, in the same paragraph, we see that um, that superintendent early later called Craig Abrams and informed him that Windsor has told us 
being us being OPP, this is now ours. Um, and superintendent earlier under, explained that she meant that OPP was in charge and that WPS we, will be working alongside OPP. That's not your understanding of how it took place? Well, I, I, I agree with the working alongside. Yes, that's 100% uh, I agree with that. Uh, I, I don't know um, about uh, this. I, I was never informed of this. Um, I would say that, uh, yes, we worked alongside each other. And again, that, that um, concept of stepping forward and stepping back in, in uh, unified command was present right from the immediate um, arrival of, of Superintendent earlier in her, in her team. Uh, at, and uh, I would also say that Windsor Police was always the police of jurisdiction. We never were not the police of jurisdiction through this, uh, this event. Um, I think um, we, we can come back to, to the witness summary later on, but I, I would like to pull up WPS 00702 at page 27. Because I, I, I think I just want to understand um, who was taking decisions and who was giving advice and so on in, in the comment structure. Um, because I understand that the idea of coming forward and giving some space to the other command, but I, I just want to make sure I understand properly how this works in practice. Okay. Um, in that, this is a document that, the debrief, do, do you recognize this? Yes, I do. This is something that you prepared? It's not my document, no. Okay, but it was prepared after the Freedom Convoy events to make a debrief of the events and have recommendations moving forward. That's correct. And if we can go at page um, 27, please. Um, <clears throat> on the right table, it's the, it's point four. Uh, it says uh, C, uh, under CIC takeaway, CIC understand is critical incident command. Um, we see at point four, needed WPS to be more engaged with collaborating on operational plans. We WPS members have best idea of the area and implications of decisions and should be embedded in decision making matrix. So this document was, there's a lot of uh, opinion in this document, the way it was prepared uh, the superintendent that was in charge of this document of preparing it uh, essentially sent out opinion papers to all our subject matter experts within our service. Uh, and this, I don't know where that came from. Um, it didn't come from me, but uh, certainly I, that was just a part of a recommendation that somebody felt that, you know, um, you know, was, uh, was legitimate. Okay. Um, I um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the comment table that was formed by Superintendent Early. Do you recall that comment table? Yes, very well. Um, can, can you just explain how it worked and who, who from the WPS was on the comment table, what was their role, and so on? So uh, prior to uh, the OPP command team arriving, we had our command table. Uh, Superintendent Early came with her a command table which essentially in the positions kind of mirrored ours. Um, but so her team arrived on the 10th and immediately that team was inserted in our command table effortlessly and seamlessly. Uh, so she had, um, she had a scribe as I had a scribe. She had another inspector uh, in, involved in logistics. She had a boards person uh, that is in charge of uh, all the the uh, whiteboards with all the information on it that we, that, you know, is changing throughout the event. Um, essentially it was this very same setup or very similar setup than we had. Uh, but the day they came in, they had some recommendations on the actual uh, layout of our EOC, uh, which were taken into consideration immediately. Um, things like more boards, you know, things like that. So th those were taken care of right away. But after that, uh, uh, they hit the ground running with us, and there was uh, it was a seamless transition, to be honest. Uh, so it's fair to say that your your initial comment table just merged with theirs. Yes, that's what I would say. Okay. Um, more on the same topic, but more narrowed on the critical incident command.
questions. We can remove that uh, PowerPoint, by the way. Um, just specifically on the critical incident command structure and um, how it works, we, we understood from previous testimony that the CIC's purpose was to um, give autonomy to um, the CICs to take decisions on the, on the go and to have their own autonomy and so on. I'm wondering how, how did it work with Dana Early, Superintendent Early being a critical incident commander for the same incident that you and um, you, you were? So, um, again, that, that shared or unified command in stepping forward and stepping back. So, for instance, a perfect example is the POU response. Superintendent Early uh, put that plan together with her team, consulted us after. There were other times, for instance, uh, and I don't want to jump ahead too often or too much, but uh, on the Saturday night, for instance, there was a bomb threat. It was a tactical call. I stepped up and took the lead on that. So those are the kind of things, uh, you know, and again, even though if I'm making decisions at that, that bomb threat, Dana was right next to me and we're talking about decisions as they're made, you know, because that's that shared command. So that's kind of the dynamic, if, if that helps. Um, but that's the model. Yes, th this provides a lot of clarity. Thank you. Um, maybe we can jump to February 11th um, about the approval of the operational plan. Um, we can pull out the, the operational plan just to refresh your memory. It's WPS 1440, page 2. Um, that's not the, the operational plan itself, but it's an email that presents the operational plan. Um, I'm, I'm wondering it says that um, it's uh, inspector Yunan who was in, who was in the planning team under inspector um, under superintendent and early and he emails her about the plan and he says please uh, reply all with your approval of the plan so that our municipal partners have the recorded approval I just want to understand why it was necessary to have the approval uh, recorded for your purposes. So the, the part of Dana Earley's team was the public order commanders. So that would be Jason Union, Inspector Union, and uh, Angela Ferguson. Uh, the two inspectors were in charge of their OBP public order units. They would come up with a plan because they're the subject matter experts. Just like in any critical incident, that's what a critical incident commander relies upon. They're subject matter experts to come up with a plan, and then within the framework of criti critical incident command, the commander will either approve it or not approve it. May have questions about it, may have, um, you know, uh, may suggest things that may be added or deleted, but essentially they have questions uh, or they, they'll be able to approve or not approve that plan. So it wasn't, it's, as a critical incident commander, it's not Superintendent Early's job or even maybe not even her subject matter expertise to physically make that plan. So that's why it has to be approved by the critical incident commander because the CIC is, is essentially in charge of, of every decision that's being made in that command team. And that, that's why you had to have her approval for your, your records? Yes, because the, in, in that planning team though, there was other POUs involved. We had other, other municipalities in that public order unit. So the public order commanders have come up with this plan. They sent it to Superintendent Early because that's who's in charge of the, uh, the uh, public order plan. And then uh, it, she approves it. And in that process of approval, she consults with Inspector DeGraff, myself, um, whoever was there, and you know, is there any concerns? Excellent. Okay. Can we pull out now OPP 00004557? Um, I understand this is the overall Ambassador Bridge operational plan. Just have a few questions on it. Um, I'm wondering, um, it, it took only two days, in fact, to come up with that plan. Do you have any insight as to why it was so quick? Well, this is why you rely on your subject matter experts. So, um, you know, this planning uh, informally starts with those first few phone calls and emails to Superintendent Early, you know, hey, we might need some public order help. So 
the situational reports were going to her and her team before they even came to Windsor. So they knew the geography, they knew what was going on with us, they knew what was happening with the protesters. So when they get there, uh, subject matter experts can work very quickly to come up with a plan to, um, to essentially uh, clear the bridge. And that's what happened. And on February 11th as well, not only the plans were approved, but um, the province declared a state of emergency under the EMCPA and there was a civil injunction that went into effect. That's correct. Um, it was quite a busy day. Yes, it was a very busy day actually. Um, did either of those, um, either the declaration of emergency or the injunction have any effect on, on the plan or the operation itself? Um, I would say the, the, uh, the injunction uh, was, was impactful for us. Um, it allowed, uh, obviously, uh, just another tool for us uh, during the whole planning of everything, but it allowed us to, to really uh, focus on uh, exterior or perimeter roads as opposed to just here in church. So if there was parking and, and, you know, and that came into play later, but towing cars off of side streets, that was, the injunction was very helpful for things like that. It was another tool, plus, of course, it was another charge that we would be able to lay uh, if we had arrested anybody. Um, the emergency for the, uh, under the EMPCA uh, really, uh, I don't think, was much of a consideration for us for, in, for this plan. And so I understand that charges were laid under the um, breaking of court order um, criminal offense yes. in the, under the criminal code. Um, you know, if there were these charges were laid during the operations or afterwards? Well, the, the, the arrests were made during public order action on the 12th and 13th, and the subsequent charges were laid after that. Like, you know, the, the investigators then take the files and, and, and lay the information subsequent to the arrests. Um, but prior to the injunction, we already had reasonable grounds for criminal mischief. Uh, like I said, it, the injunction was simply another charge that we were, would be able to lay on, on the protesters upon arrest. And, and I would like to move to the operation itself. Um, I think we can remove that, uh, the plan. Um, you, you explained in, the, in your witness summary that there was perhaps um, seven, around 730 officers that participated in the operation and approximately 500 OPP officers that were present. That Those were estimations. I think at my at my point, I was never involved in the scheduling. Uh, I was involved in some discussions with the officers. We had scheduling out of our training branch. It was hectic. <laughs> we had people reporting um, that we didn't know were reporting, and I mean, you can imagine the logistical. Uh, it was you know it was very difficult for our schedulers. So those were estimations, uh, judging by what we knew the OPP had sent and other municipalities it's, uh, had, had sent us. And do you have any un understanding or insight about why so many officer officers were sent in the end, despite the fact that only 100 officers were asked at the beginning? Um, I, I really don't have that information. I think that's probably better directed at the OPP. Uh, but I would say, like, if from my point of view, the 100 was the original ask of 100 officers was simply um, an initial response to the beginnings of the blockade. The blockade grew enormously throughout the week, and it really peaked on the Saturday night uh, to really, and I call it the highest point of incivility uh, that I've seen in a long time. So I would say that's probably why. Uh, the number of officers, the, the conditions we were working in, it was cold, the snow, um, public order had done their thing that morning on the Saturday. Uh, they started their action. So I, I would say just, uh, and, and then they were, they were I, I wouldn't say that there were 700 officers at one point. I would say there was probably in and out, because there was officers going from Windsor to Ottawa and to Toronto and all these other things. They were in and out and almost interchangeable at times, from my understanding anyways. And what was WPS role during the operation itself? You, you mentioned a bomb threat. Um, was there any, any other things? Well, we were side by side with uh, OPP and RCMP and, and um, you know, other municipal officers. So we would have uh, 
say like for instance it came up earlier about swearing uh, rcmp officers in so before we could swear the rcmp officers in for provincial legislation we would have to pair them with a municipal officer or an opp officer to ensure that they would have those abilities to enact provincial offenses um, so we had uh, at times we had an opp cruiser with two windsor police officers in it like it was just it was shared resources uh for for perimeter control for uh, any um, um, any kind of uprising uh, that we might need, like uh, the bomb caller, we had a, an abandoned house fire at, at one point uh, in the area. So these are the kind of things that we were trying to manage that perimeter with uh, the boots on the ground, th th those initial officers other than POU. Okay, and the operation lasted from the February 12th to the 13th? That's correct. And. Did you, would, we, would you consider the operation a success? Yes, I would consider it a, a, a very successful. Um, we had uh, eventually, I think we uh, charged 44 people. I think that was the number. Uh, we had no injuries, uh, no property damage. Um, and we were able to clear that bridge um, relatively quickly, in, in my book anyways. And now moving on from the operation, I am, on February 13, I understand that WPS, the Windsor Police, and the OPP both adopted a joint um, traffic plan. That's correct. Um, we can pull up the plan, if possible. It's uh, WPS 0000711. At page two. So the goal of that plan was to prevent a further blockade. Okay. That's correct. And if we go at page two, there's that mission statement, which is basically the same of the February 9th operation, operational plan um, about maintaining, establishing and maintaining a safe flow of traffic, um, respecting individuals' charter rights. Um, if we move, yeah, it's, it's here as well. The image, immediate action plan, it says, what you mentioned that uh, if members observe an imminent highway blockade and form reasonable grounds of an offense is about to be committed, officers will intervene to prevent a blockade if it is safe to do so. Um, I'm just curious as to how both interact, preventing a blockade and respecting individuals' charter rights and freedom. So at this point when we had um, basically control of the area through Jersey barriers, and police presence, uh, we had no problems with with protesters that were still in in the area on sidewalks. And there was there wasn't very many of them, but there were a handful, mostly up at the Tecumseh Road area at Heron Church, uh, and that was okay. So that's that was still respecting people's um, right to come out and protest on the sidewalk. We don't want you to block critical infrastructure, um, and then relying again on the OPPs experience in these long drawn out uh, protracted demonstrations we we adopted this plan that that mostly was from their experience and so we were able to control that area from essentially ec row expressway to the bridge through jersey barriers and if there was protesters out on the sidewalks or even in uh, on foot in some of the parking lots we just allowed it so the, the limit, so to, stay, uh, so to say, is blocking an infrastructure or highway. That, that was a no-go, but as long as it's off the highways on... Well, or... at this point, we were dealing with like probably under 10 protesters. Again, I'm still working midnights at this point. So the crowds at night were, you know, four or five in the morning, people were sleeping. So you might have five or six, seven protesters on the corner of Tecumseh and, and here in church. That was okay. We weren't going to remove them. Uh, they were off the road, they weren't, you know, in any danger, and they were allowed to protest. Understood. Um, so you, you briefly mentioned the plan itself uh, on the ground consisted of establishing Jer Jersey barriers all along Huron Church Road. Um, I think uh, Mayor Dilkens explained it as a, this morning, as a pipeline to allow the trucks to go directly from the 401 to the Ambassador Bridge. Is that correct? That's correct. We had left um, um, a safety out in case somebody accidentally got up and tied up in the, at Tecumseh Road, but we didn't advertise that. 
Um, if somebody came across and said, hey, I really don't want to go on the bridge, I'm just here on accident, uh, there was an out for them. But essentially it was a uh, tunnel of Jersey barriers from the expressway uh, to, um, to the bridge, yes. And members of the public were not allowed to just to just go on, on the highway without a lawful reason or justification on, on your own church road? No, the bridge was open. If members of the public wanted to go over to the States, they could have used that. But once they would have to enter at the expressway, which was very, you know, a few kilometers south of the, of the bridge. Okay, but they, they, they had to, to move forward and go towards Ambassador Bridge or else they, they could not just hang on uh, on here in Church Road? No, no, yeah, they, they could not stop and know that we, but we didn't have that problem. Uh, we didn't, not to my recollection at this point anyways, uh, we had anybody stop and try and block that. But there was numerous uh, threats of it. Uh, and that's why we, we would reevaluate every single day to where the traffic plan was and when can we start demob demobilization of that traffic plan. It was very measured and very uh, conscious of what, you know, what the intelligence was and what the potential threat of protesters coming back to block the bridge. Um, again, open sources where we were hearing people asking other um, uh, protesters from Ottawa and Toronto to come down to Windsor. Uh, we're going to come at them again. We're going to block the bridge again. This was daily. Uh, so we would reevaluate with our intelligence, our information every day, and, um, and then act accordingly from there. So, yeah. So there were, were there any situations where the traffic management plant was helpful in preventing any blockades? No. It was helpful every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know it was a, uh, a major inconvenience for the citizens of Windsor. Um, and I think the mayor explained it well. People on the West End trying to get to uh, the other side of the east side of here in church was very difficult. I would hear it on the radio myself of, of uh, our local radio stations and um, you know, the frustration of the people because that was closed or not closed, but that was, uh, we were controlling those roadways for a considerable amount of time. So we understood the, the frustration, but we just, that's why we, we would reevaluate every day. We really understood the, the, the importance of maintaining that uh, posture there um, at, by the bridge to ensure that we, we wouldn't lose it again. And just moving on to February 14th, uh, the day the, there was a declaration of emergencies by the federal government. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, it, if you had any, because of the injunction was in force, the AMCPA was in, was in place, you had a traffic management plan. Um, is there anything that the Emergencies Act added um, to, 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 to the situation or help to you in any ways in preventing further blockades? I, I can't say operationally that it, we didn't use the Emergencies Act after that, but um, I, I can't imagine it didn't uh, dissuade people from coming back. Uh, but I, that's just a speculation. Uh, we did not use the Emergencies Act at all. So you would say it, 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 may, have, it may have had a dissuasive effect, but it was not used on the ground. That's correct. Um, and moving further down the timeline, just to wrap up the Windsor story, we, the WPS and OPP adopted a demobilization plan as well, um, which it lasted until March 13 to fully demobilize, I think, OPP. Um, it seems a bit long, do you, do you, would you agree? Um, well, yeah, if I'm a citizen of Windsor trying to cross, yeah, it's, it seemed long, but we really felt it was necessary. And again, we're relying on the experience of the Ontario Provincial Police in these matters. So we would take their advice. Um, we did, um, in the demobilization, we did uh, modify the plan uh, more than once. Um, because of those reevaluations daily of, hey, are, are we at a spot where we can um, open up a little more than the plan says? And we did that probably three or four times throughout those weeks. And, um, but it was very important to us, especially when we got up to Tecumseh Road, to take a very measured approach on reopening. Um, we, were, we were very paranoid about it happening again. 
Was there any any threats, any intelligence about a possible blockade happening further down? Just on open source. So um, I don't recall any uh, credible intelligence or information from law enforcement. Um, but I, I, that's just my recollection right now. I could be wrong. Stand to be corrected on that. But certainly um, on the uh, on open source on on all the, all the social media, um, we had heard numerous pleas and numerous threats that it was going to happen again. Um, now that the Windsor story is complete, I just want to, to, to go to lessons learned, concluding questions for um, just a few questions. Um, would it be possible to pull up WPS 000002? Uh, it's the same documents that we viewed earlier about um, the debriefing by WPS mm -hmm. about the Freedom Convoy event. Um, if we can go on page 19, please. There's a mention about um, it's areas to improve about the initial patrol, patrol response, which I understand is before the blockade happened or before OPP arrived. Mm -hmm. um, it, it mentions areas to improve issues with the operational plan. Is, is that in reference to the February 4th plan? Um, I, I, I can't answer that at that point. It's That's not my document. I don't know what that's referencing. I would assume um, that that's what it's referencing. Um, it's, it's but again, a, we're, we were um, a medium-sized service trying to police the city and deal with this at the same time. So, uh, and, and just because everyone didn't know about an operational plan and the ins and outs of an operational plan. Um, you know, some of these opinions may come from that, right? Like they, they didn't know what the, you know, we weren't communicating what the operational plan is to everyone in the organization. Um, in your witness summary, you mentioned that um, if WPS had a public order unit at the time, it would have been able to come up with a better plan in responding to the initial stages of the blockade. We may have. Um, it was very, um, uh, even I think the, the protesters were disorganized at the very beginning, he, probably at the, at the height of, of, because we talked about this fractured leadership that they had, they were, they were probably as disorganized at the beginning as throughout the whole protest. So if we would have had a public order unit in place and the experience and the subject matter experts, I would think that we might have been able to act uh, accordingly, because of the um, of the uh, um, just the state of that initial few hours, but again, that's an assumption by me. Uh, I don't know. I don't have that experience in public order. Um, and it says also on on that same slide, um, on the second point on the left side, extremely resource in intensive. Only a fraction of patrol officers re remained to take calls. Um, patrol personnel were totally burned out. So it was not just a POU issue, it was a resource issue as well. It was a, an enormous resource issue. We, again, this is an opinion that someone had, but uh, certainly we, we had nowhere else to draw from other than our regular patrol and, and, and uh, investigative personnel to, to police the bridge. So were, were our patrol personnel uh, very tired and getting very burned out? I imagine they were as were the OPP and, and all the other municipal officers that came into town for sure. Um, I would like to pull up COM 0000822. It's the adequacy and effectiveness of police services regulation, um, which I assume you're familiar with. I didn't quite hear what regulation is Sorry, it? It's the adequacy and effectiveness of police services regulation. It's under the Police Services Act. It's yes. Okay, and um, under Section 18, it mentions that police forces shall have a public order unit, mm -hmm. um, despite section, subsection two says, despite subsection one, um, a board may enter into, enter into an agreement um, to provide the services through another police force. Are you aware of any agreement with another police force to have a public order unit dispatched in case of a public order event? We do not have a, a formal agreement with another police force. I think what and, and our policy is mirroring that mirrors this this adequacy standard and this this legislation. Um, 
uh, essentially what our policy says that we'll sh we shall enter into an agreement in the event we need one. Um, like for instance, uh, the London police had one right away when we asked for help and we signed it. Um, well, the mayor signed it, I think. Uh, so it, it certainly uh, no one asked us to do that, but certainly we are ready to, um, upon re requirement, we would enter into an agreement for sure. I think I, I have the policy you're mentioning. Can, can we pull up WPS 00001877? Um, I think that's the policy about um, public order units deployment um, and the possibility of entering into an agreement. That's correct. Do you recognize? Yep, is, that's is, correct. That's is it. that the one you were mentioning? Exactly. Okay. Um, it, 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 and it, is this the version that was enforced during the Freedom Convoy events? Uh, yes, I'm assuming it is, yes. Okay. Can we go at point uh, D on page two, please? Um, as you mentioned, it says that the, the service shall provide a service of a public or the unit through the provisions of an agreement with the OPP. That's correct. Um, I'm just not sure I understand why such an agreement was not entered upon prior to the Freedom Convoy events and... So that's, that is very explainable. Um, so the OPP provides many services to many uh, municipal services throughout the province. Uh, for instance, we don't have a dive team. We don't have an agreement to use the dive team. When we need to use the divers, we have a formal request chief to the commissioner. Uh, we would like to use your dive, t uh, dive team for this, uh, this investigation. No problem, they get sent down. There's no agreement. Uh, we need a, um, um, a, a technical expert in say, uh, in vehicles with uh, extracting information from the computers. The OPP have those. Informal request goes to our chief, to the commissioner, comes back, no problem, here you go. So there's no, there's no agreement for any of that. It's, it's a chief to chief request. Um, and certainly this is no different. Uh, if the commissioner would have come and said, hey, we have an agreement, would you, would you please sign it? I'm pretty sure our board would have signed it immediately. But did this offer from the commissioner never came to? No, we never, we never as far as, as I know, we never received uh, any um, agreement except from the London Police Service. Um, and, and you mentioned formal versus informal requests for assistance. I just want to make sure I understand what's the difference between the two, especially as, re as it relates to public order units or assistance at large to a public order event. Um, in your view, what's the difference between a formal or informal? Okay, request? so perfect example of informal request was this emergency preparedness committee that I sit on for the OACP. Again, we were meeting at least two, three times a week by, by uh, on Zoom or Teams or whatever it was. And the discussion uh, at this time before our blockade was focusing on Ottawa and the Toronto uh, weekend protests that were happening every weekend. So amongst police leaders at our ranks and superintendent, inspector, those were the requests saying, okay, who can send people to Ottawa? It necessarily wasn't POU specific, but it was who can spare some bodies for Ottawa or who can send people to Toronto. So after our uh, blockade was concluded, months went by, Ottawa had two other pretty robust protests, Rolling Thunder, and there was another one, I don't remember the name of it, but we sent people from Windsor because they needed people on ground. We don't have public order, but we sent resources because you know that was the right thing to do and we felt that we really had a debt to actually pay uh, for a lot of uh, the other services. So that's just an example of an informal request. They would eventually be in or formalized through the chiefs, uh, which again is covered in the Police Act. Um, chief makes a request to the commissioner and that's one, you know, one, one of the um, ways that those, inf or those formal requests are made. I, I, I can't see that a superintendent uh, is going to um, authorize these requests uh, without the chief knowing, so. And on, on February 4th, we know that Chief Mizuno had a call with uh, Commissioner Karik asking for assistance. Would that, but I think you mentioned it was not a formal request for assistance. 
Do, do you know why? No, I, I can't really comment because I didn't know about that uh, directly. Like I wasn't involved in that conversation. Uh, what I did get, what I think my testimony was that Chief Mizuno asked me to contact Chief Superintendent Thib because those were that was a small request and that wasn't a POU request. That was a, a local request to get local resources um, from uh, the local detachments. And I don't think that is something that necessarily the commissioner was was concerned with a local request to the local detachments. And however, your request when you reach out to Dwight Tib on the same day, would that be considered a formal request under the Police Services Act? Yes, I would think that just the formal request of of uh, resources locally, and the commissioner knew about it through the conversation with the chief. And um, but that that's what that was my direction. I was told to call uh, Chief Superintendent uh, Thib, and that was my direction, and that's what I did. And under under the Police Services Act, I'm sure you're familiar. It's not necessary to pull it up, but the Commissioner of OPP has to provide the resources it deems he deems or she deems necessary in response to a formal request for assistance. I'm wondering, there was, there was no request provided on February 4th. I'm wondering, do, do you have any idea why is that? I, I, I don't know. I don't. Um, I think at the beginning of that process, we just, we didn't uh, have a, a as big a, of an event on our hands. Perfect, I have no further questions. Thank you, thank, thank you, you Commissioner. Thank you. Okay, so uh, first up is uh, the city of uh, Windsor. So many of our questions, oh, this is Jennifer King, counsel for the city of Windsor. Uh, most of our questions have already been canvassed. I do have uh, a series of questions on one topic, The uh, Windsor Detroit um, Marathon. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Deputy um, Chief, you are a longtime resident of Windsor Essex. That's correct. Yep. My whole life. Then I would expect you're familiar with the Windsor Detroit Marathon. I am. And you're familiar with the road closures and restrictions during the marathon? Yes. Uh, Mayor Dilkins was asked some questions about the closure of the Ambassador Bridge <coughs> during the marathon this summer. Yes. Yes, and you were here for his testimony? I was. You'll agree with me that generally during the marathon, traffic is only restricted on the bridge, not entirely closed. Well, that's a good question. I don't know that. Um, I've never run the marathon, so I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, I would like to, but uh, no, I, I don't know if it's restricted or completely closed, but it, either way, it's for a very small period of time. Okay, and so that's generally early in the morning on a Sunday? It's always on a Sunday. I've worked it. <laughs> Uh, it's always on a Sunday. It's usually very early, like six, seven in the morning, yes, for maybe a couple hours. Okay. Well, it, it is, it's our understanding that generally it's only entirely closed this year. It was only entirely closed this year because there was construction okay. at the same time. Did you, were you aware that there was construction on the bridge this year? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all of my questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next is the uh, Government of Canada. Good afternoon, Deputy Chief. Good afternoon. Commissioner, my name is Andrew Gibbs, and I'm one of the counsel with the Government of Canada. <clears throat> Just briefly touching on some of the testimony you've given already, uh, you mentioned that the leadership was quite divided and you used the word faction. Uh, fractured. Fractured. Yes, that's how I would describe it. Yes, that was my opinion. Okay, and so there were, in fact, multiple leaders and it made it very difficult to determine who was in charge. That's correct, that's what it seemed like. You also described the situation as dynamic. Mm -hmm. Would you say it was fluid? Yes. Unpredictable? Yes. Volatile? Yes. And aggressive? Yes, at times. At times. On February 10th, uh, were there threats made to block or blockade the Windsor Police Service's headquarters? Yes. And why would that have been a concern to you? Um, well, I mean, uh, it impacts our, our daily operations uh, greatly. We, uh, our uh, fleet vehicles are parked in the basement. Uh, I would imagine uh, exiting and entering the building if it's blocked would be very difficult. 
Uh, it would impact our employees coming in and out of work, I would imagine. It would just impact every, every uh, piece of our operating, um, you know, uh, our operations every day. And for those of us who are not police officers, that would mean you couldn't come and help people if they called 911. That's exactly right. Were there also threats to block the Windsor-Detroit tunnel? Yes, there were. And the Windsor airport? Yes, there were. And those threats did not materialize? No. But you couldn't ignore them? No, we, we had to deploy resources to all three of those places that you mentioned, um, as well as uh, yeah, very concerning um, that whole corridor where our headquarters is, it has hospitals and um, essential services that if that area got blocked, uh, it would have caused enormous problems for us. And not mentioning the tunnel with what the mayor said was uh, thousands of people going over there to work. You also mentioned um, it just in terms of a general uh, public safety and uh, officer safety concerns, there was a bomb threat at the mayor's house. Yes. That also took resources. I believe he mentioned two to three police cars were there for a week or two. Yes, that's correct. Uh, there was a bomb threat behind the police lines on February 12th. Is that correct? That's correct. And it turned out to be uh, not credible. That's correct. But the threat was made. That we had to deal with, yes. So it was and made it was and we had to put resources to it, investigate it, and yes. Was there also a drone flying over, a protester drone flying over the police enforcement operation on February 12th? I imagine there was. I don't know for sure, but I imagine there was all kinds of live footage that we were watching in the EOC um, that was open source, and there was, that was part of it. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned that it was cold and there was snow. The officers were putting in a lot of overtime. Yes, we cancelled. I cancelled the days off uh, from, I think it's, well, I'd have to check the dates, but uh, I cancelled a week of, of rest days of our own officers. Uh, let alone the the uh, the ask from the OPP and the municipal municipal forces to be away from home and and cancel their days off as well. So yes, it was it was uh, long long days. So there was a lot of tension. Absolutely. And I think you said people were burnt out. Yes. There are also mention of children being involved. I believe the mayor mentioned that children were involved at the protest. Um, and particularly when the police enforcement action was scheduled to take place on February 12th. Yes. What impact does the presence of children in a mass protest have on police operations? Well, the unpredictability of uh, uh, any crowd gathering is is a, a, a enormous consideration for us. But in something like that, uh, we had to make um, uh, plans with uh, Children's Aid Society on arrest plans. We had uh, resources dedicated to just uh, children's aid. Um, obviously, there's a huge safety concern. There's, there, there was talk on um, uh, open um, source communications that they were going to use um, children as human shields at one point. So there was all kinds of uh, considerations for us uh, to keep um, the welfare of children um, you know, very, you know, safe. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can we please turn up OPP 404539 and uh, go to page 41 on this point. So, Carl de Graaf, um, you know who this is? Yes, sir. And this is an email from uh, Carl de Graaf to Dana Early, um, the OPP Joint Commander, the Unified Command you mentioned earlier. Yes. Uh, FYI regarding using children as a defensive tactic, and this is sent on February 11th. If you'll scroll down, please, uh, Clerk. This appears to be a, uh, an exchange of tweets. Um, thank you, as more children are with us, as less option to power for police, children is our best weapon against them. And someone responds essentially that this is an evil strategy. Children are not weapons or human shields. If this man wants to bring his family to a protest, he can do his research and should be aware of people who speak like you. Going down to the last tweet, it is a war 
they prepare for us with guns, cold water, and gas. Is that consistent with the uh, information that you were receiving with respect to children being used as what you said, human shields? That's correct. Thank you. Um, I only have a few minutes left, so I understand that in summary you've answered a lot of these questions already, but I think you'd mentioned that they were burnt out, the officers were burnt out. I think you believe, I believe you said they were spread very thin across the province. Is that correct? That was my opinion, that, that police resources across the province were getting spread thin, yes. So that would involve all police resources? Um, certainly, because of the asks on the EPC committee and the public order being spread thin and for sure. And so you, there are a series of documents, I won't go through them, but um, you were taken at one point to the, to the uh, justification for the 100 officers. Mm -hmm. um, and if that, Mr. Clerk, is at WPS uh, 60610, and um, Commission Council took you to some of the, the basic numbers. I'd like to go to page two. Uh, where you mentioned that, um, scroll down a bit, I think it, there should be a reference that says that currently officers are being outnumbered and surrounded by protesters when confronted or approached. Yes. Is that an accurate description? Absolutely. I watched it myself on open source YouTube channels. And you mentioned that you were trying to continue the regular Windsor policing at that time. That's correct. Because regular city life involves all sorts of things that sometimes require police assistance. Yes, we have a very busy police service, yes. And would you think it would be fair to say that every city in the province of Ontario would involve that type of uh, requirements for their police services? Absolutely. And they were also being stretched thin? Yes. And you mentioned that this would happen essentially across the country, would it not? It's my opinion, yes, for sure. And so, Turning lastly to the resurgence, you've mentioned that you were quite concerned, or the Windsor Police Force were quite concerned, as was the mayor, that this, they could return, the protesters could return. That's correct. And in fact, um, Interim Chief Belair uh, submitted an affidavit in support of the Windsor City um, motion to extend the injunction indefinitely. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, I won't pull it up, but um, Interim Chief Belair swore an affidavit, which is found at WPS 6049, and in particular at paragraphs 44 to 54, he states that based on, and I'm paraphrasing, but based on monitoring of social media, demonstrators are asking more locals to join, more vehicles are traveling to the area, social media indicating further action from protesters expected, quote, it's not over, quote, regroup, quote, we are not done, quote, slow roll is next, and finally, quote, civil wartime. Anti-police comments are also observed, and the February 15th convoy of several transport trucks from Ottawa en route to Windsor was intercepted by police. That's correct. And in fact, Justice Morowitz, based on that evidence and other evidence, granted the interim injunction um, indefinitely. That's correct. Now, you stated that you did not use the Emergencies Act, sir, but is, is it fair to say that that's because this resurgence did, did not materialize? Uh, that's what, yes, that's a fair, fair to say for sure. So in fact, we don't know if it would have been needed. Absolutely. And finally, with all of these local protests in all of the cities that you'd mentioned, including Sarnia, Toronto, Ottawa, Cornwall, Quebec City, Emerson, Coots, and Surrey, British Columbia, and others. Um, when the location and duration of a blockade is unpredictable, and when police resources are stretched thin, and the officers are exhausted, would you agree that this, this, this leads to an increased risk of safety and security for the officers and the general public? Certainly could. And that would exist wherever those protests may pop up. That's correct. Those are my questions. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, the uh, Democracy Fund. And 
Citizens for Freedom. Good Mr. Commissioner and Deputy Chief, I'm aware of the 10 minutes allotted here and brief as possible. Uh, Mr. Registrar, can we pull off WPS 60102? Again, Deputy Chief, it's Antoine Dai, Council for Citizens for Freedom. In the interest of limited time, if you could answer yes or no where, where possible. Um, okay. Is it your understanding that there are CCTV cameras posted along the various intersections on here on Church Road? Yes, traffic cameras, yes. And those here on uh, those cameras include at EC Row in here on Church, which is about four kilometers away from the mouth of the bridge? Not aware of EC Row. Could be. Uh, how about here on Church at Tecumseh, about one kilometer from the bridge? Yes. And then here on Church at College, which is about 50 meters from the foot of the bridge. Is that correct? That's correct. And this photo here, uh, is this from a CCTV camera? I'm going to say that's probably a drone picture. That one's from a drone? Yep. Uh, was somebody monitoring the CCTV cameras during the dem demonstration? Uh, yes, they were actively being monitored. And, and was this happening at the EOC? Uh, yes. And is it your understanding that live CCTV footage, or at least you know, frequent screenshots, are normally available to the public online of uh, some yes. of the CCTV cameras? Yes. And was there ever a decision made by Windsor Police Service to restrict access of uh, these these cameras to the public? No. Are to you, be honest, we didn't. Th this this CCTV camera was not very helpful, and the one at college was old, and we had to put up our own camera. To be honest. Okay, um, but there was no decision to deliberately restrict no. access, no. understood. Um, this looks like the beginnings of what, what may form a blockade, and it looks like the police have vehicles there. Um, is this the Tecumseh and Huron Church intersection? That's correct. And so this is about a kilometer away from the foot of the bridge, is that correct? Approximately. And do you have any idea of when this particular photo was taken? No idea. This was a dynamic uh, intersection as well. It would be like this. It would be 50 cars there. It was dynamic. Well, would it be fair to say this would be closer to the beginning of, of the protest activity on, on Huron Church? I don't know. Okay. Um, you spoke earlier about this, this bear hug strategy and indicating that there's almost like this plaza around the, the mouth of the bridge. Is it fair to say that there's two ingress points and two egress points from the, the, uh, the border itself? I'm only aware of one egress, or sorry, one, no, wait, uh, two egress and two in, yes, sorry, you're correct. Right, and so, so you've got the, <laughs> the northbound and southbound lanes coming out with that main entrance, and then yes. two ancillary roads coming out to, to wind us through, is that correct? Yes. And we heard earlier in terms of uh, the police establishing a circle of control or a perimeter. Would it be fair to say that that perimeter would be then set out around those, those points of ingress and egress? That was part of it, uh, but it was expanded to, you know, the intersections on here in church and, you know, expanded that way. But for sure, those would be part of it. And, and do you have any indication when that initial circle of control was established? No, I don't. Is it your understanding that, that uh, on February 10th, a plan had already been put in place for Windsor Police Service to remove the protesters on Saturday, February 12th? Uh, there was discussions amongst the POU plan to of what day it would it would be actioned, uh, but I don't know uh, exactly when it was. But that was that was one of the initial plans, one of the initial days. Uh, Mr. Registrar, can we pull up WPS seven zero four two and page two of that document, please? I understand these are notes by Superintendent Carl DeGraff. Um, we're unable to see who this email was sent to or from. Did you ever have a chance to see this email or the contents of Mr. Uh, Inspector DeGraff's update? I probably saw this at some point, but I don't recall it. And so is it fair to assume that this was indeed produced uh, February 10th, that Inspector DeGraff reports there's no significant issues with managing the protesting and the numbers have remained consistent compared to the last three days? Uh, it, it could be. So Inspector DeGraff worked mainly days and at at night, uh, I put myself on nights because of this, uh, th my experience in these kind of situations, that's when it ramps up. Understood. And can we scroll down a little bit further here to the sixth point, right? And so on February 
10th, so this is before the city or the AMPA apply for their injunction, there's already an arrest plan in place, there's already an idea that removal is going to begin on Saturday, and there's already indications that children's aid will be involved, is that correct? It's probably in the development of the plan, that's correct. And, and you had indicated that at some point, right around February 10th, there was a shift to this joint command with OPP. Are you aware whether or not this plan was produced before or after joint command was established? Well, this would have been after because uh, OPP was uh, in charge of the POU plan of de developing it. Understood. Uh, Mr. Roger, can we pull up CFF 50106? So, Deputy Chief, you, you spent some time in the, the EOC and, and had a good visual in terms of what was going on during the, during the, throughout the week? 21 days. All right. And so, is this an accurate uh, depiction, I suppose, of the protests and the police on February 12th being the Saturday? Uh, that looks accurate, yeah. And can you identify which intersection this is at? Would that be Huron Church and College? It looks like to college to be with the berm on the top left there. Uh, it looks the the university property, but I, I can't say for sure, but that's uh, what it looks like. And it does look like there then on the northbound lanes, there's a number of police cars in the in those four or three or four northbound lanes there. And behind the police line, there's a number of uh, police vehicles there as well. Is that correct? That's correct. And it appears there may be a small number of protester vehicles in the southbound lanes, both in front and behind that police line. Is that correct? That's correct. And would you agree with me that uh, the, the police reports that were produced indicated that a towing plan was successfully executed on February 12th and 13th? Yes, that's correct. And earlier you mentioned multiple threats that were made or received. Do you agree with me that although resources are required to investigate and respond, not all threats and social media posts are credible? Yes, for sure. And would you also agree with me that the threats, whether it's to the airport or the police station or these bomb threats, by and large, did not materialize? No, but credible or not, we still have to... I understand. Act. The resources have to be dedicated. Yes, for sure. Um, if I could pull up two multimedia database videos, you had indicated earlier that police were in general respectful of protesting on the sidewalk and that you understood that this was part of the injunction that, that lawful protest was still allowed as long as you're not impeding traffic. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. And so if we could put this first video up again, that's CFF6015. It's the 30 second video here. Meanwhile, I'll... I'll inform you guys all, you are currently within the exclusion zone that we previously had this morning. POU is going to come arrest everybody for mischief if you do not leave. You need to get past the traffic point down to come see road. Public sidewalk. Exclusion you zone. guys told us to come here. We're telling you hey, now. We're telling you right now. We're giving you the chance to you're move. You're putting your foot in your mouth now because no, you told us. Are you told us that. that's fine. You can stay here and get arrested. That is fine. That's yeah, up to yeah. you. Do you, have you have room for all that? Okay, and then if we could pull up one more video as well, CFF seven zero four. And while that video is coming up. Uh, Deputy Chief, would you agree with me that the records indicate that there was at least 44 arrests and that the majority of people that were arrested were charged with both mischief and for disobeying a court order? That's correct. Let's watch this video here. Would you agree with me that it appears that there's a woman sitting peacefully on the grass there being arrested? Yes, but the roadway here under legislation is fence line to fence line. Okay, this, we're trying to establish a perimeter in a, in a controlled area. That's what we're doing. Uh, but the sidewalk and the grass are both on the interior of the fence lines that you're alluding to. Yes. Do we agree that she's not impeding uh, vehicular traffic from her location there? I can agree with that, but we're trying to clear out an area, so that's why she is getting arrested. Understood. And, and would you agree with me that both of the videos we just saw are in police enforcement probably on the weekend, either the 12th or the 13th of February? Yes, I would agree with that. Okay, thank you. And just quickly, 
Um, in terms of the past protests, I understand police were in charge of monitoring. They went back as far as June 24th, 2020. Do you recall about 100 protesters outside of the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit when the first mask uh, Section 22 order was, was implemented? Yes, I do. And do you also recall 100 of protesters in front of City Hall when the city implemented a more restrictive mask mandate than the health unit did? Yeah, I believe so. And more than 100 protesters in January of 2021 marching down Olette, one of the main streets in Windsor, on the road towards the health unit uh, with concerns about serious adverse reactions to a segment of the population from these vaccination mandates. I don't recall that that's why, but I recall the, the walking on all that, yes. And do you recall thousands of people, or at least a thousand of people at the flag, August 28th, 2021, with concerns about risks of serious bodily injury, talking about myocarditis and pericarditis, issues with vaccination? I don't recall ever being in a protest of a thousand people, but weekly there was protests at the flag, yes. Okay, what about September 29th? Do you agree that there was reports that there was hundreds of people protesting across the street from Windsor Regional Hospital because of the termination of nurses? doctors and other frontline uh, hospital staff. Yes, I recall that. And you also recall a silent protest with at least a thousand people uh, at the flag on September 18th, 2021 in response to the termination of first responders and city employees by the city of Windsor. Again, the, the reason I don't know, but it, yes, protests were happening weekly. And, and do you also recall that instead of placing employees on a leave of absence until the end of the COVID-19 period as provided for in the Employment Standards Act and the Infectious Disease Emergency Leave, that the City of Windsor made a choice, an intimidating choice, threatening the economic security of, of many of its employees, that they would be terminated rather than on a leave of absence if they refused to accept the government's medicine into their body? I re remember a vaccine policy, but I don't know anything about that. I had nothing to do with that. Are you aware of any Windsor police officers that no longer have a job because of their medical decisions? No, I don't think so. No further questions. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, the OPP. Uh, Commissioner, good afternoon, uh, and afternoon. good afternoon, uh, Deputy Chief. Uh, I'm Janan Kabursi, uh, here representing the Ontario Provincial Police today. Um, so we've heard uh, your evidence uh, further to questions from Commission Council regarding intelligence mm -hmm. that uh, the Windsor Police Service you and your colleagues were aware of and receiving uh, in late January and early February. Uh, you recall discussing yes, that? That's yes. correct. And, and so it seems to me it's uh, accepted or well established at least that uh, as far as um, you're concerned at the Windsor Police Service that the communication flow, uh, the receipt of the intelligence information prepared by the Intelligence Bureau at the OPP was, uh, it was an eff effective uh, communication uh, system, the, the distribution for the Hendon reports. And, yes, and I would so say on. it's very effective. Yes. And so in addition to that, intelligence that you were receiving from the Ontario Provincial Police. I understand that Windsor Police Service also uh, had some of its own intelligence and information that was being locally gathered. That's correct. Right. And would it be also fair to say that uh, with all of that intelligence and the benefit of that information, it, it was still not entirely clear or certain uh, what was going to happen as these slow rolls uh, proceeded in the area of Windsor. Yes, I agree with that completely. Right. And so Windsor Police Service planned based on the information that you had. Correct. Is that fair? Yep. Uh, and also you were in regular communication with a number of your OPP colleagues at different levels across the organization. That's correct. And so, can we say that there was effective uh, communication, information sharing, and cooperation that was taking place between the OPP and the Windsor Police Service throughout this time period? Yes, I could say that. Okay. I'd like to ask 
you a bit about the discussions uh, that we've heard took place at the uh, emergency uh, committee. I'm not sure if that's oh, the preparedness committee. Yes, emergency preparedness committee mm -hmm. at the uh, OACP. I understand. Yes. Yes. And you're a participant in that committee. Yes. Uh, and uh, we heard that there was some discussion about what was happening in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, uh, were were you familiar with what was happening uh, in the area of the Blue Water Bridge? Um, a, a little bit. Are, are you talking, you're referring to right before hours started or right in that same time period? Right around that same time of, period. Yes, I, I a believe uh, a document was pulled up earlier today yes. indicating that on around February 6th, there was some activity around the Blue Water Bridge and that the OPP had uh, restricted or blocked parts of uh, Highway 402. Yes, I recall. You're familiar with that? Yep. Um, <laughs> I expect we may hear a bit more evidence about that from Superintendent Dana Early from the OPP who will be uh, appearing here tomorrow. Um, but from your um, awareness of the situation, um, I'd just like to ask you, is it possible or was it considered as an option in Windsor to try to execute something similar to what was done in the area of the Blue Water Bridge? Or are there simply differences in the situation that, you know, lead to different decisions about planning? Certainly, yes, we had those conversations. Uh, so it's my understanding of the Blue Water Bridge. Uh, I'm well aware of the 402 coming off the 401. It's a one exit when you're going westbound. Um, and there was farm equipment, from my recollection, uh, trying to block that area. Police took a proactive uh, stance there, the OPP, and, and stopped that one road coming off the 401. And like any highway, there's exits and entrances along the way, but limited. So a little bit more manageable from an emergency preparedness and emergency management you know, lens, where our infrastructure is kilometers long, side streets everywhere so we did discuss blocking access to here in church that leads to blocking access to the other where the 401 splits at the here in church goes to dougal well dougal goes right to our tunnel and the hospital and all these other things that we wanted to keep the traffic away from we did not want to put any any um focus on the tunnel because uh, that was our main um, access for our for our citizens that work in, in Detroit and, and in Michigan. Uh, plus the hospital was a very big concern for us as well. So uh, in those initial discussions, we just, we could not, it, we did not have the resources. We couldn't, it was just uh, um, logistically, there was no way we could block all those intersections and shut down Windsor essentially from incoming traffic like they did at 402. Mm -hmm. uh, so, from what you're describing, uh, even those of us who, who don't know the geography of Windsor as well as you do, uh, it seems clear that just the geography and the nature of the approach to the Ambassador Bridge just gives rise to uh, a lot more complications uh, with any effort to uh, stop the flow of traffic in that direction. Absolutely. Um, so I understand that uh, a plan was developed uh, on around February 7th, I understand, to focus on the intersection right at the entrance to the bridge. That's correct. Uh, and would it be fair to say that based on the information that you knew at that point, that seemed to be a reasonable approach? It was reasonable and, and Really, we uh, other than the, the fact that we didn't know what, what the tactic might be, that was the most reasonable uh, tactic that we could use. Right. And so ultimately, that that plan didn't prove to be successful in, in uh, dealing with the blockade entirely. Uh, and then, uh, as we've heard in the evidence, things started to develop very quickly and conversations were happening uh, at different levels within the OPP regarding the provision of resources to assist Windsor in dealing with that's this correct. developing blockade. Yes, that's correct. 
Right. And we heard that uh, a team of PLT officers uh, was among the, the first uh, of the officers that were deployed to Windsor to assist and lend their expertise. That's correct. Uh, and then in addition to that, there's been some discussion of the request for uh, 100 officers. So I'd, I'd just like you to make uh, clear for us when um, we're referring to those 100 officers. Uh, is it correct that you're referring to frontline uniform officers uh, who might be described as uh, officers who could take on general duties? Pat That's correct. Patrolling, um, monitoring intersections. That's exactly what Those sorts of duties. Yes, that's correct. So that, that number of officers certainly doesn't include the number of officers that might be required for a public order unit operation. Absolutely not. Right. And those determinations uh, came later uh, after the shared command uh, or unified command, as it's also been mm -hmm. uh, referred to, was established starting on around February 10th when Superintendent Early arrived. Correct. Okay. Um, Commission Council, uh, just go, moving to that time period, Commission Council referred you to uh, an email, WPS 1440, uh, that was the email that was sent to Superintendent Early seeking her approval for a public order unit plan. Oh, thank you for pulling that up. Uh, and you just reviewed this uh, document with uh, Commission Council, but I'd like to just pull up um, what I believe to be the attachment to this email, uh, which is WPS 1441. Um, clerk, if you could uh, please pull that up as well, just so that we can see that attachment. Uh, and uh, Deputy Chief, I'd like you to just take a, a quick look at it to confirm that this is the public order deployment plan. It's dated February 12th. Yes, that's it. Uh, so this was developed by the planners that uh, arrived uh, with Superintendent Dana early and were working with you. That's in, correct. Like, yeah, they, they developed the plan. For sure. Right. So, so there was when you speak of the the shared command or the unified command, um, it it appears that an effective way of putting that into operation was to play to the strengths of the different organizations. Exactly right. Right. And since the OPP had POU experience and then some other uh, planning experience, uh, that was taken care of by the OPP team. Yep. Absolutely, 100%. That was that was the the again with especially with my background that that was the ask. Mm -hmm. That was the ask for them to come in and provide us their experience, and that's what they did admirably. Mm -hmm. And uh, given your local expertise in the city of Windsor and policing in the city of Windsor, obviously um, your focus might have been on issues uh, that require that kind of expertise. That's right. Is that also fair? Okay. But that being said, a lot of consultation went, you know, of afterwards of, of both ways. So, of course. Yeah. Um, I'd also just like to refer as well to OPP 4560 uh, and ask you, uh, Deputy Chief, were you um, also, uh, or, or I expect you also had the opportunity to review the full set of plans that was prepared by, by the team? That's correct. Uh, so this uh, is a package of documents um, that were prepared by the OPP, but if if you scroll down, uh, Clerk, I, ju I just want to uh, bring this document to attention. If you could scroll down further, please, several pages. Um, it also will include um, a copy of that public order plan, uh, as well as some other supporting documents uh, that supported the planning process. Okay, we can, uh, we can leave that for now. I expect we'll uh, look at that in more detail with Superintendent Early. Um, I'm mindful of uh, the time, Commissioner. So I, I would like to also ask you, um, 
deputy chief. Uh, so as, as the plan uh, was then, you know, ready to be implemented, uh, as determined by the command team, uh, and, and this happened fairly quickly, as I understand it. That's correct. You know, some might be surprised to see that uh, a plan uh, containing all the required elements was produced within a matter of days, but that is the reality. Well, that's a testament to the experience that they bring. Okay. Um, and we've heard some reference to the uh, uh, effectiveness of the uh, OPP PLT officers mm -hmm. uh, who came onto the scene uh, to, so, to support the, the work that some of the Windsor Police Service liaison officers uh, had also been working towards in developing rapport and communication with the protesters, yes? That's correct. Um, I, I take it you became aware that on uh, the 11th of February, there was a, uh, an effort to uh, come to some kind of resolution with the protesters who had indicated through a PLT officer that the protesters would like to speak to someone from the provincial government and they were asking for a letter essentially to that effect. Yes, that's correct. You're familiar with that? Yes. So I'd just like to pull up uh, that document, uh, Mr. Clerk. It's WPS 1454. I believe my friend, uh, Mr. Curry, I think alluded to this earlier, but I, I'd just like to pull it up on the screen and um, Deputy Chief, have you take a look at it. Right, so if, if we scroll down a little bit, we see that this is uh, February 11th. It's addressed to Commissioner Karik. And if we continue to scroll down, it's from Sylvia Jones. Uh, and it says the government of Ontario is proposing that a meeting occur within an agreeable time period with a select group of protest leadership and so on. So you're familiar with this um, resolution attempt yes, that I was am. undertaken. Um, I understand uh, that this letter was delivered to the protesters on the evening of February 11th. Yes, I'm That's correct. aware of that. You know, but, but ultimately, uh, it unfortunately did not lead to a resolution of the blockade. That's correct. Of the bridge. Uh, and in that regard, what I mean is the, the bridge continued to be blocked. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, I might just have one moment. Um, Deputy Chief, um, you were taken to uh, a debrief document um, by, by Commission Council um, that had a number of comments about the um, experience that had taken place. Uh, throughout the protest and the blockade and then the, the resolution of the blockade uh, and you, you noted that uh, you thought it was you know, expressing opinions of particular individuals that uh, were present there. I, I'd just like to ask you um, what, in your view, uh, if, if you were um, asked to debrief, what would you say were the lessons learned, uh, the um, things that worked or, or things that that sure. didn't work. I, I think that a lot of the, the document is is true. Like, uh, you know, like this this document is all about transparency for us. We're trying to improve. We're trying to develop policy and procedure that can maybe at one day mirror the experience of the OPP. Uh, so these kind of things, like internal communication, was a big one. Um, improving that, improving who was actually in the EOC, not at the command table, but in the EOC for like say for finance and for um, maybe the uh, the executive officer the chief should have been there for a, a better communication uh, for internal communication these are the things that you know we we right away realize that you know we're learning and uh, certainly there was there would be some changes but the things that worked were when the OPP came into town we were completely welcoming and that uh, that seamless integration of uh, superintendent Early's team with our team Everybody was pulling the rope in the same direction. Uh, and that was what helped us. That, that was our success. Okay. okay, those are all my questions. Thank you very much. Okay.
Uh, next is uh, former Chief uh, Slowly's Council. Thank you, Commissioner. Deputy Chief Tom Curry for former Chief Slowly. Next just a few minutes and just a few questions. Okay. Um, just to get your help as a person who's been in policing as long as you have been and held, holding the roles that you are, holding the positions and ranks that you have held. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, the the limitations on the service's ability to act on information as opposed to intelligence. Do you recall that? I don't know. I don't like if, if that's what I said. I, I don't know if we had an inability to act on information. It was the inability or maybe the the um, the desire to act on information at times that was not le legitimate or confirmed or things like that. That's Fair maybe enough. what I meant. I, maybe, I'll, maybe I can ask you about this. Your colleague um, uh, who's, who's in the role now of, of Chief, um, Chief Bel Air. Yes. He gave a statement to the Commission Council. I'm not going to turn it up, but can I just read you this? Um, he isn't going to testify, so I'm just going to get you to see whether he has captured the idea that you have, that I understood you were to, to, uh, expressing. And this is in relation to the February 6th information about the slow roll and the possibility that pr protesters had threatened to block the Ambassador Bridge. You recall that on the 6th, learning that. Yes, sir. What uh, Chief Belair said, said it, and this is just for reference on page two of his statement. He said, however, he stated that he was reluctant to interfere with the flow of traffic to and from the bridge in the absence of compelling intelligence because of the importance of the bridge to international trade. Okay. Is that a sentiment that you, you agree with? Um, as a critical incident commander, I mean, I can't disagree with it, but I certainly uh, was not willing to interject in that point to escalate the situation. Right. In other words, not you weren't going to be, on, on the basis of what you had heard of a threat, you weren't going to go closing roads all no, over town we were and disrupt things. And no. Um, I don't know how, uh, when you say earlier that you were following the events in Ottawa, you, you understood that that was a much larger, much more significant and complex protest than the one that you were dealing with. I would agree. The number of vehicles that actually blocked this critical infrastructure strikes me as a very small number. Do you agree? Well, compared to what Ottawa was dealing with, I would say yes. But I mean, I, we at times we were estimating up to 100, 150 vehicles. 150, and as and the low end for the commissioner's purposes, sometimes I th saw numbers that were below 50 even as they came and went. I'd have to trust you on that. I, I don't. Okay. I, no, that's a, don't. We'll. we'll I mean, I, my 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 intelligence was going by uh, drone shots and things like that. I'm, I'm 10 kilometers away, right? Very hard to get actual information sure. about it. Tell the commissioner, if you would, please. Where were these plates? Where were these vehicles coming from? What do you got on the plates? Um, Ontario, I would, most of them, there were some locals as we ran plates, the officers on grounds running plates. Um, you know, there was different areas of the province. Right. I would say mostly Ontario though. And, and were there any from outside of Ontario? I don't recall, so I really don't. Okay. Um, and therefore we wouldn't know, you, you wouldn't have any good intelligence as to whether any of them had originated at the protest in Ottawa and then come down to Windsor? No. Um, a couple of the, then just uh, very quick things, resources. If I understand what you were telling us, you, when resources were required, and it was obvious that, first of all, that the Windsor Police Service was overwhelmed by this, yes. couldn't handle it itself. Yes. Um, the, the main goal is to get the, get the resources in town and you can formalize the requests afterwards. You, I think you talked about inspector to inspector and then having a more formal request go from the chief to the chief as needed. Is that fair? Uh, yeah, that's fair. And the, you, you were asked by my friends from the commission about whether you knew about the fact that the chief, that is your chief, had sent a letter to the minister, to Minister Jones and to, or Solicitor General Jones and Minister Mendicino 
on February 9th, and you indicated that you did not know that at the time. Yeah, I, I don't think I did. I mean, I was working midnights at the time. I don't uh, think I well, did. And, and it reflects, doesn't it, what, what might be euphemistically referred to as the fog of war. Mm -hmm. There was a lot going on. Yes, sir. And the, the environment was very complex and complicated. It was. You couldn't be expected to know every single thing that was going on in the service. Is no, I fair? mean, we all had our roles. I, my role was critical incident command. I was either working or sleeping at that point. <laughs> Probably very little of the Very little of, of, the, of the sleep. The last, yes. Um, and then finally, can I just ask you a question about critical incident command? Certainly. Um, uh, first of all, you remain the police of jurisdiction. You've told us that. That's correct. Uh, it, it, Superintendent Early's, and she's coming here, but uh, Superintendent Early described in her statement, and I anticipate she will say, that there was a delay in, the, in undertaking the operation uh, as a consequence of the letter that, my, our, uh, that you've heard about and that you saw. Okay. Were you aware of that? No, I was not. And did you know that the decision to delay the operation was reviewed by Commissioner Kareek and a Deputy Commissioner, uh, Deputy Commissioner Harkins, um, who I'm going to use the language overruled or at least expressed the view that Commissioner, that Superintendent Early should not pause the enforcement out of concern about the potential impact of that letter from the Solicitor General. Were you aware of any of that? I, I did. I would, no, I was not aware of that. I was aware of a possible date change. But I was not aware when it went back to the 12th. And did you know that what, what Superintendent Early was, was concerned with was that if a letter was going to go to Windsor protesters from the Solicitor General, that it might have an impact up in Ottawa and that maybe we better, maybe she thought we better get that letter up to Ottawa, which she did. Okay. Were you aware of any of that? No, not at the time. And then finally, am I, am I right that you became aware that in terms of the chain of command and who needs to approve what, that uh, before an OPP public order unit operation is rolled out, that, that it is not just up to the critical incident commander, but rather a deputy commissioner has to authorize that? That is, I don't know that. That may okay. be an OPP policy, but I, that fine. certainly wasn't the Windsor policy. Okay, right, understood. Okay. We can ask Superintendent Early. Thank you for your help. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, the Ottawa Police Service. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, Deputy Chief Crowley. My name is David Michikowski. I'm counsel for the Ottawa Police Service. Good afternoon. Um, you served as the critical incident commander during the day shift, is that correct? Or no. during the uh, night shift, Night shift, yes. correct? Yes. And in that regard, am I correct that you had operational autonomy to make necessary decisions under the incident command that's, system? That's correct. And so you would be operating at the operational level? That's correct. And the level above you uh, would be the chief at the strategic level? That's correct. Uh, but there's only one level above you, correct? That's correct. And so unlike in Ottawa, where we had an incident commander, an event commander, and a major incident commander, and then a chief, that wasn't uh, comparable to the situation in Windsor, was it? No, that's, you're correct in saying that. And Chief uh, Mizuno and um, Deputy uh, Belair respected your autonomy and didn't interfere with your operational decisions? Well, completely respected it, yes. And that's an important aspect of how the incident command system is supposed to work, am I correct? You're correct. And um, you shared command with the OPP, uh, but that's because the Windsor Police Service recognize that in an operation of this nature, the OPP obviously had much more experience and expertise than the um, Windsor Police Service. That's had. correct, yes. Um, lessons learned from Ottawa. I believe you learned a number of lessons based on what had happened in Ottawa, and these are things that you would not otherwise have known. Is that fair? Yes, fair. And so in uh, fact, um, 
in, I won't call up the documents, but I believe in one of the documents, you talked about benefiting from the hindsight of Ottawa's experience, of enjoying the benefits of the hindsight from Ottawa's experience. And that uh, impacted how Windsor decided to proceed, correct? On certain things, the things that I talked about earlier, um, certainly, but uh, not, not everything. I mean, like for instance, when, when the OPP came down and we you know, started to share command and, and work as a team. That was, that was just the way I, it, it went. Like that was just, that was an accepted practice in my book. That's how I want it to work. Sure. And, and, and I'm sure a superintendent, a superintendent early will say the same thing or can, should say the same thing. Cause that's, it just worked that way. And, um, Another example of learning from Ottawa was, I believe we saw in one of the documents, again, I won't turn it up, when it came to looking at the message to be given to demonstrators, I think it was a bit of a cut and paste uh, from what Ottawa had done, correct? I, I can't, I can't confirm that, sorry. I, um, I can call up the document if that'll help. It's a WPS 4 zeros ten seventeen. And so you'll see uh, this is a, simply a prepared statement if required for future use. It very much mirrors what Ottawa police put out, and I made very few uh, changes to what they had. And then underneath, if you scroll down, you'll see that was the message given to demonstrators. Uh, okay. So just, just judging by the time, I was not uh, at work yet. I was still on midnights of the email, but I... I I certainly can't disagree that maybe it is the same. Thank you very much. Uh, you can take that down. Thank you. Um, from the outset, as I understand it, Windsor Police Service tried their very best to respect the right to peaceful assembly. That's correct. Keeping lines of communication open. That's correct. And very importantly, using police discretion. That's correct. And using police discretion means sometimes officers need to retreat when crowds get aggressive. In fact, I think you told us an example in which you witnessed that, correct? It's part of their use of force model, yes. And um, it just, um, I want to just uh, briefly uh, conclude by talking about the intelligence. And I understand that the first Hendon report that has a possible reference to a blockade in Windsor was January 31st, but there wasn't a lot of information about it, correct? That's correct. He didn't know numbers, he didn't uh, know dates. And although I understand um, after that, then on February 4th, I gather there were some social media reports suggesting a possible blockade, but again, not a lot of information. That's correct, correct sir, yes. And I understand that although you had some advance information then about a possible blockade on January 31st, February 4th, the specific operational plan wasn't in place when the bridge initially shut down on the 7th, correct? You're talking about the public order plan? Uh, yes. Yes, that was not in place, no. And it's not always possible to be completely prepared in advance. Is that fair? It is fair, yes. And so I believe on February 8th, there was a re general request uh, we heard to the OPP for officers. And that was followed on February 9th with that letter that we saw earlier for the 100 officers, which gave some information. But that didn't provide a complete plan, was it? No, it was not a complete plan at all. And ultimately, what was required um, uh, was a, a POU operation was necessary to end the matter. Yes, sir. And that means there's going to be arrests, there's going to be criminal charges. Likely. Uh, and it's an escalation. That's, okay. that's correct. It is an escalation for sure. Thank you very much. I have no uh, further questions. Thanks, sir. Yeah, next are the, is the uh, National uh, Police Federation. Hi there, uh, this is Lauren Pierce for the National Police Federation. Um, our questions have been asked already. We have no further questions. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Next are the uh, convoy organizers.
Good evening. Uh, for mm -hmm. the record, Brendan Miller, appearing as counsel for Freedom Corp, which uh, represents the protesters that were in the city of Ottawa in January and February. Uh, sir, uh, if we could first, uh, Master Clark, uh, just the document that my friend referred to, uh, OPP uh, ending bunch of zeros 4539, could we bring that up and go to the page uh, that he was on, page 42, where that tweet is? Okay, so that's the tweet that uh, my friend put to you earlier. Fair? Fair. All right, and can we scroll down with uh, the commentary? Okay. Who is that individual? Do you know who posted that? I have no idea. I don't even know if I ever saw this uh, okay. back then. You don't know if they even were at the Windsor Bridge? I don't know. All right, you don't even know if that's a real account? I don't know. Okay. Um, can you agree with me? I just want to put sort of as I understand, and these are not my words I'm about to put to you, but I want to know if you agree with the following with respect to online uh, social media and spaces. So the anonymity of an online space allows individuals to post commentary that they would not normally say in public. Many posts in this space are best articulated, and again, this is not my words, as shit posting. Confirmation bias. Strategic analysis must be driven by direct evidence collection and assessment as opposed to reliance on social media posting as it lacks context and where the poster's uh, bias may not be considered. W would you agree with that? Uh, potentially, yes. But I can say that, like I said, I don't even think I saw this, but yeah. when it talks about real evidence, when I heard the protesters themselves on the, the open chat, talking about human shields, children as human shields, and seeing a picture with children holding hands across the intersection at here in church and college in the early stages, uh, that's hard evidence for me. Okay. And of course, you followed up on investigating that and making sure that, you know, that wasn't an issue? Our special invest investigations unit was definitely involved and they, they, in view, they, um, they deal with the children, the crimes against children along with CAS for sure. Okay, can we scroll down to page 44, please? Okay, and so this is your, uh, an OPP intelligence assessment of Windsor. Can we scroll down? And you want to just take a minute to read that? What's the date on this, sir? 12th, okay, thank you, four in the morning. And you can agree there that the report there from the 12th from OPP says no persons were observed outside. Uh, there was no children were observed, but believed to be inside a camper. Uh, if we can scroll down. Only Canadian flags observed. That's it. So you can agree based on that report, as of the 12th, according to the OPP, uh, that wasn't really an issue. Not at this time, for right. sure. And again, we, you agree possibly with what I said to you with respect uh, to essentially the validity of relying on social media alone, right? We did not rely on it alone, but I would agree with that. You cannot rely on it alone, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next to uh, the Ottawa Residents uh, Coalition. Hi there, Christine Johnson for the Ottawa Residents and Businesses. We have no questions for this witness. Thank you. Okay, next is the uh, City of Ottawa. <clears throat> Good evening, Deputy Chief. My name is Anne Tardif. I'm one of the lawyers representing the City of Ottawa. Um, Mr. Clerk, if we could put up WPS six zeros two one six. All right, and if we could go to page eight, well, actually, let's just identify the document first. Oh, there we go. Um, 
Deputy Chief, these are the scribe notes for the uh, critical incident commanders during the period in question, is that correct? These are the Windsor scribe notes, yes. Sorry, the WPS scribe notes, right, for the Windsor CIC. Oh, sorry, CIC. didn't hear you say that. Yes, the yes. WPS scribe notes for the, yes. I may not have said it. It's, it's late in the day, and yeah, thank you, you for that. Um, and so these would have been scribe notes for you during what we're calling the midnight shifts and Inspector de Graff during the day shift, fair? That's correct, yes. Okay. And uh, we've heard some evidence uh, from uh, the mayor this morning about uh, uh, He's being reminded or advised at some point that he perhaps should not have made the uh, the concerns about making uh, specific requests for additional resources public. And I just wanted uh, to go to page eight of this document first, just to situate us in time. Do you see the date there, uh, Deputy Chief, February 9th? Yes. And if we could scroll down to page 11, it'll be still February 9th, but just to situate us. At time, chat, time stamp of 11.35, please, Mr. Clerk, if we could scroll down. Do you see there it says CIC, Superintendent Mike McDonnell, and he's uh, superintendent with the OPP, correct? That's correct. And then it says comms, OPP liaison via phone, CIC relay message from him, being uh, Superintendent McDonnell, to Chief and also to Mayor, not discuss any requests for additional resources, goes against slash contrary messaging from OPP and our CMP, prompts protesters to gather strength and in intensity, that should perhaps be intensify, presence. You see that? Yes. So I take it that uh, Superintendent McDonnell from the OPP was asking uh, the Windsor CIC to relay to the Chief of Police and to the Mayor um, their advice or their request that any uh, request for additional resources not be discussed publicly. Is that fair? That's fair, yes. And if we scroll to the 1135 timestamp, uh, that message, I guess, was was relayed, correct? I'm assuming I, I was, this was a day shift, so I wasn't there for this, but I'm assuming it was relayed, yes. If it's in the scribe notes, fair to assume that it's it was fair. in fact relayed? Yes. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Okay, uh, next to uh, call on the government of Alberta. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. My name is Stephanie Bose, uh, appearing on behalf of the government of Alberta. I just have a couple of questions today. Um, you've already been taken to the letter that was sent by Chief Mizuno to both Minister Blair and Minister Jones. I don't intend to call that up again, um, but I understand from your responses to um, Commission Council's questions earlier that you were not aware of that letter. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, in the one of the requests within that letter was a request for tow trucks, including heavy tow trucks for large transport vehicles. Is it fair to say that you were not aware of this request for tow trucks as well? I, it, it could be. I don't recall, to be honest. I, I know that we were in um, need of those kind of services. We only had the one uh, contracted service in Windsor, but I, I can't say that if I knew that or not. Do you recall if you received any um, assistance in the form of tow trucks? Um, at the, the POU Action Day, we did receive uh, help from uh, the state of Michigan. They ended up sending uh, a handful of trucks, tow trucks over to uh, Windsor. They were staged at Micmac Park, which is approximately four kilometers from the bridge, but we did not use them. Okay. And were you, are you aware if there was any response ever received by um, the Windsor Police Service to those requests from Minister, to Minister Blair or Minister Jones? I'm not aware of any. All right. Thank you. Those are all my questions today. Thank you. Okay. Next, uh, call on the Windsor uh, Police Service. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I am Tom McRae for Windsor Police Service. Can I ask you to go please to a document that was shown to you earlier, WPS uh, 501441, please? Could you uh, please tell us whose uh, flashes are on that uh, 
first pitch? That would be the uh, Ontario Provincial Police, the Windsor Police, the London Police, and the flash of the RCMP. In addition to those uh, police services, who else assisted Windsor Police Service uh, in its operations at the Ambassador Bridge? Uh, we had assistance from the Hamilton Police Service, from the Waterloo Police Service. Um, off the top of my head, uh, that may be it. Thank you. Could I ask Mr. Clerk that you call up a witness statement of Catherine Diodati? Uh, it's uh, six zeros 62. For um, context, Ms. Diodati is a protester uh, who is president in Windsor. Uh, I understand the commission does not intend to call her, but intends to submit her witness statement in, in evidence. Could you go please to the third page, about halfway down? A little more. Uh, that's perfect. That's perfect. It says, um, at 7 p.m., the injunction came into effect. Ms. Diodati said that by 7.30 p.m., a young police officer was handing out sheets of paper which explained the terms of the injunction and the potential consequences for failing to comply with it, including fines and confiscation of property. Can you uh, assist the Commission, uh, Deputy Chief, by advising us as to the best of your knowledge, what other efforts were made to inform the public of the terms of the injunction and generally uh, the legal consequences of the protest? Certainly, so um, we utilized uh, mainstream media, uh, uh, we utilized social media, we printed uh, the documents, put them on telephone poles, jersey barriers, anywhere we could. We handed flyers out to the protesters. We made every effort we could with every uh, source of media that we could to, to uh, educate people on the existence of it. And the consequences would be, of course, charge of a, of, of a, a criminal charge of um, disobeying a court order. Thank you. The statement continues. Ms. Diodati said she asked the officer, what does this mean in terms of legality of protest? Will someone arrest us? She observed that the officer was shaking, which surprised her. She said that she thought that the officer must have heard that the protesters were violent, so she told the officer, you're safe, it's okay, none of us have ever been violent. Uh, was there violence during the context of, or during this blockade at the Ambassador Bridge? Yes. The next paragraph, it says, on Saturday, February 12, Ms. Diodati went to Huron Church Road near College Road. Ms. Diodati said the area was barricaded by police and the intersection looked like a war zone, which did not fit with the joyful atmosphere. Ms. Diodati recalled that she also spoke to a police officer from the East Coast. She said, look at these heavy armored vehicles and firearms. What are you planning to do with us? Um, on the 12th, were there uh, armored vehicles in the neighborhood of the Ambassador Bridge? Yes, sir. What was their purpose? Um, well, they potentially have numerous purposes. They can be used to block intersections to assist us in that, uh, that capacity. Uh, in this state on the 12th, they were, um, they were there to, um, you know, I, you can imagine the unpredictability of, of a, um, an event of this kind at this point. So um, in critical incident command, there's a saying that uh, would rather be looking at it than asking for it. So um, typically those, th those are, are held for uh, a higher ground. Um, uh, an officer can be at the top of, uh, it's a very high vehicle, uh, can see the crowd from a better perspective. Uh, and also uh, it, it is essentially sat back um, in case we need it for um, crowd control or, or anything worse. Uh, other than these policing purposes you described, is there any, was there any other purpose for no. these uh, vehicles? No. Not at all. Um, you, you told my friend, uh, Mr. Mijikowski, for the Ottawa police that uh, the chief and the deputy chief uh, did not um, get involved in your critical incident command. Was there any political involvement in any of your decisions with respect uh, to the Ambassador Bridge blockade? Zero. Thank you. Those are my questions.
Any uh, re-examination? No. None, Commissioner. Okay. I, I haven't got much. I, I just, one thing I'm confused about, and uh, that uh, arises from the videos uh, that the, uh, were shown um, by Citizens for Freedom, and you saw in the, the arrest of the person who was on, uh, on the ground. Uh, how does that fit in? I thought you testified that there were, they could continue to protest on the sidewalk and this person doesn't seem to have been on the street and I'm trying to understand exactly, maybe I don't know the geography. Yes, yeah, sorry, sir. So there, let me explain. When I said that about the protesters on the sidewalk, that was outside of the area of control that we had tried to establish. So once after the 13th, we established basically from the bridge to Tecumseh Road and a little bit to the east. So there's a Canadian tire, for instance, right on that northwest cor northeast corner. If they're on that sidewalk outside of our Jersey barriers, we had no problem with that. If they're inside the area of control that we were trying to uh, establish, they were, they were asked to leave. And if they weren't, they were arrested. So that arrest and that video that we, uh, we were shown, that is in that area of control on Heron Church north of Tecumseh Road, between the Tecumseh Road and the bridge. That is the area that public order was clearing of vehicles and of, of, uh, of pedestrians, essentially. So again, once that area of control was, was uh, determined and established, anyone outside of it could stay on the, the sidewalk, no problem. That video was not in that area that I'm talking about on the sidewalk. Can you just remind me then again, and I've, I've lost the map from my mind, uh, the, the area of control, if you call it, is was from the bridge to T Tecumseh Road, is that? That was the area that POU cleared, but south of Tecumseh Road was part of the traffic plan with the Jersey barriers. But that was another area of, of protesters if they were on the sidewalk in that, pro that area, which they weren't. If they were, no problem. They were out of that area of control south of Tecumseh Road. Um, so that's, yes, from Tecumseh to the bridge was the area that we were trying to maintain um, no and, protesters. And how far is it from Tecumseh to the, to the expressway? Uh, two kilometers or so. so the, and so the bridge to Tecumseh would be about a kilometer? Uh, I'd say two or three, maybe, yeah, two. So about half of, of the uh, Huron Church Road would be, if you like, not available on the sidewalks for protesters, but the other half would be. That's correct. Based on their areas of protest for that week, because they had areas at Tecumseh Road, at the south side of the bridge, and the north side of the bridge. That was the area we were trying to clear. Okay, and uh, the uh, at, you talked about uh, being at the uh, emergency preparedness committee of the chiefs of police and discussion there. Yes. Were there meetings of that group uh, during this period in uh, uh, early February when uh, the protests were going on? Yes, sir, there were. And I Zoom. Oh, so you weren't a party to those uh, meetings? Um, I wasn't personally because, again, I was on midnights. Inspector DeGraff would have tuned into those. Um, but when I flipped over to days about halfway through, I would be on those meetings when they were scheduled, yes. Okay. And were there discussions at those meetings about the available resources for POU units across the province? That's correct. That's correct. There's a POU hub. That, that's how we try and uh, work it uh, within the province of uh, distributing necessary resources in these cases, yes. So there was those discussions at those meetings. Okay. And were uh, those discussions, did they include what was needed for Ottawa? Uh, and were there enough POU units to deal with the Ottawa situation in Ontario? Yes, in my opinion, and being a part of that committee, it seemed like there was. And so were you part of those discussions? Um, I was on those meetings, but because Windsor didn't have POU officers to, uh, uh, to offer, because we don't have a POU, um, you know, I was just a part of it. I wasn't an active part of it because I had nothing to offer at that point. Okay, thank you. 
so I think that uh, completes the evidence. Thank you for uh, your attendance and your evidence. And we will adjourn uh, till tomorrow morning at 9.30. The commission is adjourned. The commission is adjourned.